outskirts of Katiyam, Kerala State, South India. It happened very fast, apparently. They were dragged from their car and stripped to their undershorts, then shot through the head and shoved into a ditch. Mac Bolan barely heard Naishi Wall as he stared out the rear window of the Colwis 8A helicopter hovering 50 yards above where the bodies had been discovered. Below, the two dead men lay like discarded puppets, limbs splayed and twisted at unnatural angles. One had come to a rest face down in the dirt, but the other stared lifelessly upward, past the knot of Indian authorities mingling around the crime scene. Bolan looked briefly on the man's vacant, unchanging gaze, then glanced away. Bolan was no stranger to death. In his work, it was almost an everyday occurrence. Yet unlike all the soldiers, paramedics, coroners, and policemen who, out of necessity, learned to view dead bodies with clinical detachment, when it came to the butchered innocent, Bolan steadfastly refused to deny his sense of outrage. If it were humanly possible on his part, the innocent would be avenged. The executioner's grim reverie was interrupted. He unclipped the cell phone from his belt and took the call. Meanwhile, up in the helicopter's front passenger seat, Najib Wall, a deceptively youthful-looking member of India's intelligence bureau, pointed out the window. There's a clearing over there, just beyond that dike. On it! Jack Grimaldi, his ever-present ball cap tipped back on his head, shifted course away from the crime scene. Like Bolan, Grimaldi had introduced himself to Najib Wall under an assumed name back at the IB field office in Katiyam. He presented identification and credentials, declaring he was part of a special U.S. Secret Service task force assigned to monitor security during the president's week-long peacekeeping trip to South Asia. The deception was routine, and not that far from the truth. Grimaldi's and Boland's mission was indeed centered around protecting the president, whose itinerary would include stops in Maldives, Bombay, New Delhi, Islamabad, and the Kashmiri capital, of Srinagar, where heads of state would be meeting in hopes of diffusing the latest escalation of hostilities between India, Pakistan, and Kashmiri separatists. The aegis under which Grimaldi and Bolan operated, however, was not that of the Secret Service or even the CIA, but rather a smaller elite core of operatives, so covert their very existence was known by only a handful of men, one of them the president himself. They were operatives for Stony Man Farm. Also, like Bolan, Grimaldi was particularly troubled by a certain aspect of the killings. They were priests? As in Christian? Yes, here in Kottayam. Christians outnumber Muslims and even Hindus. It goes back to the time of the Apostle Thomas. He roamed all along the Malabar coast, preaching the gospel. He found listeners. Well, somebody wasn't listening today. Grimaldi left the bodies behind and turned the chopper toward the clearing that Wall had pointed out. They were in the countryside, outside Katiyam, a coastal Indian city barely a hundred miles from the southernmost tip of the subcontinent. Most of the surrounding rural expanse was given over to tea farms and rice paddies, but there were also a few scattered palm trees. Half a mile down the dirt road where the bodies had been discovered, a church spire marked where the priests had just driven away from when they were ambushed. Bowling clipped his phone back onto his belt. That was cowboy. Just got in from Sri Lanka. He's at the safe house in Aleppo. Want me to swing back and pick him up? After you drop us off. No problem. Wall looked puzzled as the Colwes 8A began to lower toward the clearing. You have an agent called Cowboy? Or is that a code name? More of a nickname. Suddenly the aircraft began to pitch and wobble. Grimaldi jockeyed with the controls. Incoming! Somebody's using us for target practice! Grimaldi fought to keep the chopper aloft. Bolin and Najib Wall focused on the terrain below, trying to trace the shot's trajectory. Some rice threshers in the nearby fields were looking up from their work, but their attention had been clearly drawn by the chopper's erratic flight, rather than any activity on the ground. How are we doing? Got a handle on it, at least for now. Must have nicked one of the rotors. Once we sit down, I'm going to have to take a look-see and find... Uh, there! Wall indicated a bluff that overlooked the clearing. Half hidden in the brush at the edge of the peak, was a short man wearing a khaki tracksuit and a white skull cap. He was taking aim at the chopper with a high-powered rifle. Grimaldi banked the chopper sharply to the right, then switched course toward the bluff. That does it! That bastard's toast! The Colwis, an Indian-made helicopter modeled after the old Bell Model 47, was unarmed, 
so it was left to Wall and Boland to provide some kind of firepower. The Indian drew a Walther PPK pistol, while Boland unleathered his standard 44 Magnum Desert Eagle. As the chopper swept toward him, the sniper stepped warily back from the bluff's edge. Rather than attempt another shot, he slung the rifle over his shoulder, leaped onto a dust-covered Suzuki dirt bike and kick-started the engine. Smoke spewed from the muffler as the bike lurched forward, front wheel springing briefly into the air. Moments later, leaning forward over the handlebars, the man was weaving through a ragged tangle of shoulder-high vegetation. Stay on him! You bet your ass I will! As the helicopter swept across the bluff, Bolin took aim through his shattered window. <laughs> Bolin quickly realized that between the chopper's vibration and the biker's varying course, he wasn't likely to take the man down from the air. Up front, Wall came to the same conclusion. He turned to Grimaldi. Can you pull ahead and drop down in front of him? If we were on some kind of flatland, sure, no problem. But this guy's like Br'er Rabbit in the briar patch down there. If I try to set down in that stuff, I'm going to snag and wind up doing cartwheels. It thins out a little up ahead there. Stay with him and ease down as close as you can. That I can manage. Once he'd put the chopper into a slight descent, Grimaldi glanced over his shoulder and saw Bolin unlatching his door. Going somewhere? House call. Are you nuts? Wall eyed Bolin warily. Your partner is right. It's too dangerous. Bolin looked past Wall at the pilot. Just do it! Just do it, like we're doing a Nike commercial or something. With the sun behind them, Grimaldi found himself chasing the chopper's shadow as well as the man on the bike. The sniper was quick to take advantage, altering his course to keep himself veiled by the ever-moving shadow. Frustrated, Wall let loose with a few more errant rounds from his Walther. Bolin, however, had already holstered his 44 and framed himself in the chopper's open doorway. He eyed the man below as they swooped closer. Soon he could make out details of the rifle slung across the biker's back. It looked like a scope-mounted Weatherby bolt action, definitely sniper material. The man also had a handgun in the holster strapped to his right hip, but he was too intent on negotiating the terrain before him to concern himself with firing at his pursuers. A little lower, then ease ahead of them. Yeah, I've seen those old barnstorming movies too. Preparing to unload passenger. Bending to a crouch, Bolin drew in a breath and focused on the dirt bike, now directly below him. Once Grimaldi began to pull ahead, Bolin exhaled and flung himself from the helicopter. Bolin and the sniper tumbled to a stop in a tangled heap near a clot of brush. Bolin had caught an elbow to the ribs that knocked the wind from his lungs. Sprawled on his back, he gasped for air, trying to blink away the sweep of stars flooding his vision. The sniper had lost his skullcap, and his long hair tumbled wildly about his head as he staggered to his feet. Silhouetted by the sun, the man loomed unsteadily over Bolin. He drew a 9mm Tanami pistol and took aim at the executioner's face. He was about to pull the trigger when Bolin lunged forward, knocking the gun free. It fell to the ground a few yards from the man's fallen rifle. The sniper threw himself at Bolin, grabbing for the executioner's holstered 44. Bolin's plan had been to take the biker alive for questioning, but at this point his only concern was survival. Still fighting for breath, he grappled his opponent back to the ground. Unable to grab hold of the Desert Eagle, the biker shifted his hands to Bolin's throat and began squeezing. Bolin became instantly lightheaded. He knew he'd have to act quickly, or the fight would be over as quickly as it had begun. He had one leg bent at the knee and instinctively brought the knee up, driving it into the other man's groin. <coughs> Bolin cocked his right arm, then shoved it forward, leading hard with the heel of his open palm. He caught the sniper squarely just above the upper lip. With a wrenching crunch, the man's nose imploded in a shower of blood. Splinters of cartilage burst through inner sinus cavities into his brain. As the man toppled to the ground, Bolin kicked away the fallen gun and unholstered his Desert Eagle. He wouldn't be needing it, however. The sniper lay still in the dirt. Bolin checked for a pulse to make sure he was dead, then regarded the man whose olive-hued face was awash with blood, obscuring his features. Weaponless and stripped of his skull cap, there was little to suggest that he might be anything but a motocross enthusiast. Bolin knew better, however. 
He crouched over the man and started frisking him for identification. Someone was headed toward him. Bolin raised his forty-four and drew a bead on the section of trail the sound was coming from. Soon he was able to discern the outline of a man advancing slowly through the brush toward him, gun in hand. He was relieved to see it was Grimaldi. All clear. Over here. <whistles> nice job. I'd rather been able to get a few answers out of him. Grimaldi leaned over the dead man's rifle and looked it over. Nice condition. Top-notch scope, too. We're lucky he didn't bring us down. We probably took him by surprise. Just enough to throw his game off. Could be. How's the chopper? Our friend here took a nice bite out of one of the blades, not to mention the window and back seat. But I should be able to patch things up while I'm refueling. Bolin quickly finished searching the dead man's pockets. Uh, nothing. Well, I figure he was in on the killing somehow. You know, one of those dummies who gets their rocks off coming back to the crime scene. Maybe. Wall picked up the dead man's gun and sniffed the barrel. This wasn't used on the priests. Not fired? Wall shook his head and came over to inspect the body. I don't recognize him either. Maybe there's something with the bike. Already checked. It was hot-wired. We can probably figure where it was stolen from, but not much more. If he's Mujahideen, he wouldn't have stolen it anywhere near where they're staying. Mujahideen? They must not be allowed to get away with this. I'll second that. It won't be easy. You don't know these people. This man here has probably already been replaced, and there are no doubt more waiting behind him. We know the type. All too well. The Mujahideen were Kashmiri insurgents, self-proclaimed holy warriors for Islam, determined to liberate that part of their country under Indian control. Not content with mere rhetoric, for years the Mujahideen had carried out acts of terrorism in their homeland, more than a thousand miles to the north, and in recent months they had begun to operate outside their borders as well, perpetrating acts of sabotage throughout the subcontinent. More than sixty people had been killed in various incidents, most of them Indian, most of them innocent bystanders claimed by car bombs or other explosives detonated near embassies, military installations, and other sites frequented by the Mujahideen's avowed enemies. Two Americans had been struck down as well, including a high-ranking envoy from the State Department, dismembered the past weekend by a pipe bomb planted under the seat of a taxi that had picked him up after a formal dinner in the heart of New Delhi's upscale restaurant district. The Mujahideen were quick to claim responsibility, stating that their next target would be the American president, who had labeled the group as terrorists out to subvert the peace process. Okay, let's take this from the top and see where we stand. First, IB intercepts reports the Mujahideen have sent men across the Ghats into Khadiyam, which makes it pretty clear they want to take a crack at the president the minute he's out of the starting gate here in India. And our people here in Raw passed along the report directly to your Secret Service. Raw? Research and analysis swing. Right hand to the Intelligence Bureau. Okay, gotcha. At any rate, once the report came stateside, we got thrown into the mix. You were briefing us about the Mujahideen when the call came in about the priests. You said something about their ringleader being here with them. The Indian nodded. Derry Nesha, yes. That is not officially confirmed, but it is Nesha's mark to be on hand at the front lines whenever there is an incident. He is not like most leaders who stand back and let others take all the risks. Bolin and Grimaldi exchanged a look. While Bolin wasn't the de facto head of Stony Man Farm and its action teams, he had been as responsible for the group's founding, every bit as Nesha was for his particular cell of the Mujahideen. And also, like Nesha, when it came to battling the enemy in the theater of war, Bolin never gave any orders he wasn't willing to carry out himself. He was among that select breed that led as much by example as command. It was Bolin's hope that this shared trait would help him to get into the mind of Nesha and find a way to bring him down. There's something I don't understand. The Mujahideen have grievances with a lot of people, but not the church, at least not that I know of. As I was telling your friend, Christianity here in India was introduced from abroad. And your president is a Christian, yes? He campaigned as one, I know that much. I think he has plans to attend services tomorrow in Maldives. I say the Mujahideen killed the priests to send a message to your president. They are Muslims, after all. Being Muslims doesn't automatically make them terrorists. Of course not, but they are extremists. 
And like all zealots, they recognize only one way of worship, their own. All others be damned. If this was their doing, wouldn't they have left behind some kind of statement? You know, something on paper, some kind of proclamation to make sure they got credit? Perhaps our men have found something near their bodies. Or perhaps the Mujahideen are waiting until the killings are made official to come forward. With the car bombing in New Delhi, they waited until it was on the news. All right. For the sake of argument, let's say this was their doing. We can worry about their reasoning later. Right now, we need to find them. Understood. That is I.B.'s top priority as well. If the Mujahideen are behind the killings, they had to have had a staging area somewhere around here. I say we get hold of topo maps, sat intel photos, anything that will help narrow down possible places where they could be holed up. Hopefully, by the time we do that, I'll have the bird back up and running and we can do some aerial recon. Works for me. Bolin looked over the rolling terrain that stretched out in all directions. We'll have a lot of ground to cover, though. Perhaps not as much as you think. Bolin and Grimaldi glanced over and saw the Indian crouched over the dead man. He was holding the man's right hand, sniffing his fingers. What do you smell? Cordite? No, not cordite. Coconuts. I smell coconuts. Slowly the Indian shifted his gaze, staring out past the rice paddies to a gently sloping hillock several miles away. Tea was the primary crop in the higher elevations, and the hill was green with leaves fluttering in the hot summer breeze. But there was one plot of land that stood out from the rest, not only because of its groves of coconut palms, the only ones within five miles, but because of the series of scattered buildings whose high ceilinged roofs protruded above the surrounding vegetation. They were Kalaris, classrooms devoted to the study of Kadakali and Kalari Payatu. Before being recruited into the Intelligence Bureau, Najib Wall had studied at the facility under the guidance of his uncle, Ziarat Wall, a master of the highly disciplined arts for which the Indian state of Kerala was famous. Staring at the distant buildings, Wall felt a chill run down his spine. If, as he suspected, the dead man at his feet had come from the school, there was a chance the Mujahideen had overtaken the grounds to use as its base of operations in Katiyam. Under his breath, he whispered a prayer for his uncle's safety, as well as that of the rest of those attending the school. In his heart, however, he feared that it was already too late. Academy of Arts in the Ghats outskirts of Katiyam Ziarat Wall looked away from the short sticks being held out to him. Eyeing his tormentor, he solemnly shook his head. In rage, the other man lashed out, striking Zirat across the face. The sticks raised a fierce welt on the Indian's cheek and cracked the skin. A trickle of blood ran down his cheek. Fight! I am but a teacher. You are clearly a warrior. It would be no contest. <laughs> you are far too modest. These pictures tell a different story. Sheely pointed up at the brick walls of the Kalari. Mounted above the rows of crossed swords and small metal shields mounted on the wall were many paintings and photographs. Several of them featured Zirat. In one, a painting made several years ago, he sat on a bench, holding both sword and shield as he stared outward with a look of quiet dignity and pride. His young nephew, Najzib Wall, stood beside him. Barely twenty... Najzi was already a master in the martial art of Kalari Payatu. Vargadrum Shili, however, was more intrigued in a framed photograph next to the painting. There, attired in military garb, his chest festooned with ribbons and medals, was Ziarat as a young army officer. This is you, yes? When Ziarat remained silent, the Kashmiri turned and looked at the handful of boys and young men who'd been corralled into a corner of the room. Dwarfed by the armed men on either side of them, the youths wore only white dhotis. Earlier this morning, they had come with Zerat to the Kalari to begin their morning exercises, only to find the Mujahideen had slipped onto the academy grounds during the night and taken over the building. Since then, they had been held hostage, confined to this one small room. Rations tea and boiled rice heaped on palm leaves had been brought a few minutes ago, after which Vargadrum Shili had joined them for the first time the sweet aroma of toddy on his breath. Sheely was young, no more than thirty, but he seemed to be the one in charge, at least of the two men watching over Wall and his students. The power had clearly gone to his head as much as the toddy had, 
and for several minutes now he had been trying to bait Wall into a fight. Wall's steadfast refusal was testing the Kashmiri's patience. Sheely addressed the students. Your teacher, it seems, is quite the hero. He has told you about the war and how he won all these commendations. I'm sure he must have. It's what all soldiers do. None of the youths responded. Most of them spoke Malayalam and had no understanding of Urdu. Mistaking their silence for ignorance, Sheely took the sticks over to the photograph and tapped at several of the medals on Wall's chest, medals unique to one particular conflict in India's brief history. Thirty years ago, India invaded East Pakistan, the land you now know as Bangladesh. Like cowards, your teacher and his fellow soldiers waited until winter to attack, when the snow was so deep that China could not hope to cross the Himalayas to intervene. They beat down the forces West Pakistan had flown in to restore order in the land. They stole the land from Pakistan. West Pakistan flew in forces to terrorize those who wished for independence. They killed civilians, raped women, forced refugees to flee to India by the millions. We sought only to make it safe for them to return. So you say. Sheely turned back to the students. India's only desire then was to weaken Pakistan. Today, all these years later, that is still their only desire. Lies. Only now, instead of in Bangladesh, India tries to beat back Pakistan to the north. They want to push back the line of control and seize all of Juma and Kashmir to seize it for themselves. India seeks only to claim what is rightfully hers. When our country first came into being, it was the wish of the Maharaja that Kashmir become one with India, not Pakistan. But what of the people of Kashmir? Did we have a say in our fate? Have we ever been shown the same consideration as those in Bangladesh? Has anyone ever listened to our cries for independence? If you have grievances, there are proper channels through which to address them. There is no need for you to come here to a place of learning and terrorize youngsters who have no say in these matters. There's that word again, terrorize. When your forefathers rallied for India's independence from Britain, did they call themselves terrorists? No, they called themselves freedom fighters. And that is what we, the men of Kashmir, are as well. We are fighting for freedom from the oppression of India. So you say. And let us not forget that these Pakistanis you speak so nobly of would prefer to fly their own flag over Kashmir, not yours. Leave Pakistan out of this. We will deal with Pakistan once we have dealt with India. Then you are only pretending to be their ally, is that it? Are they aware of this? Do they know that the money they slip into your hands under the table will one day be used against them? Since we set foot on these grounds, no one has been terrorized, no one has been hurt, with the exception of my tapping you on the cheek for refusing to fight me man to man. What about the gunshots we heard earlier in the other buildings? How do we know you have not killed any of the others? You have my word. Your word means nothing to me. Sheely's face reddened. Once more he swung the small sticks, striking Wall again in the face. <laughs> the cut on the Indian's face widened deepening the flow of blood down his cheek. <laughs> Wall struggled to blink away the involuntary tears the blow had brought to his eyes. Why are you here? What do you want from us? Fight me, and perhaps I will tell you. Why is it so important to you that we fight? Sheely gestured to the youths in the corner. Perhaps like you, I am not only a soldier, but also an educator. Perhaps I want to show them a glimpse of the future. I do not understand. You are India. I am Kashmir. You are yesterday. I am tomorrow. Together we can demonstrate how things will be. So now you are not just a freedom fighter. Now you want control of not only Kashmir, but all of India. Perhaps I exaggerate. Let us take it one battle at a time. For now, let us fight the battle for Kashmir. Wall regarded the Kashmiri. Bargadrum Shili wasn't only half his age, but a head taller and at least eighty pounds heavier, and yet Wall had every confidence that were he to take the sticks, one form of weaponry in the practice of Kali Payatu, he could easily defeat the other man in a matter of seconds. After all, in the thirty years since he had first taken up the martial art, Zirat Wall had come to be recognized as one of its greatest practitioners, rivaling even the vaunted Nahirs. Those of the Kiralun warrior caste whose ancestors had first developed Kaliparatu centuries ago.
when they were India's equivalent to the samurai of Japan. But what purpose, other than asserting his pride, would defeating the Kashmiri serve? There were another two thugs here in the room, each armed with a submachine gun, each clearly eager for an excuse to use it. Were he to humiliate their leader, there would likely be swift retaliation, and it would be directed not only against him. Looking past Sheely, Wall saw the boys and young men of the academy trembling in the corner, their small, wiry bodies glistening as much with the sweat of fear as with the ceremonial oil they wore as part of their regimen. They were his students, their safety his responsibility. He wasn't about to incite a bloodbath. Besides, though he had asked why the Mujahideen had come, Wall already knew the reason. There was no need to fight for an explanation. Katayam was not only close to the coast, but it was also less than 300 miles from the island republic of Maldives, where the U.S. president would be spending the first day of his trip to South Asia. The Mujahideen despised America almost as much as they did India, so it only stood to reason that they would seize upon the president's visit as a call to action. And whatever their scheme, what better staging area in Katayam than the academy? Isolated far off in the hills, the school, by design, had neither phone nor mail service. There wasn't another delivery scheduled until the middle of next week, and there would be no visitation by the youth's parents until the following weekend. Here, at least for the next few days, the Mujahideen could go about their business, whatever it was, without anyone being the wiser. What puzzled Wall most about this group wasn't its agenda, but rather its leadership. In talking with his nephew, Najib Wall, it had seemed clear that the Intelligence Bureau expected any Mujahideen terrorist activity in the area to be masterminded and carried out by their leader, Deri Nesha. And yet, five hours into their captivity, Wall had yet to encounter anyone passing out orders, save for the half-drunken lout in front of him. Could it be that Nesha had stationed himself elsewhere on the grounds? It didn't seem likely. From what Wall had read of the men, Nesha wasn't the sort of fool to delegate authority to a man who would drink while on duty. No, the likelier explanation was that something had happened to Nesha. If that was the case, it might bode well for the world in general, but Wall feared it could wind up meaning death for himself and those of the academy. Well, will you fight me, or would you have your disciples think you're a coward? No! One of the younger boys, who apparently understood a smattering of Urdu, suddenly broke clear of the others, hands clutched into small fists. Ziaratashan is a hero, not a coward! The boy was about to leap into the air when one of Sheely's cohorts stepped forward and swung hard with the stock of his submachine gun. <laughs> the youth reeled to the floor, clutching his side where he'd been struck. Some of the other boys were about to come to his aid when their way was blocked by the other Kashmiri. Together, the two soldiers fired several rounds into the dirt at the boy's feet, then raised their guns and aimed them threateningly. The youths shrunk back, rejoining the others. You terrorize children, and yet I am supposed to be the coward? Have you no decency, no shame? Were you raised by jackals? Again, Sheely's face reddened. His hand went to his holster. He drew a Kunan 357 Magnum pistol and aimed it at the instructor. Wall ignored the gun and glared defiantly at Sheely. For several seconds, the two men faced off, the Kashmiri's finger on the trigger of his automatic. Suddenly, the door to the Kalari opened. Another of the Mujahideen strode in, carrying a pair of high-powered binoculars. Sheely turned, lowering his gun. What is it, Shazad? There is a problem. Another problem? What is it this time? Shazad cautiously strode forward and murmured in Sheely's ear, as he listened, the Kashmiri's features hardened. Once the news had been delivered, he stabbed the gun back into his holster and followed the other man out of the room. Wall moved over to the injured boy and felt the youth's ribs. Uh, uh, <laughs> he could tell that several of them had been broken. He turned to the gunman who had struck the boy. He needs medical attention. The gunman reached to a ledge built out of the closest wall, where several folded fresh washed dhotis were neatly stacked. He took two of the cloth shorts and tossed them to Zirat. No! Medical attention! He needs to see a doctor! The gunman shook his head and pantomimed, wrapping the cloth around the boy's chest. Do it yourself! <laughs> Wall dabbed at the boy's tears 
then used one of the dotis to bind the youth's chest. Be strong. The boy nodded cheerfully. He took the other doty and wiped the blood trickling down the side of Wall's face. <laughs> Why did you not fight back, Ziaratashan? The wise warrior chooses his battles. When the time is right, he fights. As he followed Shazad from the building, Bargadrum Shili drew in a deep breath, trying to settle his nerves. What he really wanted was another drink, but he'd already drained his flask and had yet to find the opportunity to refill it without the others seeing. Not that he cared what they thought, he assured himself. There was another Kalari situated higher up the hillside. Leading up to it was a winding path made of crushed stone. At one point, Shili saw a serpent slither out of their way, vanishing into the brush. The monsoons have yet to come, and already the snakes are taken to high ground. Maybe they'd know something we don't, hmm? Perhaps. Taking advantage of a narrowing in the path, Shazad lengthened his stride so that he could walk ahead of Shili instead of beside him. Shili was about to chastise Shazad yet again, but thought better of it. As the path wound back on itself, he fumed silently and glanced downhill, past the buildings of the academy. In the days of the Raj, schools were funded by the Crown and had no need to concern themselves with operating budgets. But times had changed, and now, where there had once been cricket fields and riding pastures, the lower grounds had been given over to tightly clustered tea bushes and row after row of stately coconut palms. The school was run by private hands these days and depended on crop sales to remain in operation. Hired families worked the land and lived in barracks far from the academy, so they weren't yet aware of the Mujahideen's takeover. Vargadrum was sure that would likely change soon enough, leaving him with yet another problem to contend with. He licked his lips, aching for a drink, Everything was happening so fast. First it was the news that Dari Neshaw had been taken prisoner, forcing the Mujahideen to raid the academy without him. Now, while Shili's brothers were off trying to free Nesha, he had been left in charge. He thought it would be an idle time, after which his brothers would return with Nesha. Instead, everything seemed to be coming apart. The toll of the arduous trek south from Kashmir was beginning to show itself. The men were restless, irritated by a lack of sleep, the oppressive heat, and the insolence of their prisoners. And because Nesha had been captured before he could get his hands on a guidance system, there was uncertainty as to whether they should attempt to use the missile launcher. If they were going to use it, then what? What if his brothers didn't return by the agreed-upon time to fire the weapon? Should he proceed without them? It was so hard to know. The path finally brought Shili and Shazad to a courtyard outside the upper Kalari. Near the front steps, the statue of a Bengal tiger loomed majestically at the head of a reflecting pool filled with koi fish and lily pads. Shili was staring into the carved eyes of the stone beast, mesmerized by the creature's lifelike gaze, when he suddenly became aware of a faint, putrid odor. What is that smell? The wisteria? Shazad indicated the flowering vine that drooped from an arbor extending across the far end of the courtyard. No, not the flowers. Shili tried breathing through his mouth, but the foul smell continued to assail him, growing stronger by the moment. He looked around the courtyard, his eyes wild. The woman! What did they do with her? They took her down the hill and buried her as you ordered. Did you see them do it? I tell you, I smell rotting flesh. Well, I smell her flowers in the pond. No corpses. Besides, the woman was taken away right after she was shot. There was no time for her to have begun to rot. I'm telling you, I smell her. Where is she? Shili paced around the reflecting pool, looking in all directions. Where is she? Shazad watched Shili's manic pacing, more amused than concerned by the man's theatrics. None of us have had the chance to bathe since coming down from the ghats. Perhaps that would account for the smell. Shili instinctively craned his neck and was about to sniff under his arm when he stopped himself and whirled, catching the half-smile on Shazad's face. You find this amusing? Is that it? No. Then what are you smiling at? I wasn't smiling. I'm not blind. I know that look. What look? First your nose, now your eyes are betraying you too. I wasn't smiling, and there is no smell of rotting bodies here. You must be imagining things. Shili went to his holster, pulling out his pistol. Oh, no. You don't know this game, Shazad. Shazad stared at the gun barrel pointed at his chest, then looked up. Bargatom, please! 
You play tricks on my senses, then pretend you don't notice the same things I do. It's a plot. You want me to think I've lost my mind? No! Why would I? Why? So you can take control. You're all plotting against me. That's not... <coughs> the bullet ripped through Shazad's heart, killing him instantly. Before he could fall to the ground, Shili rushed forward, jerking Shazad by the collar of his tracksuit, so that he splashed headlong into the reflecting pool, scattering the koi fish. The body disappeared a moment, then bobbed to the surface face down, turning the water red. The shot drew two gunmen running from the Kalari. They stopped short at the sight of Sheely standing over their floating comrade. Sheely turned to them, still holding his gun down at his side. We have a chain of command here. It must be honored at all costs. Is that understood? The other men stood silently. They were both younger than Sheely, and far younger than Shazad. There was no petulance in their gazes, no trace of mutiny. If anything, Sheely saw that they were afraid, intimidated. He had them where he wanted them. Get rid of the body. Sheely strode past, then paused in the doorway and glared back at them over his shoulder. And do a better job than you did with the woman. Without awaiting a response, Sheely went inside and passed through an inner hall to the main chamber, used by the Academy's Katakali troop. Theatrical masks and costumes were piled in heaps on a row of benches, and along the far wall were makeup tables, covered with wigs, jars of pigment and face paint. It took some looking, but on one of the tables, Sheely managed to find a ceramic cup, half filled with a creamy liquid that looked much like the coconut toddy he'd been drinking all day. Sheely eagerly tipped the cup to his lips and took a sip. As he swallowed, however, he was suddenly overcome once more by the smell of carrion. <coughs> now he could not only smell death, but could taste it as well. What is this? What did they do with her? The Kashmiri wiped his tongue on the sleeve of his tracksuit as he staggered about the chamber, tossing masks and costumes asunder in the search for the body. It was nowhere to be found, but off in the corner he saw the woman's sewing machine, still lying on the floor where he'd tipped it over this morning. A bolt of shiny red fabric trailed from the machine, snagged where the woman had been trying to sew a seam at the time she'd been shot. She had claimed to be the troop's head seamstress, so Sheely and his brothers had assumed she would be able to quickly turn a few existing costumes into something that could pass for the clerical garb worn by local priests. But the woman had kept trembling and jamming the machine time and time again, until Sheely had finally lost patience and put a bullet through her head, forcing his brothers to look elsewhere for disguises to wear, in hope of freeing Derry Nashaw from the prison where he had been taken into custody. Sheely jerked at the bolt of red cloth, in the process, he inadvertently tugged the sewing machine toward him, revealing a splotch of darkened blood marking where the woman had fallen. Trailing away from the spot was a crimson smear, no doubt left by the woman's body as it was dragged away. He dropped to his knees and crouched over the bloodstains. They were already dry to the touch and didn't carry the smell of death. Enough! 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 Sheely leaped to his feet and fled the chamber. He bounded up the staircase leading to the observation tower, trying to put the smell behind him. It worked. By the time he reached the top step, the smell had dissipated. Pausing to catch his breath, Sheely glanced out and saw another Kashmiri eyeing him strangely, a cell phone in one hand, binoculars in the other. The other man quickly finished his call. Where is Shazad? Sheely offered up a twisted smile. He is in a conference with God. The commotion downstairs. The commotion downstairs is none of your concern. Sheely moved past the other man and stared southward. Stretching beyond the academy grounds in all directions were endless rice paddies interlaced by small canals. So much of the land was flat and muddy from irrigation that the academy, with its gentle hills and green-leaved crops, looked something like an emerald island rising up from a dull brown sea. A few miles away, however, there was another overgrown hillock, blocking Sheely's view of the Catholic Church, save for a tip of the cross mounted atop its spire. That's where Shazad saw the helicopter. Yes, Hafiz was there with his motorcycle. He was going to dispose of the priest's bodies as your brothers requested, but the authorities had already arrived. Before he could leave, the helicopter appeared. He fired at it, then got on his bike and tried to flee. But he wasn't able to get away. The other man shook his head. As best we could see, the man dropped on him from the helicopter, then killed him as they fought hand to hand. Sheely cursed to himself. What else could go wrong? What about the helicopter? Where is it now? I tracked it while Shazad went to get you. 
It passed over the city, and it was headed toward the coast, so I called our colleagues in Aleppi. They were able to sight it. Hopefully they will see where it lands. The way things have been going, I wouldn't count on it. Has there been any other activity? The other man nodded. Two men stayed behind with Hafiz. They were joined by others in an unmarked van. They loaded Hafiz into the van, then everyone drove off. And since then? Nothing. What about these men? Were you able to get a good look at them? Not really. Most of them were Indian, I would say, though a couple were white, including the man who killed Hafiz. Americans. I should have known. What should we do? Stay here. Let me know when you hear from Aleppi. Or, of course, if you see anything suspicious. Of course. Where will you be? I need to make preparations in case we have unwanted guests. Aleppi, Malabar Coast. When looking for a coastal base of operations during the first leg of the President's trip, the Secret Service had selected Zirigon, Tool and I, a run-down, nondescript manufacturing complex on the outskirts of Aleppi. The Secret Service was sharing use of the facility with the CIA, who'd bought the property through one of its shadow companies back in the 1950s, when the Cold War was in full swing, and Kerala had elected India's first communist ministry. Like the CIA, the Secret Service was drawn to the site, not only for its isolated anonymity, but also because it was within close proximity to both the main highway and the largest of several waterways that made up Aleppi's vast canal system. In fact, when arriving in his bullet-riddled helicopter, Grimaldi's makeshift landing pad had been a wood-frame observation deck extending out over the river. He'd nearly wound up in the water when the deck had threatened to collapse under the chopper's weight. A resourceful crew had managed to haul the aircraft into an adjacent warehouse made of corrugated tin rust-eaten by twenty years of monsoons. The whole structure rattled noisily with the reverberations of a struggling antiquated air conditioning system that lowered the inside temperature at best a mere ten degrees. Grimaldi was already sweat-drenched, even though he'd brought the chopper in only a few minutes ago, having left Mac Bolin and Nashib Wall to deal with the sniper Bolin had killed near the site of the priest killings. It didn't take long for the CIA's resident mechanic to assess the damage to the helicopter. He stepped away from the chopper, wiping his grease-stained hands on a rag. Be a couple hours before you're airborne again, and that's without patching up the window or back seat. That bad, huh? Let me put it this way. Your guardian angel must have pretty damn strong wings, because by all rights, this bird should have dropped like a stone back when you took that hit to the rotor assembly. And here I thought it was my keen flying ability. That, too, I suppose. I take it you've done your share of combat flying. <laughs> my share and then some. Grimaldi wasn't about to go into detail about his flight experience, which, prior to his lengthy stint with the farm, dated back to Huey Forays and Nam, and some regrettable freelancing for the mob. During those years, Grimaldi had piloted everything from mail-order ultralights to a space shuttle, and he'd long ago stopped counting the number of times he'd come under fire while in the air. For him, it was just part of being the farm's main pilot. Go ahead and get cracking. I'm probably going to have to double back to Kadiam ASAP. I'll do my best. The mechanic grabbed his toolbox and paused, regarding Grimaldi. You guys must really rate. How's that? I got a call from Washington saying to drop everything and give you top priority. Membership has its privileges. Membership to what is what I'd like to know. You're not with us, and I figure you're not SS either. What's that leave? Rangers? Delta? NSA? Grimaldi shook his head and grinned. Try NTK. Need to know. <laughs> you James Bond types are all alike. Everything's got to be hush-hush. Hell, you're probably just going to shuttle some high ranks to that new golf course in Quilon. Yep, and this is my nine iron. Grimaldi patted the Mark I Grizzly 45 automatic pistol tucked in his shoulder holster and glanced around the service bay. Look, I'm supposed to hook up with somebody. Yeah, I know. Guys even more tight lipped than you. Through the doorway, then hang a quick left. Grimaldi thanked the other man and crossed the work area. Off in one corner, two Secret Service agents, sleeves rolled up, collars unbuttoned, mulled over a cork board bearing a map of India stuck with different colored pins. Both men wore cellular headsets and were talking through small condenser mics as they referred to the map. Their focus was on the south edge of the Malabar coast between Mangalore and Trivandrum. Grimaldi figured they were beefing up security to account for a possible terrorist link to the priest killings in Katiam. The air conditioner made it hard to eavesdrop, 
but he overheard one of the men mention that the president would be landing soon on the northernmost of the Maldives atolls. After a day there, acclimating and meeting with the island republic's trade minister, the president would fly to the mainland on his peacekeeping mission. And Grimaldi knew the president wasn't about to cancel his plans because of any purported terrorist threat. Our bites worse than their bark was the way he always put it, referring to the number of times similar threats had been neutralized during previous state trips abroad, in many instances through the intervention of the covert warriors of Stony Man Farm. Grimaldi had a feeling that by the end of this latest trip, he and his colleagues would no doubt once again play a key role in making sure that Hail to the Chief wasn't a reference to an assassin's gunfire. The mechanic's directions led Grimaldi to the complex's newest addition, a small four-room building whose wood and adobe framework supported a tile roof that did a better job of reflecting the heat than the tin shell of the service bay. He found John Cowboy Kissinger in a tool room, temporarily doubling as the Secret Service's armory. With its stockpiled munitions, workbench, lathe, and assorted metalworking gear, the place reminded Grimaldi of Kissinger's workstation back in the States, where he served as the farm's resident armorer and weaponsmith. The two men were roughly the same age, but Kissinger was taller and more sturdily built. A one-time Cleveland Browns wide receiver, who still looked more than capable of shaking off a few tackles on his way to the end zone. Brown-haired, brown-eyed, dressed in combat fatigues, he was tinkering with something propped on the bench, so engrossed with his work that he didn't notice Grimaldi until the pilot moved in front of the stream of cool air blowing through the air conditioning vent. Leave it the cowboy to find the coolest room in the house. I hadn't noticed. Kissinger glanced up a moment, then turned back to his work. You made good time getting back here. It wasn't about the dawdle on the scenic route. Grimaldi passed along the diagnosis on the helicopter, then quickly briefed Kissinger on the latest developments in Katiam. Before we head back, this IB guy we're working with, Najib Wal, wants us to pick up some fireworks from a warehouse down by the waterfront. Fireworks? What for? He's concerned that if the Mujahideen have taken over this academy, it'll be tough to get close to them. He figures the diversion might help things. And this place on the waterfront supposedly has a stockpile left over from some spring festival they hold every year up in Trichur. Puba, poor boy, something like that. Poor em. It's kind of like their Mardi Gras. I'll put it on my calendar. Better brush up on your Hindi first. What you got there? Grimaldi eyed the strange contraption Kissinger was working on the size of a lunchbox, and made primarily of plated steel and black plastic. It looked like an unlikely cross between a bazooka and a handheld vacuum cleaner. Kissinger was just finishing screwing a two-foot-long retractable nozzle onto one end of the apparatus. My DHL prototype. Dragon's hairball launcher? You really gonna name it that? I thought that was just uh, an inside joke. It is. Once they go into production, I'll figure out something else for the initials to stand for. Kissinger had been developing the DHL back at the farm on and off for a few years now, coming up with the original idea while retro-engineering a Russian Air Force ODAB 500 PM fuel-air mixture bomb. While the cluster bomb-sized ODAB, or in English, volume detonation aircraft bomb, released shockwave energy capable of immobilizing enemy forces within a range of 100 yards, the smaller shells in Kissinger's miniaturized hybrids were more flammable, like a well-thrown Molotov cocktail, or as Kissinger had first described it when applying for funding, a well-spit dragon's hairball. On impact, they would detonate into deadly, fast-spreading fireballs. The DHL had a number of advantages over conventional flamethrowers, perhaps the greatest being its ability to be fired from a greater distance without revealing its point of origin. There were still a few glitches in the weapon's design, and after flying to India with Grimaldi and Bolin, Kissinger had gone on to Sri Lanka, where he'd met with a Nogambo weapons manufacturer specializing in incendiary devices. He had sent them specs for modifying a few parts of the DHL, including the retractable firing barrel, and it had been his hope to test the reconstructed prototype that morning at the firm's firing range. Instead, he'd gotten the call to head back to the mainland and help contend with the latest threat posed by the Mujahideen, now, though he'd just finished reassembling the weapon with the new parts, it looked as if testing would have to once again wait. After setting the DHL into its customized carrying case, Kissinger put the weapon in a locker the Secret Service had provided for him and headed for the door. All right, enough high-tech. 
Let's go get some old-fashioned fireworks. The quickest way to Aleppi's warehouse district was by water. The CIA normally had a small flotilla of boats gassed up and ready for use underneath the observation platform, but the officer leading Grimaldi and Kissinger down to the docks explained that the faster craft were already out in the field. Of the two boats available, the largest was a thatch-roofed country boat like those used by Carolyn farmers to transport crops from farm to market. Lacking either sail or motor, the craft had to be propelled by prodding long wooden poles into the river bottom and pushing off. The other choice was a smaller, metal-framed, three-bench rowboat outfitted with a low-horsepower Evinrude engine. The tortoise and the snail. We use them mostly for undercover and surveillance. They fit in with most of the boats you see around these parts. I take it the other boats are out because they pack a little more wallop. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, short notice and all. Guess we'll take the tortoise. The agent handed over the keys to the Evinrude. Then, as Grimaldi and Kissinger boarded, he untethered the rowboat from its moorings. Should be a clear run to town for you, only watch out about a half a mile down river. There's a lagoon where they rent out jet skis and some moron's always going to wind up straying out of bounds trying to impress his girlfriend. Ah, tourists, you gotta love them. Kissinger grabbed the oars and paddled out into midstream. Grimaldi started the motor and opened the throttle. With a faint lurch, the boat started downriver. Kissinger drew in the oars and glanced at the riverbanks, overgrown with thick bladed shrubs. Several water buffalo stood shoulder high in the bushes, chewing cud as they watched the boat putter by. Grimaldi smacked the Evan Rood with the flat of his hand. Hell, if they can swim, we ought to yoke them and have them pull us. Couldn't be much slower than this hamster wheel. Kissinger laughed, grabbing his bench with one hand while raising the other hand in the air above his head like a rodeo rider astride a bucking bronco. Woo, ride him, cowboy. Kissinger may have looked as if he belonged in the saddle but his nickname had less to do with time spent on the open range than the kick-ass, no-holds-barred reputation he'd earned years ago busting drug dealers during a stint with the DEA. In recent years, he'd found himself spending more and more time within the confines of the Stony Man Armory, but whenever called into the field, the old juices invariably started flowing, and Kissinger could be counted on to provide the kind of reckless daring sometimes needed to tilt the scales in a difficult mission. You should have seen Sarge take down that sniper this afternoon. You'd have been proud. Yeah? Hell yes. It was crazy. This guy's hightailing away from us on a dirt bike, so Sarge has me do a flyover low enough so he can hop out of the chopper and... Grimaldi's voice trailed off as he saw Kissinger bring a finger to his lips. The armorer was looking upriver past Grimaldi, his face etched with concern. The stony man pilot stole a glance over his shoulder and saw, less than a hundred yards away, another boat. It was difficult to make out any details, but the other craft was quickly gaining on them. Maybe it's our free upgrade. I wouldn't count on it. Kissinger slipped a hand to his shoulder holster, pulled out a modified Colt government model pistol, and thumbed off the safety. Grimaldi fished through a storage box near the rudder, reaching past a small hatchet and a three-gallon fuel canister for a pair of binoculars. He was trying to focus on the approaching boat when a gunshot whizzed past him. Not again! Grimaldi tossed the field glasses aside and opened the engine's throttle. The boat crept forward, barely responding to the extra gas. Meanwhile, another shot buzzed near Grimaldi's ear. Are these guys sensitive or what? I swear, all you gotta do is look at them and they start shooting. Let me see if I can get them to back off. Kissinger braced himself and brought his Colt into firing position. The other boat kept coming, prow high in the water, blocking his view of the vessel's occupants. It looked like a cigarette boat, a sleek craft built essentially for speed. There was no way Grimaldi would be able to outrun it. When a gunman rose into view, Kissinger fired a round from his Colt. The other man ducked, then quickly popped back up, unleashing another volley with his assault rifle. Most of the shots fell wide, but a few hit too close for comfort. We're like sitting ducks here! Grimaldi yanked out his LAR grizzly and blasted away. The other boat took a hit to the hull, but kept coming. They were nearing a sharp bend where a tree grew out at an angle from the embankment, its lower branches dipping close to the waterline. The river narrowed, and there was no way around. Grimaldi was forced to slow down so they could pass underneath, limbo style. Halfway through the obstacle, the stony man pilot idled the engine, grabbed the hatchet from the storage box, and handed it to Kissinger. Here, see if you can get that big limb there to dip a little lower. Gotcha! 
Grimaldi turned back and fired through the branches at the approaching boat, which was already slowing down. Kissinger, meanwhile, hacked fiercely at the largest of the tree branches. He stopped short of chopping all the way through, however. Once the limb began to give way, he let up, letting it creak lower to the waterline. Okay, let's scram! Grimaldi gave the Evinrude more gas and they pulled away. There was no way the other boat could plow through the tree without capsizing, so he figured they had time to possibly move to shore and take cover on the embankment. As they rounded the bend, however, Kissinger glanced ahead and came up with a better idea. They'd reached the lagoon the CIA agent had forewarned them about, and sure enough, a sunburned daredevil in floral swim trunks had hot-dogged into the river on his jet ski and taken a turn too sharply, dumping himself in the water. He just swum back to his watercraft and was riding it when Grimaldi and Kissinger caught up with him. The man was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, his handsome features seemingly stamped in the smug expression of someone used to getting his way without much effort. I need to borrow your toy there for a minute. Hey, no way, dude. Kissinger pointed his forty-five at the man. Yes way, dude. While the skier glanced toward the approaching boat with a look of annoyance, Kissinger grabbed him by the wrist and jerked him off the watercraft. Whoa! He practically flew past Kissinger into the rowboat. Get down and stay down! Kissinger returned fire, then climbed onto the personal watercraft. The skier, no longer smirking, pressed himself against the bottom of the boat. Be careful, man! I like passed all the insurance when I rented that thing! Not to worry. Cowboy here's as safe behind the wheel as they come. You're putting me on, right? Guys like practically psycho! Once astride the jet ski, Kissinger quickly familiarized himself with the controls. Fortunately, the ski was similar to ones he used back in Virginia at Lake Pena, a recreational facility an hour's drive north of Stony Man Farm. What's the game plan? I don't know, but I'm sure I'll think of something. Just cover my ass. Will do. Grimaldi checked his grizzly. The skier glanced up at the gun and grimaced. Oh, man, you mean there's gonna be more shooting? Afraid so, dude. Bummer, huh? Shit! I told my girlfriend we could do Maui. But no, she's gotta drag us to India. It's so spiritual, she says. Yeah, right. The man started to peer up over the side of the boat, but ducked for cover when bullets zipped into the nearby water. Ah! Shit! If you don't keep your head down, you're gonna be as holy as they come. Back at the tree blocking the river, the other boat had been forced to come to a stop. Two men leaned out, firing through the branches draped across the top of their boat. Grimaldi countered with an autoburst and managed to nail one of them, toppling him into the river. The other gunman fired back with one hand, while using the other to raise the branch Kissinger had weakened with the hatchet. Slowly the speedboat inched its way under the obstacle. Here goes! Once back in open water, the speedboat lunged forward. For the time being, though, its prow hung low in the water, and Grimaldi was able to keep the gunman preoccupied, giving Kissinger some leeway. At first, the armorer jetted in a wide arc toward the far embankment, but as he gained speed, he guided the ski back to the middle of the river and straightened course. Oh, man, dude's playing chicken! He's gonna wreck that ski for sure! Raising a fantail of spray in his wake, Kissinger bore down on the other boat, putting them on a collision course. He refused to let up on the throttle, and as their paths drew closer, he ignored the gunshots being fired his way and kept his eyes trained on the hands of the driver manning the speedboat. At the last possible second, the man's hands jerked the boat's steering wheel to the right. Kissinger simultaneously veered to the right as well and leaned away from the oncoming boat. The two craft narrowly averted a collision. Kissinger, already leaning precariously to one side, was knocked off balance by the wake of the passing boat. Losing control of the jet ski, he leaped free and plunged into the river as it slid sideways and sputtered to a stop just short of the toppled tree. Grimaldi, meanwhile, saw that the speedboat was now headed directly toward him. Out! Quick! Both men lunged into the water. The man at the controls of the speedboat tried to cut sharply to his left, but he still clipped Grimaldi's boat at an angle. The speedboat flew out of control almost instantly, flipping several times across the surface of the river before landing upside down in the water. A spark ignited spilled fuel. Grimaldi swam back to the rowboat. The hull was bent, but the craft was still intact and afloat. He pulled himself up, then turned and helped aboard the man in the shorts. What the hell's going on? It's like freaking war here! Grimaldi eyed the strewed burning remains of the other boat. Well, you're in luck. 
I think there's a ceasefire, at least for the time being. As they doubled back to pick up Kissinger, the other man looked past the armorer, his face brightening. Looks like the ski's still in one piece. All right. Mind if I get the fuck out of here? Go for it, dude. Grimaldi helped Kissinger aboard as the other man dived back into the river and went to retrieve his jet ski. That was close. You okay? Kissinger nodded. He drew his colt and gestured toward what remained of the other boat. Let's mop this up. Heading back downriver, Grimaldi and Kissinger kept their eyes open for survivors. Two intact bodies floated face down in the water near the smoldering debris, and amid the floating rubble were the scattered remains of at least one other man, dismembered by the explosion. Mujahideen? Gotta be. Must have somehow managed to track me when I was flying back. Damn it! It's not like you had a lot of choices after you got clipped. Maybe not. I wonder if one of them was this Nesha guy. Could be, but I wouldn't bet on it. Ron made detention center, Katayam. His whitened hair glistening with sweat, Derry Nesha stared through the barred window of his prison cell. As the late day sun inched lower toward the distant hills, he watched long shadows stretch across the hot, teeming streets of downtown Katayam. The already hectic cacophony would become even more charged and oppressive once the workday ended and commuters found themselves thwarted in their rush home. Getting anywhere with any semblance of speed or ease would be next to impossible. Nesha's calloused fingers tightened around the bars. The heat and noise were giving him a headache. He cursed under his breath and pushed himself away from the window. What was taking so long? The approaching rush hour wasn't Nesha's only concern. This was his second day of incarceration. The longer he remained in custody, the greater the chance the authorities would see past his forged identification, as well as his meticulously dyed beard and scalp and realize his true identity. Once that happened, everything would change. There would be increased security. He would be placed in a different cell, one without a view, one where his every move would be monitored. There would be interrogations, beatings, torture. Some, no doubt, would clamor to ignore the legal process altogether and have him executed on the spot or in a way that would ensure that his death was slow and painful. Whatever the course, Nesha, on the verge of his greatest triumph, would find himself undone by his own grim reputation. When pacing failed to ease either his nerves or his headache, Nesha returned to the window. His cell was three floors up, overlooking not only the business sector of Katiyam, extending for several blocks to where it merged with the city canals, but also the detention facility's parking lot. A handful of identical-looking patrol cars were parked in a neat row directly below, while an assortment of other sedans and trucks took up random spaces farther away from the building. Most of the vehicles were well-kept, and only a few years old, nothing like the barely operative rust-eaten junk heaps that dotted the streets of Nesha's native Salam. His skull now throbbing, he closed his eyes and tried to blot out the heat and the sounds of the city. Stroking his temples, he mentally transported himself back home to Zalam, a sleepy Kashmiri village of farmers, tradesmen, and artisans nestled at the base of the Himalayas. Though impoverished economically, Salam was rich in far more important ways. This time of year, while summer heat tortured the rest of India, Salam would remain temperate. Most nights there would even be a pleasant chill in the evening breezes. Nesha imagined himself rising from his own bed after a restful night's sleep and pausing to admire his clean-shaved, dark-haired image in the mirror. Oh, how the women loved that face, so filled with charm and vigor, nothing like the ragged, bedraggled disguise that now gave him the look of a man twice his age. From his house he would walk down a short hill and start the day with an invigorating dive into the cold, snow-fed waters of Lake Purjura. The icy chill would clear his head and leave his skin tingling. As he swam back to shore, he would find inspiration in the familiar sight of the mountains, peaked with frost above the tree line, where the mule deer and shaggy-maned tar roamed amid the verdant pines. Once dry, he would walk to town, breathing in the rich fragrance of saffron being plucked from crocuses grown in neat rows in the surrounding hills. In Zalam, he would browse for fresh fruit and vegetables at the market bazaar. The Sheely brothers would be performing acrobatic feats in the streets for spare change. His friends would be there, and he would invite them all back to his estate for an afternoon of cricket, after which they would dine on the patio. Fikrab would have his flute with him, 
on Desh, his battered sitar. They would play ragas as everyone else stared with idle contentment at the play of twilight on the treetops and in the meadows. Everyone would agree that Zalam, like all of Kashmir, was paradise on earth. Nesha's meditation dulled his headache, but also filled him with longing. He'd been away for months, letting his hair and beard grow as he trekked circuitously southward, all the while furtively attending to the machinations that, God willing, would one day see Zalam, as well as all of Jammu and Kashmir, ushered into an era of sovereignty befitting a true paradise. For most of his adult life, Nesha had strived to help make his homeland become just such a gem, a jewel unto itself, not some bauble tugged at from either side by the covetous hands of India and Pakistan. The mere thought of the interloping powers renewed Nesha's sense of rage. Like other Mujahideen cells, Nesha had initially sided with Pakistan on the issue of who should control Kashmir's destiny. After all, Pakistan was, like Kashmir, predominantly Muslim. And, of course, there was the matter of secret collusion. Pakistan steadily supplied the Mujahideen with cash, munitions, and other provisions for use in the ongoing battle against Indian forces stationed in Kashmir. It was only over the past year that Neshah had begun to think of swearing off his group's dependency on Pakistan and fighting instead for Kashmir's right to self-determination. What had changed his mind was one of those tranquil afternoons he'd just conjured up. He and the Sheely brothers had been staring westward, hoping to enjoy the sunset. Instead, they'd witnessed, across the veil of Kashmir, yet another in the endless barrage of shellings hammering the jagged peaks of Pir Panjal. Eerie tendrils of smoke rose up in the air, writhing slowly in the wind like restless ghosts of those just slain by the bombardment. The next day they'd learned that of the fifty-eight fatalities, only eleven had involved Indian troops. The rest of the dead had been Kashmiri mountain villagers, innocent men, women, and children, who wanted nothing more than to be able to go about their lives without fear that they might be claimed by the next errant volley. And this had been no isolated incident. The same ratio, five Kashmiris slain for every one Indian, had been maintained, more or less, for years since the line of control had first been drawn up. It infuriated Neshaw that Pakistan would routinely shrug off such fatalities or justify them on the grounds that they suffered an equal proportion of civilian to military deaths due to Indian shellings across the line of control. Now, though his Mujahideen still accepted Pakistani financing, they yearned for the day when the apron ties would be cut. And that day was supposed to have been close at hand. Everything had seemed to be falling into place, and as recently as yesterday afternoon, all of his dreams had seemed within reach. Then, thanks to a small twist of fate, everything had gone suddenly wrong, and his dreams had been taken from him. The Kashmiri felt a renewed sense of outrage when he recalled his capture. He'd been haunting an alley two blocks from Khyber Vance, a private computer firm specializing in tracking systems helpful in the recovery of stolen vehicles. Nesha had made queries and learned that the company was also a military subcontractor, providing many of the computerized guidance systems used in India's Shorad missile defense program. He'd cased the facility most of the day and was waiting for it to close for the evening so that he could break in and get his hands on some replacement components needed to repair a Sabre surface-to-air missile launcher that had recently come into the Mujahideen's possession. Less than five minutes before Nesha was to make his move, Local police had stormed the alley and taken Nesha into custody along with five other men. The others were part of a marauding band of street people who'd been responsible for a string of petty thefts in the area, targeting mostly clothing stores and food markets. Nesha had been mistaken for part of the gang, not only because of his disheveled appearance, but also because he was carrying forged papers identifying him as a local resident. And what should he have done? Claimed a case of mistaken identity? asserted that the police had unwittingly captured not some petty thief, but rather the mastermind of the dreaded Mujahideen, the Kashmir Shredder himself. South of Kutayam, Nesha could see the sun's reflection glittering diamond-like atop the choppy waters where the Lakhidiv and Arabian seas merged with each other. A jet coursed over the waters, leaving in its wake a contrail of exhaust. Nesha wondered bitterly if it might be the plane they called Air Force One, bringing the U.S. president to Maldives. If so, how ironic. 
how cruel that his closest glimpse of the American infidel, the two-faced jackal, who would simultaneously court both India and Pakistan while ignoring the cause of Kashmiri independence, should wind up being through prison bars rather than the scope of a high-powered rifle or even better, the rangefinder of an armed missile launcher. Unsettled, Neshaw diverted his gaze to the entry gate. A police cruiser passed through, then a uniformed officer armed with a Kalashnikov assault rifle stepped forward to scrutinize a tan-colored sedan pulling up to the guard station. After exchanging a few words with those inside the vehicle, the officer stepped back and waved the car through. Sunlight glanced off the front windshield as the sedan backed into a parking space directly opposite the gateway. Once the car came to a stop, both front doors slowly swung open. Two men, their faces obscured by wide-brimmed crimson hats, stepped out onto the asphalt. Their matching ankle-length robes flapped slightly in the afternoon breeze as they strode toward the rear entrance to the jail, each carrying a small black satchel. Up in his cell, Dere Neshaw's brooding scowl slowly gave way to a faint smile. Ragabir and Pengat, they were here. Neshaw's headache dissipated, replaced by a renewed hope that his dream might yet still be alive. Yes! We've come to hear confessions and bring prisoners the Eucharist. Ragabir Shili and his older brother Pengat were escorted into the detention center. At the front gate, the two men had been admitted with minimal questioning. Things changed, however, once they were turned over to the warden, a squat avuncular man with bushy sideburns and eyebrows as thick as caterpillars. Although the man flashed an accommodating smile, both brothers remained on their guard, sensing a glimmer of shrewdness in the older man's eyes. Their concern was quickly borne out as the warden led the would-be priests through the next checkpoint. Two other priests usually come by with the sacraments, Father Chowdhury and Father Ramat. Pangat wasn't sure if the warden was just making conversation or trying to trip them up. Fortunately, he and Rugabir had anticipated such questions. Yes, we were just at their parish. They came down ill this morning with food poisoning. We spoke to an acolyte who thinks the heat spoiled some of their food. That wouldn't surprise me. We were passing through on our way from Cochin to Alepi, so we volunteered to take their rounds. Pengat spoke in flawless Malayalam, suppressing any trace of the Kashmiri accent that, given the countrywide paranoia in light of recent subversive activity by the Mujahideen, might have prompted suspicion. Pengat was certain Dari Neshaw had restricted himself to Carillon dialect after his arrest, the better to pass himself off as some petty criminal rather than one of the nation's most wanted men. Ragabir finished embroidering his brother's cover story. Father Chowdhury said he'd call later to make sure we did a good job, so I hope you'll put in a good word for us. The warden smiled as he led the imposters down the hall, no longer as concerned with the priest's veracity as he was with the chance to trot out his homespun wit for a fresh audience. Well, if it's sinners you're looking for, you come to the right place. Never a shortage of them here. Are there any prisoners we should be forewarned about? The warden shook his head. No one of consequence here. Street thieves, drunks, a burglar or two, the usual rabble. All worthy of the Lord's forgiveness, as long as they are truly repentant. <laughs> repentant? They may confess to you, Father, but bring them before the magistrate, and they'll all claim to be innocent. Both Pengod and Ragabir indulged the warden with faint smiles. Side by side, they bore little resemblance to each other, or their brother Vargadrum. Pengat, half a head shorter, and every bit as stocky as Ragabir and Vargadrum were gaunt, was the oldest of the brothers, a member of Dari Nasha's inner circle for more than a dozen years. Of the three, he was also the most savvy and outgoing, a wheeler-dealer whose wealth of personal connections made him indispensable to the Mujahideen. It was Pengat who had made the necessary arrangements in the New Delhi bombing that had claimed the life of a U.S. envoy. Pengat, whose contacts had made possible the acquisition of the two Sabre surface-to-air missile launchers that would be the Mujahideen's trump cards in this, their most ambitious campaign ever to strike against those who would stand in the way of an independent Kashmir. And once it had become clear that Neshaw had been taken into custody here at the Ron Mate Detention Center, it was Pengat who had made a few calls and learned the layout of the facility from an acquaintance who had been a former inmate. Now, having made it inside the building, Pengat hoped they could free Neshaw without any further obstacles, 
and return to the Academy in time to launch one of the Sabre missiles at the American President's plane. As they passed a side hallway, Rugabeer, whose disguise was supplemented by a light gray beard and matching wig, as well as a pair of slightly tinted eyeglasses, glanced briefly down the corridor, then shot a glance at his brother. Pengat, recognizing the layout from the description given him by the former inmate, nodded imperceptibly. Father Ragobier could start on the top floor. I need to use the facilities. Then I can begin with the prisoners down here. Of course. The warden indicated the hall they had just passed. The first door on your right. When you're ready, just come down to the security gate. I'll see that you're cleared for admittance. Pengat watched the other two men round a corner, then backtracked to the side hallway. The first doorway was clearly marked as the men's restroom, but Pengat strode past it to a door farther down the hall. He gave the knob a turn, then frowned. Locked. Pengat checked his watch and drew in a breath, frustrated. He had a set of lock picks with him, but he lacked the skill to breach the tumblers as quickly as needed. Adding to his frustrations, he could see that both the door and its hinges were far too sturdy to be easily compromised. He'd have to find another way in. As he mulled his options, Pengot heard a faint squeaking at the far end of the hall. Moving away from the door, he crouched over a drinking fountain several feet away and rinsed his mouth with tepid, metallic-tasting water. As he did so, he glanced out the corner of his eye and saw a janitor approaching, pushing before him a three-wheeled mop bucket. At the sight of Pengot's priestly robes, the janitor genuflected and made a sign of the cross. Good afternoon, Father. God be with you. Pengat remained standing as he administered the blessing. He saw that the janitor was an older man, balding, with large, dark eyes that burned with religious fervor. A lamb of Christ, Pengat thought to himself, a sacrificial lamb. Perhaps you could help me, my son. Some new equipment has been installed here recently, yes? The janitor seemed puzzled at first, but then he nodded and indicated the locked door. The boiler, yes. It was replaced just last month. Ah, yes, the boiler, that was it. The warden asked me to say a blessing over it, to assure it's good running come winter when it will be in more demand, not that he doesn't have faith in your ability to fix it should anything go wrong. The janitor beamed a gap-toothed smile. He reached to his side, producing a cluster of more than two dozen keys bound by a large single ring. As he sorted through them for the one to the boiler room, Pengat casually set his satchel on the drinking fountain and reached into his own pockets, producing a rosary. To the eye, with its small wooden crucifix linked to evenly spaced prayer beads, the rosary looked much the same as any other. But there was one distinct difference. Whereas the beads of most rosaries were connected by string or frail chain, here the linkage was comprised of thin but sturdy wire. In fact, the same wire was used by a Swiss firm in Bern for the making of garrots, a weapon Pengat was far more trained in the use of than any religious object. Looping the rosary around both hands, Pengat stood behind the janitor, watching him unlock the boiler room. There you are, Father. All you have to do is go... <coughs> the janitor's voice was cut off as Pengat slipped the rosary around his throat and pulled tight. Though short, Pengat was a powerful man. Using his hip as a fulcrum, he pivoted the janitor off his feet, even as he pulled the beaded wire tighter, muting his victim's attempted cries. The janitor struggled briefly, but he had been taken by surprise and was no match for Pengat's brute strength. In a matter of seconds, he was dead in the would-be priest's arms. Pengat leaned into the door, opening it, and dragging the janitor inside. He eased the body onto the floor, then returned to the hallway for his satchel, as well as the mop and bucket. Once everything had been brought inside, he locked the door behind him and looked around. As he expected, the large room contained not only the new boiler, but also the furnace and the power box for the jail circuit breakers. In a far corner was the main feed for the center's telephone lines. Once he'd hauled the janitor's body behind the furnace, Pengat moved over to a lone, grimy window which opened out to the parking lot. In fact, less than fifty yards away, he could see the tan sedan he and his brother had stolen from the priests whose robes they were now wearing. Perfect. Pengat unlocked the window and raised it slightly. It moved freely with little sound. He raised it higher, leaving himself adequate room to squeeze through, then returned to the panel box. From his satchel he withdrew a Bible. Its leather-bound cover was secured with a clasp like a diary. Pengat sprang the lock, then opened the book, which was hollowed out. Rather than the Word of God... 
The Bible contained an assortment of tools. He chose a set of wire clippers and a screwdriver, then checked his watch. He still had a minute to go before it would be time to cut off the prison from the rest of the world. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. When the National Security Agency came under fire for not foreseeing India's and Pakistan's initial nuclear weapons tests in the late 1990s, they quickly responded by launching an Orion spy satellite whose sole function was to monitor the activities of these two neighboring rivals. After more than three years in orbit, most of the intelligence gathered by the satellite continued to deal primarily with nuclear weapons developments, but other information, some classified, some not, was routinely pulled in from the Asian subcontinent as well. Now with the president about to embark on a tour of the region, NSA analysts were going over all incoming data with the cybernetic equivalent of a fine tooth comb. They did so acting on the assumption that they alone were privy to whatever fell under Orion's vigilant gaze. But they were wrong. Deep in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, an hour's flight from NSA headquarters in the White House, Aaron Kurtzman sat pensively before his terminal inside the computer room at Stony Man Farm, along with colleagues Huntington Weathers, Carmen Delahunt, and Akira Tokaido. Kurtzman had spent all week paying close heed to intercepted signals from Orion and any number of other spy satellites circling the globe, including India's own UAVs. Along with helping orchestrate the covert operations of Mac Bolan, able team in Phoenix Force, Stony Man's cyber team had occasion to glean vital intel that might otherwise slip through the fingers of their overworked and underfinanced counterparts in other, more official agencies. Kurtzman had split his screen into four separate images so that he could simultaneously monitor feeds from both India's and Pakistan's leading news channels, as well as random Orion SIG intel and the steady flow of information being disseminated by every law enforcement agency within a 500-mile radius of the president's location at any given time. Predictably, each of the regional news channels offered slanted coverage of the president's visit, flashing sound bites from opposing heads of state righteously claiming they could settle their differences without America's meddling. Pakistan's Minister of Defense called the president a crass opportunist interested only in bolstering his re-election chances, while a noted Indian political analyst saw the visit as a veiled attempt to inflame global tensions so that Congress would be more inclined to pass upcoming legislation to fund the latest incarnation of the Star Wars defense system. On the SIG Intel screen, Kurtzman took note of a classified report on speculation by Indian intelligence that sabotage may have had a part in a recent accident involving a military train transporting two Sabre missiles from the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center in Trivandrum to an Air Force launch facility in Andhra Pradesh. Early indications were that the train, while passing over the Western Ghats, had been mistakenly rerouted across a turn-of-the-century wooden bridge undergoing foundation repairs after being weakened by the previous year's monsoons. The weight of the convoy had apparently been in excess of the revised limit, and the bridge had collapsed under the train's heavy load, dropping it into one of the deepest ravines on the subcontinent. Both the bridge's collapse and the explosion of fuel tanks had triggered a massive landslide that buried the train under several hundred thousand tons of rubble. Salvagers and investigators at the site had estimated that it would take a minimum of seven weeks just to clear away enough of the slide to gain access to what was left of the train, and even then it was thought that the remnants would be too heavily damaged to offer many clues as to the cause of the fateful plunge. In the immediate aftermath of the accident, it was assumed that all twenty-four crew members had perished, but search teams descending into the ravine had come across a lone survivor, one of the engineers, who'd apparently been thrown free of the train as it fell. The engineer, whose name was being withheld for security reasons, had lost his right arm to the landslide and was in a coma when found. For the past two weeks, he'd remained unresponsive, hooked up to a ventilator in a private ward at a military hospital in Munar. That morning, however, the man had finally come out of his coma. Despite objections from doctors, RAW and Intelligence Bureau investigators had been quick to move in for an interview. Their findings, disseminated under a cloak of secrecy to avoid a media feeding frenzy, were disturbing. Kurtzman shook his head as he read over the transcript of the interview. Uh-oh. This isn't good. What's not good, Bear? Kurtzman, a paraplegic since taking a bullet to the spine during an ill-fated attack on the farm, 
turned in his wheelchair. Standing behind him, glancing over his shoulder at the screen, was Hal Brognola, Stony Man's White House liaison. He'd just poured two cups of coffee from a machine near Kurtzman's desk. As he took one of the cups of coffee, Kurtzman quickly briefed Brognola on the intel he'd just intercepted. With the engineer saying the wreck wasn't an accident. How so? Somebody deliberately rerouted the train there? Well, that's only part of it. This guy says the train stopped short of the bridge because there were some boulders on the tracks. When he got out to take a look, he heard gunshots and saw one of the guards fall from the train. He was going to check on the guy when somebody jumped him from behind. Next thing he knows, he's lying in a military hospital being told the train went down the gorge with everyone aboard. Sounds like sabotage, all right. In which case, you have to think Mujahideen. Brognola kept one eye on Kurtzman's computer as he sipped his coffee, waiting for more news to flash on the screen. That's exactly what I'm thinking. And if we're right, I'm not so sure it was just sabotage. Brognola nodded. He could see where Kurtzman was going with this. Especially the way they stopped the train. I mean, if they were just looking to get rid of the convoy, they could have blown up the bridge while it was passing over. Kurtzman looked away from his computer and called out across the room, a massive chamber in the farm's recently built underground annex. Hey, Akira! He waved to get the attention of a young man huddled over a nearby computer. Akira Tokaido smacked his bubblegum as he glanced back to Kurtzman. You were following that train wreck with those Indian Sams a couple of weeks back, right? Check. I take it you just found out about that engineer. Tell us about those missiles, would you? No prob. Basically, it's a stripped-down version of the RAF's rapier field standard. Same range? Already Brognola was moving toward the front of the room, where a central screen showed a detailed map of South Asia. Tokaido skimmed over the specs as they flashed on the screen. Let's see. Five hundred miles tops, it says. They're figuring on them to anchor their Shorad system. Brognola turned to Kurtzman. Want to throw up a radius around Maldives for me? Already working on it. Kurtzman, operating the remote keyboard for the front wall map, toggled a few switches, and soon Brognola was looking at a computerized blow-up of the southern tip of India and the surrounding waterways. A shaded circle fanned outward from the president's first scheduled stop. Most of the Indian state of Kerala fell within the circle, as did a portion of Tamil and the eastern half of Sri Lanka. Sabres are light enough to be hauled by a Hummer. Weather-resistant anti-aircraft cruise snipe missile. Highly resistant to electronic countermeasures. That's the same as with the rapier. Didn't they come up with some kind of modifications? Targeting, I think it was. Right. Says here they fiddled with the launch and target engagement systems. They're still like the rapier in that the launcher can heave two different missiles and have them head for the same target at different trajectories. You know, so if somebody gets lucky and takes one out, the other can sneak in from another direction. Got it. Go on. Tokaido highlighted all pertinent launch information on the Sabre and read off key points. Let's see. Missiles can be tracked manually by one or two gunners with option of optical sights or radar screen tracking. Wait, here we go. The biggest breakthrough is the computer sighting mechanism, which in the rapier is confined to timing, firing sequence, and correcting deviation between optical sight line and missile track. The Sabre, by contrast, is capable of assessing dimensions of an intended target and therefore less prone to targeting decoys. To an extent, the computer sensors can even detect a target's density, so that if a decoy has the same dimensions, but different... Hold it there. Brognola stepped back from the map and rejoined the other two men. Carmen Delahunt and Huntington Weathers were on break, so they had the cavernous enclosure to themselves. Let's cut to the chase. For the sake of argument, let's say the Mujahideen had this train rerouted, then bushwhacked it, stole both sabers, then sent the train down the ravine, where it'd be buried under enough debris that no one would be able to figure out the sabers were missing until it was too late. That's a reach. Or at least I'm hoping it is. Because? Because if the Mujahideen have a couple of sabers and know how to use them, they could program the targeting sensors to sniff out Air Force One once it's within range. Not only that... They could go after it with four Sams at the same time. Each coming from a different trajectory. Yep. If you're the president, anywhere you look, you got an incoming warhead with your name on it. If we're right about this, Kadium's got to be on the short list for places the Mujahideen would be firing from. They're right within range of Maldives. Which means Max on the right track with these priest killings. They've got to have something to do with the missiles. Beats me what it is, but... Wait. What was that? Brognola pointed at Kurtzman's computer screen. 
Kurtzman glanced back at the corner of the screen flashing law enforcement data. The quadrant was filled with an aerial map of what was obviously a coastal city. Bombay, I think. Parade route the president's taken the day after the... No, not that. What was showing on the screen before? Is there any way to bring it back up? You have to ask? Racing his fingers across the keyboard, the burly computer expert first eliminated the other screens so that the monitor was taken up entirely with images received from the law enforcement feed. Then, by entering another set of commands, he was able to summon up the last string of images. To Brognola, it was much like seeing videotape play in reverse. As he looked at the whirring images, he was joined by Tokaido. There! Brognola pointed at the screen. Hold it right there! On the screen was what appeared to be a half-blacked-out profile photograph of a plain-faced, middle-aged man with a scraggly white beard and matching shoulder-length hair. Mugshot. From a jail in Kerala somewhere. Let's see. Kurtzman typed in a command and read the response. Ron, mate, detention center. Cadium. Why did the image black out like that? I thought you'd worked it out so these feeds never sent half images. I did. Kurtzman pulled down a menu and checked the receptor specifications. Supposedly everything's working. Then why is the image cut off like that? Who knows? It's an output glitch, though. Trust me. Brown out, freeze up, something like that. Brognola leaned closer to the screen, squinting to better make out the obstructed image. His eyes narrowed. Then he closed them a moment, as if trying to convince himself that when he reopened them, he wouldn't recognize the man on the screen. No such luck. Nisha. What's that? Derry Nisha. The cashmere shredder? Are you sure? Brognola nodded. He's dyed his hair and grown a beard, but it's him. I bet on it. Not according to the sheet they've got on him. Kurtzman backed up the images on the screen until they were looking at the Carillon equivalent of a rap sheet. Kurtzman highlighted the name. Pervez Vajti. He's local. I don't buy it. Call up your Majahideen files. Can you do that from here? If you're looking for Nisha, let's skip the middleman. Kurtzman split the screen again and pulled up one of his self-created search engines, then logged in a specific request for a right profile shot of Dari Nisha. Within seconds, the photo, culled from an archives on high-ranking terrorists, appeared side by side with the prison shot from Katiyam. Although the file photo of Nesha showed a clean-shaved man with dark, close-cropped hair, there was no mistaking the other features. Nice call, boss. So what are we dealing with here, Bear? Besides the fact that it ups the odds the Mujahideen are in Katiyam gunning for the president. Kurtzman tried to access the site that had dispatched the more recent photo of Nesha. That's one of those good news, bad news deals. The good news is that Nisha's in custody. And the bad? The bad news is whoever's got him doesn't know it. Damn. Suddenly half the screen turned dark. It gets worse. This detention center's having some kind of blackout. Ron made detention center, Katayam. Ragabir Shili was pretending to absolve Derry Nesha of all his sins when his brother Pengat shut off the power to the entire detention center. The lights and air conditioning gave out simultaneously, and there was a fleeting, almost eerie moment of silence. Ragabir rose from Nesha's cot, taking off his wide-brimmed hat as he moved to the cell door. He peered out through a small barred window. The closest guard was far down the corridor, barking into a wall phone. He sounded more annoyed than alarmed, testimony to the frequency of power outages during the summer months in Katayan. Most of the other prisoners had moved to their doors as well, clutching at the bars or clanging on them with bowls, cups and spoons, ranting for the air conditioning to be turned back on before their cells turned into roasting ovens. Ragabir turned from the door. Quickly, we don't have long. Nesha nodded, already stepping out of his dull, loose-fitting prison guard. He gave the clothes to Ragabir in exchange for the other man's robe. In silent haste, the men dressed, Ragabir taking on the guise of a prisoner, while Nesha turned himself into a man of the cloth. Ragabir took off his wire-rimmed glasses and handed them to Nesha. Here, with these, in the dim light and confusion, they are sure to mistake you for me. You've done well, Ragabir. Nesha donned the glasses, then reached into the black satchel Ragabir had smuggled into the detention center. He pulled out a foot-long crucifix and gave it a sharp twist. The base separated from the crossbar, revealing a sheathed stiletto. Nesha grinned as he pulled the knife free and stared at its gleaming eight-inch blade. Very well, indeed. The taller man smiled gratefully. My way of making amends for what happened in New Delhi. 
The two men had had a falling out back at the Indian capital. It was just prior to the bombing that had killed the American envoy. Ragabir had suggested they curtail their sabotage in hopes the authorities could be lulled into a false sense of security prior to the U.S. president's arrival. Neshaw had disagreed, saying that continued attacks, especially over a widespread area, would keep their enemies distracted, their resources diluted. The men had argued their points vociferously, at one point almost coming to blows. Finally, Ragabir had relented, apologizing for having questioned Neshaw's authority. Neshaw had been placated and the bombing had been carried out, but ever since there had been a gulf between them. Perhaps now, Ragabir reasoned, the gap could be closed and the matter put behind them once and for all. Ragabir took a seat on Neshaw's cot of straw. You will leave with Pengat. I will explain that you overpowered me while I was hearing your confession and then took my place. Once they let me go, I will rendezvous with you at the academy and we can resume our plans. The missile launcher will be ready. Neshaw set the wide-brimmed hat atop his head, then adjusted the glasses on the bridge of his nose. Indeed, to an undiscriminating eye, he could easily pass for Ragabir. You're forgetting. I was taken in by the police before I could get my hands on the components for the guidance system. I realize that. But you yourself said that the missiles can be fired without the upgraded system. They will only be a little less effective, yes? Perhaps we will not disintegrate the jet in the air, but we can send it into the sea. We can give the sharks a taste of democracy. Nesha smiled briefly, but then his face took on a sad expression. There is one problem with your plan, Ragabir. When you attempt to leave here, don't you think it will seem suspicious that you can see just fine without your glasses? Ragabir shrugged as he finished buttoning his prison shirt. Huh. I will squint a little, that's all. I'll pretend that without the glasses I am half blind. And your beard? How will you pretend it's real if they give it a tug and it falls from your face? Ragabir patted the costume facial hair he'd taken from the wardrobe room back at the academy. That won't happen. They will have no reason to pull it. Nesha smiled sadly. These men may be incompetent, but they are not complete fools. They will be looking for answers to what is about to happen. They will be asking questions. I am no stranger to interrogations. They will get nothing from me. Nesha looked Ragabir in the eyes. I believe you, my friend. And I do not mean to question your integrity. Without warning, Nesha suddenly lashed out with the stiletto, thrusting it into the other man's chest, just below the breastbone. In almost the same motion, he gave the blade a sharp twist, tearing a gash through the heart it had just punctured. Ragabir stared at Nesha, incredulous, his eyes already clouding with death. When he parted his lips to speak, blood spilled down his chin. No words came forth. Forgive me, Ragabir. This is the way it must be. Keeping the blade embedded in Ragabir's chest, he gently lowered the man, then laid him out on the floor. He then withdrew the blade, wiping it clean on his robe as he strode to the door. Down the dimly lit hall, the guard had just hung up the phone and was shouting for the other prisoners to be quiet. Nesha raised his voice so that he could be heard above the others, doing his best to imitate Ragabir's high-pitched voice. Something's wrong with my prisoner! Hurry! He's passed out on the floor! The guard finally heard and came to the cell door. Nesha stood back, lowering his head so that the hat's brim would shield his features. I don't know what happened. I was listening to his confession when the power went out and suddenly he collapsed. Just what I need. Perhaps it's the heat. He may have just fainted. If it's not one thing, it's another. Still holding the keys, the guard strode past Nesha and crouched over Ragabir. When he saw blood seeping out from the body, he frowned suspiciously. He was about to say something when Nesha attacked again with the stiletto, this time from behind. <laughs> He swiped the razor-sharp blade across the guard's throat, severing both vocal cords and a carotid artery. For good measure, he then thrust the blade into the guard's back, just to the left of the spine. Again, he gave the blade a sharp twist, ripping through several organs and taking a gouge out of the guard's spine. The guard crumpled on top of Ragabir Shili, their blood mixing together on the floor. Nesha wiped blood from his hands, then cleaned his blade once more and set it in a side pocket of the black satchel, leaving the handle exposed for easy access. He took note of which key the guard had been holding, then helped himself to the entire ring, as well as the gun in the man's holster. It was a standard police issue 357 Magnum Smith & Wesson. Nesha had been hoping for a pistol with more rounds, but this would have to do. Pocketing the gun inside the folds of his clerical robe, he left the bodies behind and strode into the still darkened hallway. Instead of breaking into a run, he calmly went to the adjacent cell.
I forgive you your trespasses. The prisoner, a young man in his twenties, stared at Nesha, dumbfounded. Forgive me? You're a free man. Nesha pointed down the hallway toward a stairwell leading down to the main floor. Go and sin no more. A grin broke across the prisoner's face as he stepped from his cell. As he started jogging for the staircase, the other prisoners couldn't help but notice. Patience, patience. It took less than a minute for Nesha to release another twelve men. All of them were quick to abandon their cells and follow the first man to the stairwell. Nesha, meanwhile, went the other way, sorting through the keys for the one that worked the door to a back staircase. He bounded down the steps. Apparently the guards downstairs were taking exception to Nesha's release of the prisoners. When he reached the ground floor, Nesha calmly stepped out into the hallway. There was pandemonium everywhere. Uniformed officers scrambled about in the shadows, guns in hand. Most of them were headed toward the commotion near the stairwell at the far end of the hall. One officer, however, heard Nesha behind him and whirled around, aiming his revolver at the would-be priest's chest. I was told to come down this way for my own safety. The guard lowered his weapon. Of course. Forgive me, father. Follow me. Striding behind the guard, Nesha was escorted to the same doorway through which the Sheely brothers had been admitted to the building. I'd walk you to your car, but we have a situation here. I understand. I'm sure the Lord will watch over me. And you. The guard turned heel and charged back into the building. Nesha suppressed a grin as he strode across the parking lot. Pengat Sheely sat behind the wheel of the tan sedan, engine running. Nesha circled around and let himself into the front seat. Did it all go well? Like clockwork. And my brother? He was brilliant as always. He'll join us later at the academy. Now let's go. Nesha held the stolen Smith & Wesson below the dashboard as they approached the front gate. The guards had taken cover and drawn their weapons, but they were less concerned with the would-be priest than the unseen Fuhrer being played out inside the building. Keeping their eyes trained on the complex, they quickly waved Nesha and Pengat out of the parking lot. There's another car waiting for us a mile from here. We'll switch and leave this one for them to puzzle over. Good. I knew I could count on you, Pengat. Pengat flashed a grin. Then, just as quickly, his face grew taut. Rounding the corner, he was forced to ease up on the accelerator. Traffic was backing up. By the time they'd reached the end of the next block, the sedan had been brought to a complete stop, hemmed in on all sides by other vehicles. Roadblock? I don't think they're that fast. It's just rush hour. Bad enough. I was afraid this might happen. Nesha closed his eyes, grimacing, his skull beginning to throb anew. The street noise that had tormented him up in his cell was nothing compared to the cacophony that now enveloped him. Every driver seemed to be either leaning on his horn or cursing loudly in Malayam. Some were doing both, raging at one another, as well as the Trisha operators and the small handful of men who'd chosen this of all times to herd their livestock through town. Pengak could see Nesha was in pain. He was no stranger to the other man's migraines, and he knew that if they stayed here, stranded inside the car, Nesha would soon be incapacitated. They'd be trapped. Something had to be done, or all the effort put into Nesha's escape would prove to have been in vain. Shifting the car into neutral, Pengat stepped on the parking brake, then reached into the back seat, grabbing a pair of hiking shorts and a loose shirt. He handed the clothes to Nesha, then started to unbutton his own robe. Out of your disguise, Derry. Quickly, both men changed, ignoring the stares of those outside their car. Pengat then wadded their robes into a ball and stuffed them into a space between the two front seats. He grabbed the black satchel he'd brought with him into the detention center. Then once he saw that Nesha was dressed, he took a cigarette lighter from his pocket and set fire to the robes. Out! Pengat shifted the transmission into gear. Even with the parking brake on, the sedan began to slowly inch forward. Nesha hesitated a moment, watching flames creep from the burning robes to the fabric of the seat covers. A foul-smelling smoke began to fill the car. Daddy, no! Nesha blinked as if snapping out of a trance and nodded. Both men got out of either side of the car. Leaving his door open, Pengat reached in and released the parking brake. The sedan immediately picked up speed, crashing into the rear end of the idling minivan in front of it. Out of the van sprang a tall, barrel-chested man, screaming with rage. He pointed out the damage to his vehicle, then shook a fist at Pengat, cursing. When Pengat tried to brush past him, the man blocked his way and gave him a sharp push. As Pengat staggered backward, Nesha fired his Smith & Wesson over the top of the sedan. The driver of the minivan took a bullet to the face and spun to one side before slumping over the hood of the burning sedan.
Pengat quickly recovered his balance and broke into a run. Nesha followed close behind, and they threaded their way through the congestion until they reached the end of the block, at which point they detoured through the alleyway between two buildings. Crossing a back parking lot, the men leaped a short fence and followed a side street that soon led them to a small city park. A gathered crowd paid them little heed, their attention drawn instead to a street performer, goading his pet Gibbon, dressed in a miniaturized white tuxedo, to dance in time with disco music blaring from a small boombox. Running helped blunt the pain of Nesha's migraine, and he took heart that Pengat seemed to know where they were headed. Pengat, who'd carefully studied a street map of downtown Katiam before leaving the academy four hours ago, next led Nesha across a narrow arching bridge that spanned one of the city's canals. They climbed another fence, this one made of rusting chicken wire, then crossed a field strewed with weeds and litter. Both men were gasping for breath when they finally found themselves on an isolated dirt road a quarter mile from the highway leading out of town. The only car in sight was an old brown Honda sedan parked on the shoulder, as the men approached the car, the front door opened and the driver stepped out. It was a woman. She was tall, red-haired, wearing jodhpurs, riding boots, and a white silk blouse. I was beginning to worry. Where's the other car? Pengat took the keys from the woman and climbed into the driver's seat. There was a change of plans. Nesha smiled faintly at the woman, stroking her cheek as he moved past her into the back seat. The woman got into the car and sat next to him. As soon as the door was closed, Pengat pulled out onto the road and started for the highway. Easing back in his seat, Deri Nesha exhaled with relief. The woman beside him ran her fingers through his hair, then leaned close and kissed his forehead. At the same time, she took his hand and guided it between her legs, pressing them tightly together. Welcome back, Derry. I missed you. Academy of Arts in the Ghats Pressed into service, the thatched roofed country boat that less than two hours ago had been moored at the CIA base in Aleppo now floated near the earthen dike separating Katiam's canals from the sprawl of tea plants and coconut palms being farmed on the lower grounds of the Academy of Arts. Nashzi Bual stood in the bow of the craft, holding a long round wooden pole that extended to the bottom of the shallow canal. The Intelligence Bureau agent's unruly mop of jet black hair and boyish features gave him the look of an enterprising teenager, one of dozens who routinely ferried about these waterways, looking to shuttle goods and passengers between the city and outlying areas. Wall glanced around casually. Once he felt certain no one was looking his way, he faintly shrugged his head to one side, as if working a kink out of his neck. Inside the boat, Mac Bolan relayed the signal to John Kissinger, who was crouched between the stacked crates of sparklers and ceremonial fireworks he and Jack Grimaldi had picked up in Aleppo after their altercation with the Mujahideen downriver from the CIA base. While a CIA powerboat had hauled Kissinger and the country boat upstream to Katiam to rendezvous with Bolan and Wall, Grimaldi had returned to the base to await repairs on the helicopter. Meanwhile, Secret Service teams and a band of CIA field operatives based at the site were searching both sides of the river for any remaining Mujahideen forces in the area. In Katiyam, Nashiv Wall's IB cohorts were assembling a backup force to stake out the academy's periphery, and a few miles away, making their way across the choppy waters of Vaimbanad Lake in massive powered barges was India's 73rd Armored Regiment, the closest military force in the area, they'd been going through maneuvers on the nearby coastal marshlands. The regiment was coming prepared, if necessary, to use its Soviet-made tanks to storm the academy. Such tactics, however, would be only a last resort, as there was concern that if the Mujahideen had indeed taken over the academy, armed with the missing saber launchers, too strong a show of force might prompt them to fire missiles, not only against the troops, but also across the Lakadiv Sea toward the President's temporary quarters in Maldives. As a first court of action, it was decided that Bolin and Kissinger, with Wall's help, would first try to infiltrate the academy and determine the extent, if any, of the threat posed by Dari Neshaw's band of insurgents. Almost ready. Kissinger was knotting the laces of his calf-high boots. He turned his ankle while being thrown from the jet ski back in Aleppo and hoped the boots would minimize further injury. Like Bolin, he also now wore a Kevlar-lined flak vest over his combat fatigues. 
When he saw that Kissinger was ready, Boland stole from the boat's hold and scrambled up the embankment, taking cover behind a waist-high hedge that ran spine-like down the center of the dike, its roots anchoring the rich, loamy soil. Kissinger quickly slung on a backpack, then followed close on the executioner's heels. Looking the other way, Nashib Wall stabbed his pole into the water and eased his craft away from the dike. With a carefree smile, he waved to some of the threshers slogging their way through the nearby paddies. Much as he wanted to be in on the recon, Wall knew he was more valuable in this capacity, passing himself off as a local as he slowly encircled the academy grounds, keeping an eye open for suspicious activity. Once the other Intelligence Bureau agents arrived and took up their positions, he would await Boland's signal. If an assault seemed possible without harming the residents of the academy, Wall would use the fireworks to help flush out the enemy. By then, the 73rd Regiment would have crossed the lake and brought their tanks ashore. Of course, if he had to, Wall was prepared to abandon the boat and storm the academy single-handedly if he thought it would help keep the Mujahideen from slaying his uncle and carrying out their agenda. Up on the dike, Bolin and Kissinger watched Najib Wall guide the boat away from them. The men further camouflaged themselves by streaking their arms and faces with soil from the embankment. I hope we can count on him. I'd bet on it. Reaching beneath his flak vest, Boland drew his forty-four. Kissinger thumbed off the safety on his Colt. Ready? Let's go. Dropping to the ground, the two men crawled from the dike to a tangle of thick brush growing wild alongside a dirt path that led past the tea plants and coconut palms. It was slow going, as they had to stop each time a low-hanging branch snagged on their clothing and threatened to snap. They were further impeded by swarms of large black flies drawn to their sweat as if it were some sort of nectar. As he blew one of the flies from his face, Kissinger couldn't help thinking how less than 24 hours ago he was lolling at a beach cabana in Sri Lanka, discussing weapons designs over a pina colada with the R&D techies from the Gombo who'd modified some of the components for his DHL prototype. Today, he was supposed to be touring the firm's manufacturing plant, then attending a banquet featuring a pig roast and entertainment by the island's most captivating dancers, including a runner-up in last year's Miss Universe competition. Instead, here he was, pressed into last-minute field service, mud-wrestling his way to a probable firefight in which, most likely, he and Bolin would find themselves, as usual, woefully outnumbered. This after he'd already put his life on the line playing water chicken with a boat full of gunmen back in Aleppo. As they made their way across the lower grounds, Kissinger began to wonder if Najib Wall had been mistaken about the Mujahideen having seized the academy. There was no visible activity up near the Karalas, and from all appearances, the farming operations down here on the flatlands seemed legitimate, the epitome of Carolan efficiency. Out in the fields, workers methodically made their way down the rows of shoulder-high tea plants, plucking at leaves with practiced rhythm. Near one of the storage buildings, meanwhile, men loaded freshly husked coconuts into the hold of a wide-bottomed boat tethered to a makeshift trailer. Once filled, it would be hauled down to the canals and eased into the water. Twenty yards to their right, in the shade of the surrounding palm trees, a team of women, oblivious to the heat, knelt amid the discarded husks, hammering them with wooden clubs. Up in the palm trees themselves, short, wiry young men made cuts in the bark with scythe-like knives, drawing forth an oozing sap. To Kissinger, it appeared that the men and women alike went about their business with single-minded focus and concentration, totally unconcerned with any activity except their own. Kissinger and Bolin watched the activity from their vantage point in the brush. I don't know. I don't think anyone here is any more Mujahideen than we are. You might be right. On the other hand, maybe they're just taking a page from our guys back home. Bolin was referring to the black suits who worked the grounds at Stony Man Farm, which was laid out to pass for a bona fide agricultural enterprise, complete with crops, fruit orchards, and timber harvested by an operational lumber mill. I don't think so. Our guys keep an eye on the perimeter no matter what they're doing. These people are all work. Could be the Mujahideen have them working at gunpoint. Bolin continued to scan the grounds. As the wind shifted, he detected a sweet, cloying aroma. He turned and traced the smell to the first rise leading up to the academy. Next to a small knoll, overgrown with ferns, was a mountainous pile of dried palm fronds, just beyond which a thin, barely visible cloud of smoke trailed up from what appeared to be some kind of ventilation pipe. 
By now, Kissinger had picked up the scent as well. A still? Could be. Maybe that's what they do with the sap. <laughs> White lightning. I'm sure they have another name for it. Let's see if they've got something else brewing. Hoping to circle behind the knoll, Bolin and Kissinger sprinted across a clearing toward another cluster of hedges. Bolin rolled to one side and peered up through the brush at the surrounding palms. High up, beneath the canopy of a nearby tree, a man leaned outward, having exchanged his knife for an assault rifle. He fired with one hand, gripping the tree with the other. It was enough to throw off his aim, and his shots scattered wide of their mark. Bolin calmly took aim with his desert eagle. The sniper dropped his rifle, then followed it to the ground, arms flailing. Bones snapped as he landed head first, breaking his neck. Another one at three o'clock! Kissinger fired his weapon, but the other sniper had already taken cover. If they're all armed up there, we're in trouble. Let's get some backup in here! Bolin was already keying his walkie-talkie to reach Nazib Wall back at the boat. Suddenly, the air over the south end of the property was filled with multicolored pinwheels of smoke and flame. Wall must have touched off the fireworks. Trying to buy us some time. Let's make the most of it. While the gunmen in the trees were distracted, Bolin and Kissinger bolted from cover and advanced to a waist-high stone wall covered with ferns. They now had a clear view of the distillery. Check it out. The distillery was the size of a two-car garage made of cinder block with a thatched roof. Two men were standing in the front doorway, looking in the direction of the fireworks. Both were armed with MP5 submachine guns. One of them glanced over his shoulder and shouted back into the building. Someone called back to him. Then both men went back inside, closing the door behind them. Moments later, a front window was raised partially open, and one of the gunmen peered out from behind rustling curtains. I wonder how many are in there. No telling. But I don't think barging in's the way to go. As they pondered their next move, Bolin and Kissinger listened to the steady popping sounds in the distance. I can't tell if there are any gunshots or if it's all just fireworks. Me either. Bolin licked his fingertip and checked the wind, then turned to Kissinger. Maybe we can take the snipers out of the equation. How's that? Bolin gestured past them at the heap of dried palm fronds piled near the distillery. You were saying how you wanted to test drive that DHL of yours, right? Kissinger was hesitant. True, he'd brought along his pet project, but this was a hell of a proving ground. Bolin was right, though. If it worked, the launcher was their best chance. He took the DHL from its case and had it assembled in less than 30 seconds. Propping the weapon on his shoulder, he peered through its built-in scope, which used an integrated computer system to calculate firing distance and trajectory once he'd acquired his target. One dragon's hairball coming up. Kissinger pulled the trigger. The DHL bucked hard against his shoulder as it spit forth a six-inch long projectile. The charge detonated on impact when it landed a few yards in front of the stacked palm fronds. The fronds, dry as kindling, quickly ignited. Sparks flew outward, and a thick column of black smoke took to the air. Nice shooting, cowboy. Thanks. Now comes the tricky part. Kissinger rejected a shell from the DHL and quickly rearmed it with another cartridge. To date, the biggest flaw with the DHL had been the heat generated inside its retractable firing shafts during each launch. It was usually so intense that the tubes were thrown out of alignment, compromising the accuracy of any follow-up shots by as much as 40%. Kissinger was relieved his first shot had been on the mark, but as he took aim at the roof of the distillery, he could only hope the replacement tubes he'd picked up in Sri Lanka would be an improvement over the old ones. Come on, baby. At the last second, he decided to factor in the weapon's tendency to fall short on its follow-up shots. Tilting the barrel, he aimed slightly higher than called for, then braced himself and fired the second round. Straight and true, the incendiary charge beelined toward the building, slammed headlong into the chimney pipe and disintegrated. Fiery shards hailed down on the roof, feasting on the dry thatch. The new firing shafts worked. I'll be damned. Maybe so, but let's get these bastards first. Kissinger ditched the DHL in favor of his Colt pistol. I'll take the back. Both men quickly vaulted the stone wall and split up. Kissinger circled around toward the rear of the distillery. Bolin went the opposite way, making sure to keep the blazing palm fronds between himself and the building. Once he reached the top of the knoll, he took cover between two fern-shrouded boulders. One boulder provided protection from any possible gunfire coming from the distillery while the other shielded his back should anyone start firing at him from behind. So far, however, it didn't appear that he'd been spotted. 
either from the trees or the sentries inside the distillery. Poland could see flames devouring the building's thatch roof, and drifting smoke from both fires stung his eyes and burned in his throat and nostrils whenever he took a breath. It had to be even worse inside the building, he reasoned, and was surprised that no one had yet been forced out into the open. Seconds dragged on, and Bolin was still waiting for the Kashmiris to show themselves when his walkie-talkie squawked faintly on his hip. Striker here. You're not going to believe this. I'm 20 feet down some freaking hole. A trap? No, I think it's an old well. I was trying to get through these tall weeds when I stepped on something that gave under my weight. And the next thing I know, I'm like Alice down the rabbit hole. You all right? Outside of my pride, yeah. My ankle's smarting, but that's the least of my problems. I'm up to my armpits in water, and the walls are so slick with algae I can't climb out. <coughs> give me a second. I'll head over and give you a hand. Forget about it, man. Stick with the program. I just wanted you to know why I'm a scratch. Bowling glanced downhill staring past the burning fronds. Look, I don't know why, but nobody's come out of the distillery yet. If we're going to have to go in after them, we'll have a better chance if there's two of us. You sure? Tell me where you are. Kissinger relayed his position as best as he could remember it. I'm on my way. Bolin signed off and was about to backtrack the way he'd come when he noticed someone peering out the front window of the distillery. Bolin couldn't break cover without being spotted. By the same token, he couldn't take out the sentry without tipping off his position. Bolin grabbed his walkie-talkie again. He was about to check with Nasib Wall when a section of burning fronds suddenly tumbled free from the pyre. When it hit the ground, sparks scattered, igniting wisps of dry grass. The sentry's gaze shifted to the new fires. Bolin saw his chance and bolted from cover, crouching low as he passed through a cluster of wild tea plants. Thirty yards behind the distillery, he came across the crumbling foundation of an older building being reclaimed by the elements. Kissinger had said he'd just spotted the ruins when he'd fallen into the shaft, so Bolin slowed and made his way cautiously. Finally, he spotted an opening in the tall weeds and headed toward it. The well was barely five feet across. Kissinger had figured out that he could inch his way upward by bracing his shoulders against one side of the wall and extending his legs across for traction. It was slow going, but he was making progress. How about a hand? Wait till I get a little closer. Keep an eye open so we don't get bushwhacked. Bolin grabbed his walkie-talkie and again keyed Nasib Wall back at the canals. No answer. He tried again with the same results. So much for backup. From his cover in the brush, Nasib Wall watched the last of his fireworks erupt out over the canals. In their wake, a column of dark smoke rose up from the smoldering half-sunken remains of his boat, this on top of the smoke coming from the foothills. Ash fell from the sky like snow. Though he'd yet to spot the Americans, Wall suspected they had started the second fire to deal with the snipers in the trees. He hoped the ploy had worked, but he was concerned that there was no more gunfire. Had the two Americans been taken out by ground troops? Wall wished he hadn't left his walkie-talkie back on the boat in his haste to get clear of the fireworks. Of course, given his present position, Wall wouldn't have been able to communicate with anyone anyway. After leaving the boat, he'd managed to infiltrate as far as the trailer where coconuts were being loaded for shipment to Katiyam. On the way, he'd seen the tea pickers flee away from the academy rather than toward it. Wall was glad for their sake. Away from the property, they lessened their risk of being taken hostage. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for some of the other workers. Across the driveway from where he was hiding, Wall saw two armed gunmen scanning the grounds, while a third led the fear-struck women away from the battered husks and herded them into a nearby storage building. Much as he wanted to intervene, Wall was forced to stay put. Behind him, he could hear the men who'd gone to investigate the fireworks. They were on their way back. Walther in hand, he crouched lower in his hiding place, shielding himself in shade cast by nearby palm trees. Soon the men were passing within a few yards of him. They were Mujahideen, all right. Wall could see it in their dress and appearance, hear it in the Kashmiri dialect with which they cursed themselves for having been duped by the fireworks. Wall wished he'd been more insistent on waiting for backup before making any move. Bolin had overruled him, concerned that if they waited, a sentry might spot the backup force and alert the Mujahideen, making their recon even more difficult. In any event, that was all in the past, Wall had his hands full dealing with the present. Eleven men, all armed, assembled briefly in front of the building where the women had been taken. The one in charge, a man wearing a white skull cap and a blue-green paratrooper's outfit, split the others into groups of two and sent them off in separate directions. 
No one was headed directly toward Najib Wall, but he could see that he would quickly be hemmed in from either side. If they found him, they wouldn't kill him, not if they could help it. He would be more valuable to them alive, not only as a hostage, but as a source of information. They would want to find out how their compound had been discovered. They would want to know how much the authorities knew of their plans and activities. If he refused to cooperate, they would no doubt resort to torture. He was prepared for that. He knew he could endure any measure of pain without giving in. But the Mujahideen would know that. They wouldn't waste their energies torturing him, not when they had women they could drag before him, threatening them with the worst kind of abuses if he didn't tell them what they wanted to know. Wall couldn't let that happen. He slowly raised his Walther and drew a bead on the man in the skullcap. He would kill their leader first, then charge from the brush, making himself an open target. With any luck, he would be able to take out a few others before the return fire ripped through him. Before he could pull the trigger, Wall was startled by a rustling overhead. He glanced up just as the Kashmiri sniper leaped from his hiding place. Wall managed an off-balance swipe with his left hand, but it merely glanced off the other man's shoulder. More irritated than immobilized, the Mujahideen shrugged off the blow and slammed the butt of his rifle against Wall's skull, turning his world dark. Three hundred yards uphill, Najib Wall's capture was witnessed by the two terrorists standing guard over his uncle, Zirat Wall, and his young charges. The two Kashmiris had gone to the window at the first outbreak of gunfire several minutes ago, and there they remained, dividing their attention between their prisoners and the drama unfolding on the grounds below. Listening intently to the men from across the room, Sirat was able to get some sense of what was going on. He had first welcomed the news that someone was attempting to reclaim the academy from the Mujahideen, but when he heard that one of the liberators had been captured, Sirat's blood ran cold. The man they described sounded like his nephew. Sirat didn't want to believe it, but he knew all too well that if there was a raid on the academy, Nashzib would more than likely be in on it. As he strained to hear more details, Sirat was interrupted by the youth with the bandaged ribs. The boy, who crouched nearby, had tears in his eyes. I smell smoke, Sirat Tashan. Are they going to burn the school down? Shh, no, the school will not burn down. You will stop them? Yes, they will be stopped. When? Soon. Sirat's gaze trailed to the wall where weapons hung next to the painting of him and his nephew. The guards hadn't concerned themselves with the weapons, figuring they were hanging too high on the wall for anyone to reach. Sirat knew better, however. He leaned close to the youth. Listen to me carefully. When the time does come, here is what you must do. Aleppi, Malabar Coast Jack Grimaldi stood at the railing of the wooden deck, where he'd earlier landed the Colwis 8A at the CIA river base in Aleppi. The pylons seemed to have recovered from the strain of supporting the chopper's weight. They wavered only faintly under the gentle force of the river's current. Famished, Grimaldi chewed on a protein bar with a consistency of heart attack, washing each bite down with swills of canned water. Both rations were compliments of the CIA, whose senior communications officer was presently inside trying to patch through a satellite call to the States so Grimaldi could apprise Stony Man Farm of his and Kissinger's skirmish upriver with the Mujahideen. A report had just come in that search teams had captured a handful of men suspected of abetting the terrorists, but security at the base remained heightened on the chance that other insurgents were still on the loose. Grimaldi had been advised not to stand out on the deck, where he posed an ideal target for snipers, but the Stony Man pilot had had his fill of sweating inside the service bay. Out here it was hot as well, but there was some measure of relief in the breeze blowing off the river. Presently, Grimaldi heard, carried in that same breeze, the now familiar deep roar of the agency's Mark V special operations craft. The SOC's pilot had radioed ahead announcing their approach, but no one at the outpost was about to let down his guard. Directly below the observation deck, a heavily armed four-man crew, two each from the CIA and Secret Service, pulled away from the docks in a combat rubber raiding raft propelled by twice the horsepower of the motorized rowboat Grimaldi and Kissinger had been stuck with earlier. Behind Grimaldi, armed sentries atop the service bay assumed firing positions with M4A1 carbines. The men had Grimaldi's sympathies, even with insulated foam mats to crouch on. 
He was sure they could still feel the heat radiating up from the metallic roof. One of the sentries signaled for Grimaldi to take cover. He pitched aside his rations and crouched behind the deck railing, drawing his grizzly automatic. Moments later, a long, sleek gray boat rounded the bend, prow high above the waterline. It was the same Mark V that had earlier hauled John Kissinger and the boatload of fireworks up to Katiyam. Acquired from the Navy SEALs after years of service in the Pacific, the SOC had twin aft gunnery posts flanking a slanted back ramp that dipped low enough in the water to allow direct boarding by powered CRRRs. Two of the latter craft were tethered to the ramp, and the officers who had used them in the search for the Mujahideen could be seen standing nearby, guns trained on a handful of swarthy-skinned men wearing tan track suits and white puggeries. As the boat eased its way into a mooring slip beneath the observation deck, an officer on board hailed Grimaldi. Our prisoners don't seem to be Mujahideen. They're locals from a camp up river. They had a pickup truck and tire tracks at the site indicate that they may have used it to pull a boat on a trailer out of the water. Maybe the boat that chased you two on the way to Aleppo. What about binoculars and some type of radio transmitter? Did you find anything like that? Both, as a matter of fact, why? I think someone was tracking me when I flew back from... Before he could finish, the base's communications officer, a lanky, blonde Californian whose nose was slathered white with the zinc oxide, strode out onto the deck carrying a Motorola LST-5C satellite radio. Trailing from the radio was an antenna cable that snaked all the way back inside the building. He held out the radio and its amplified two-way headset to Grimaldi. You're on. You can take it out here if you want. Thanks. Grimaldi took the equipment and fed out more of the antenna cable until he'd reached the far end of the deck. The headset alone would probably have been adequate for keeping the conversation private, but Grimaldi wasn't taking any chances. Flyboy 1 here. You've been busy, Flyboy. On the other end of the line was Barbara Price, mission controller at Stony Man Farm. She'd been a part of the program for nearly as long as Grimaldi, stepping in to fill the shoes of April Rose, who'd been killed in the same assault on the farm that had put Aaron Kurtzman in a wheelchair. Though she reported to Hal Brognola, Price had earned a high level of autonomy when it came to managing the farm's field teams. Grimaldi quickly apprised her of the recent events in Aleppo, including the capture of the alleged Mujahideen accomplices. I'm sure they have translators here. I was thinking I'd take first crack at interrogating them. Only if you can't get airborne pronto. They need me in Kadiam. I think so. We've lost ground communication with Stryker and Cowboy, but they're somewhere on the grounds of the Academy. Aaron just tapped into an Orion satellite view of Katayam, and there are two fires downhill from the school buildings. The bigger one's throwing up so much smoke we can't see past it. What about the tank troops? And these IB guys were supposed to be there for backup. The 73rd is halfway across Vembanad Lake, and the IB's chopper is just taking on fuel now. In other words, Stryker and Cowboy are up Shit Creek without any paddles. That's one way of putting it. I'm on my way. Don't take that helicopter up until it's ready. Do you hear me, Flyboy? Grimaldi reached into his pocket for the wrapper to his protein bar. He held the headset out at arm's length and crinkled the wrapper close to the microphone. Well, what's that? Uh, you're breaking up. Uh... I know what you're doing, and I don't think... Grimaldi clicked off the radio and took it back inside the service bay, handing it to the communications officer. Without breaking stride, he hurried across the floor to the helicopter. The mechanic was kneeling on the roof of the chopper, tightening down the replacement rotor assembly. Hey, perfect timing. I just... Is this sucker fueled up? Yes, but... Off! The mechanic climbed down off the chopper. The two men crossed paths as the pilot was strapping himself into his seat. Listen, until the new assembly wears in, you've got to take things slow and easy, got it? Slow and easy, yeah, right. What are you doing? You can't take off in here. You need to wait for a tow out... I'm in a hurry. Clear the runway. The mechanic continued to protest, as did several of the agents who suddenly found their paperwork swirling about the enclosure, thanks to the chopper's rotor wash. The service bay had a raised ceiling, but Grimaldi still had barely enough clearance to get the chopper aloft without clipping the exposed ductwork for the air conditioner. The mechanic rushed in front of the open bay doors leading out to the observation deck and tried to block the way, but Grimaldi throttled the bird forward and sent the man diving to the floor. He swooped out through the opening and quickly pitched upward, 
narrowly avoiding the deck railing and the nearest treetops. As he took the chopper higher, Grimaldi saw funnels of black smoke rising in the distance like idling tornadoes. Katiyam was less than 10 miles away. If he pushed the chopper for all it was worth, he could reach the academy ahead of the others and hopefully find out what kind of trouble Bolin and Kissinger had gotten themselves into. Slow and easy is going to have to wait for another day. Grimaldi opened the throttle and headed toward the billowing smoke. Krula Pass, Western Ghats. The sight of smoke rising from the grounds of the academy filled Derry Neshaw with a sense of urgency. The base has been discovered. This is a problem. He was still seated in the back seat of the Honda Accord, which Pengat Shili had parked on the shoulder of a two-lane mountain road leading up through Krula Pass. Briley, as the woman was known, was outside the car, standing on the far side of the guardrail, staring through binoculars out at the valley floor below. Even from their perspective, Nesha and Shili could see the winding dirt road the Mujahideen had used the previous night when they had come down from the mountains to take over the academy. Shili had hoped to take the same road back, but as Nesha had just suggested, that plan no longer seemed viable. Up in the front seat, Shili cursed and slammed his handheld ANPRC 119 radio against the dashboard, then tried again without success to establish communication with his brother Bargadrum at the academy. Perhaps we're beyond range. No, we should be close enough. And I know the battery still has power. Then maybe it's broken from rough handling. Shili glanced over his shoulder at Nesha. I've seen you try to fix radios the same way, Derry. With the same results. Before Shili could respond, they heard the sound of another car heading downhill toward them. Both men fell silent and drew their weapons as they dropped low in their seats. They could hear the other car slowing to a stop less than a dozen yards away. Can I be of assistance? Just admiring the view. It is quite a view. Shili and Nesha tensed. If the man pulled over and got out of his car to engage Briley in further conversation, he would be likely to spot them in which case he would have to be killed. Neither man wanted it to come to that. This high up in the mountains, the sound of gunshots, or even a struggle, however brief, would likely echo through the pass, drawing suspicion their way. Briley had to have had the same concern, because the men heard her step over the railing and stride past the Honda to the other car. She lowered her voice, and neither Nesha or Shili could hear what was being said between her and the other driver. <laughs> Finally, Nesha heard the sound of laughter, Briley's, and then the other car shifted back into gear and headed past, continuing downhill toward Katiyam. Only then did the two Kashmiris relax their grips on their automatics. Briley came over and let herself into the back seat. A tour pilot. He has a plane at that private airfield we passed a few minutes ago. Nesha watched the woman refasten the top buttons of her blouse. How did you get rid of him, as if I didn't know? He said if I liked the view from here, I'd love it more from the air. He's getting the plane ready. He'll be disappointed when you don't show up. When I don't show up, he'll find himself another passenger. I know his type. And he yours, too, I'm sure. Briley shot Sheely an angry glance, then set the binoculars aside and turned to Nesha. <sighs> there are two fires on the grounds. A small one by the dikes and a larger one near a building just uphill from the farmland. The distillery. Nesha and Shili exchanged a look. The distillery was the last place the Mujahideen wanted to have targeted. This wasn't a good sign. Could you see any forces on the ground, ours or theirs? No, but with all the smoke it was hard to see much of anything. It has to be a raid. There's no other explanation. I did see something else. A few miles beyond the academy, a large lake. Vembanad, what about it? There were some kind of boats on it heading this way in formation. How many? Ten, a dozen. They're low boats, almost like barges, and they're carrying vehicles of some sort, maybe tanks. Sheely leaned over the seat and grabbed the binoculars. I need to see. We agreed it was safer for her to be the one I know what I said, but I need to see for myself. Sheely got out of the car and went to the railing. Nesha stared at him coldly. Insolent. Just like his brother. It's just stress, Derry. Don't take it personally. He's lucky he's more useful to me than Ragabir. Briley reached out and ran her fingers through Nesha's hair. You still have your migraine. I'm fine. 
then you're jealous of the pilot. Men will stop wanting you the day Ganesh grows wings. I have accepted that. Dairy the philosopher. Briley kissed Nasha lightly, then glanced out the window at the other Kashmiri. Pengat is the jealous one. I think he would like it if you shared me with him. Pengat does not understand how valuable you are to us, that is all. That plus he is upset by all that has gone wrong since we came from Katiam. For that I can't blame him. Things have been going wrong, unlike our other stops. Sheely got back in the front seat and tossed the binoculars angrily onto the seat beside him. They are tanks, all right, a whole regiment. They are also helicopters, at least two of them. One is a transport, Boeing or Sikorsky. A special forces team, no doubt. Sheely tried once more to make contact with the academy, but again he couldn't raise a signal on the radio. His frustration was rising. Vargadrum, answer me! Nesha ignored Sheely's tantrum and stared out the window. He didn't need to hear from Vargadrum to know that returning to the academy was no longer advisable. True, they could take the dirt road down and help the others make a stand, but to what end? His followers might draw inspiration from his return, but given the force massing against them, there was no way they could make a stand and survive. It would be suicide, and though martyrdom had its merits, Nesha felt he could better serve the Mujahideen cause alive, and the cause came first. Bengad, there is nothing we can do here. We must leave things in Vargadrum's hands and move on. Vargadrum is not equipped to leave. We both know that. Maybe he will prove us wrong. Nesha pointed northward toward the higher reaches of Krula Pass. Let's go. We'll see to the other launcher. Sheely stared back out the window at the columns of smoke. He weighed Nesha's words, then closed his eyes briefly and moved his lips. Whether he was praying or saying farewell to his brother, Nesha couldn't be sure. Then, opening his eyes, Sheely started up the Honda and pulled back onto the road. It is more than 700 miles to Maharashtra. On these roads it could take days, too long if we want to reach the other launcher in time. There is a train in Munar. If it's like any of the others, it stops in every town. It could wind up even longer than driving. What if we flew? Sheely stared coldly at the woman in the rearview mirror. Our arms would be quite tired, I should think. Thank God. Briley smiled stiffly back at the other man. I meant my friend the pilot. I'd bet you anything his plane seats four. Academy of Arts in the Ghats. Standing in front of the building where the women farm workers were being held captive, Varga Drumshili stared down at the man who'd been hauled out of the nearby brush by Babu Suka, the sniper who'd leaped down on him from the coconut palm. Najzib Wall, still unconscious, lay sprawled in the dirt, blood trickling from his scalp. He looks like one of the boys up in the Kulari Puryatu Hall. Am I supposed to believe he's the one responsible for all these fires? He was lurking in the brush with a gun. He must have had something to do with it. You're saying we're under attack by children? Is that it? He's at least as old as you, and he was about to shoot you when I stopped him. The men faced off, Shili glaring at the other's impertinence. Suka refusing to look away. Their standoff was interrupted by some of the other men who were venturing back from the brush, having heard of the prisoner's capture. Sheely looked away from Suka. What are you doing? Get back out there and find the rest of them. What about the fire? What about it? It'll draw attention here, and shouldn't we try and put it out? Attention has already been drawn here, can't you see that? What do you think we're dealing with? Tourists who like to play with matches? Shilu took out his exasperation on Najib Wall, kicking him. Though still unconscious, the Indian instinctively recoiled from the blow. Looking up, Shili saw the others eyeing him warily. He took a deep breath and tried to collect himself. He needed to be a leader, he told himself. He needed to be decisive, in control. Think. What would Derry do? Ragabir? Pengat? While Shili contemplated, Babu Sukha was quick to offer an opinion. I think we should reinforce security around the perimeter. Once we have taken out all the enemies on the grounds, then we can worry about any others who might be on their way. In hopes of appearing decisive, he smacked a fist into his open palm, the way Nesha often did. Then we can put out the fires. Not before. Now go! After a moment's hesitation, the other men began to disperse. Suka stayed put. He gestured at Najib Wall. What about him? Tie him up with the women. I'll question him when he comes to. 
Shili took hold of Wall's ankles while Suka grabbed him under the arms. Raising him off the ground, they were guiding him through the doorway when Shili's radio transceiver bleeped. Again? Shili let go of the prisoner and Suka hauled him the rest of the way across the floor. Stepping back outside, Shili yanked the radio from his waist. He was about to switch on the receive button when he stopped himself. Several times in the past few minutes, he'd been signaled about an incoming call, and in each instance, he'd been quick to respond, hoping it would be Pengat or Ragabir, saying they'd freed Nesha and were on their way back. Each time, however, he'd been unable to hear anything but static. Now he was concerned that it wasn't his brothers, but rather someone connected with the intruders. Perhaps they were queuing on his frequency and using it to pinpoint his position. Could they do that? He didn't know. But if that's what was happening, then continuing to activate the radio would be like putting a target on his chest. He heard the signal again. His heart raced as he stared at the transceiver. The signal seemed to be coming in clearer now. Or was it? Was it only clearer because he was holding it in front of his face? No. No, he decided. It was definitely clearer. It had to be Nesha and his brothers. It had to be. Fumbling with the controls, Shili quickly identified himself and waited to hear familiar voices. It turned out he'd been mistaken on both counts. The call was from the sentry in the observation tower. He had important news, he said. As Shili listened, both the anger and color drained from his face. He signed off and slowly lowered the radio, almost letting it drop from his hand. This couldn't be happening. It couldn't. Suka returned. What is it? A tank regiment is on its way. A tank regiment, along with foot soldiers and helicopters. They'll be here any minute. We need to take the offensive. We have missiles, a launcher. I say we use them. Shili shook his head with resignation. The missiles offer limited targets, planes, bunkers. We could maybe take out a few tanks or one of the helicopters with them, but a whole regiment? Strike them with a few missiles and we might be able to turn them back. Then we can reload and strike again. If we strike them with a few missiles, they won't turn back. They'll retaliate. And maybe the missiles aren't as powerful as ours, but they have far more of them. If a full regiment of tanks fires at us, it will be like a monsoon. There will be no hiding. He glanced past Suka, staring into the building at Najib Wall and the captive women. A plan was beginning to formulate in his mind. Hide! We have not come this far to hide from our enemies. Saku, wait. I have a plan. What if we just show them that we have missiles? What if we show them and threaten to use them unless they back away? The sniper stared sullenly at Shili. Threats! We went to all the trouble of acquiring missiles and launchers so we could make threats! What do you suggest? We can aim them at Kateyam, the heart of the city. It's still rush hour. There will be tens of thousands of people in the streets. No! We will not give them reason to annihilate us! This is a time to be strong, not to be cautious. If Terry was here, he would say- Terry is not here. I am in charge. I make the decisions. Is that understood? Suka was about to say something, but held himself in check. Forgive me, Vagardram. Tell me what you would have me do. Though suspicious of Suka's sudden change of heart, Shili felt there was nothing to be gained by further argument. We need to haul the launcher out into the open where they will see it. The same with the women and children. Let them know we have hostages as well as the missiles and we can negotiate from a position of strength. We can demand free passage back to Kashmir. An excellent plan. But some of the hostages should be taken to the launcher, so no one will be tempted to fire it. I already thought of that. Shili handed Suka his walkie-talkie. Have the launcher brought out into the open. I will bring down some of the children. We'll strap them to the framework. Suka held the walkie-talkie and watched Shili head for the winding path that led uphill to the Academy Kerala's. He wants us to hide behind children and butter for a chance to whimper back to Kashmir with our tails between our legs. That, rather than fight... Drawing the walkie-talkie to his lips, he made contact with the building where the saber launcher was being kept. This is Babu Suka. I have orders directly from Vagadrum Shili. Prepare the missile for firing. I'll give you the signal. All of the holding vats, beakers, pipes, tubes, and burners used to make toddy from the Academy's coconut sap took up less than a quarter of the large building in which the still was housed. Normally, the rest of the distillery was used for storing the liquor in large kegs for sale to distributors who would bottle the drink at their own expense 
before peddling it in Katiyam and other cities throughout the southern half of Kerala. Some consider the distillery an ignoble enterprise, particularly for an academy so well known for promoting enrichment through the arts. But, as the absentee proprietors of the school were fond of saying, fundraising, like politics, sometimes makes for strange bedfellows. And when one considered that toddy sales brought the academy more revenue than charitable donations and all other crop sales combined, it wasn't surprising that a relatively blind eye was turned to the undertaking, not to mention the often unsavory clientele known to pull up to the back gate in the dead of night. Bribes would exchange hands, and the vehicles would be waved through, usually pulling directly into the distillery so that they could load their cargo more discreetly. That afternoon, however, the guards at the rear gate were dead at their posts, throats slit, bloated, clenched in rigor mortis after lying unattended all day. The distillery was the domain not of bootleggers, but the Mujahideen. Several kegs of toddy had found their way down the insurgents' thirsty gullets, but the building had been taken over for more tactical reasons. It was ideally suited for the concealment of their trump card, the weapon they hoped would elevate them from the ranks of what India's prime minister had called bothersome gnats in need of a good swatting. Parked inside the distillery, next to a makeshift loading dock, was one of two Sabre short-range missile launchers recently hijacked from a military train convoy in the Western Ghats. Still hitched to the primer gray Hummer that had hauled it down from the mountains, the Sabre featured a droid-like swivel-mounted control console and streamlined firing racks, cradling finned missiles that gleamed like so many flying fish about to leap from their tank. These fish, however, took to the air packed with modified WGU 12BB guidance control units and 25-pound MK-84 warheads. Seven men were gathered around the launcher, three armed with Russian-made DSHK 108 millimeter machine guns were posted at each window and doorway of the building, peering out in hopes of glimpsing the enemy that had set fire first to the palm fronds in front of the distillery where the bodies of the toddy bottlers had been heaved after their summary executions, then to the distillery roof itself. Another two Kashmiris scrambled about frantically with brooms and foam-spewing extinguishers, attacking the fiery bits of thatch that dropped from the roof like a steady rainfall. They looked almost comical, like clowns performing a skit. However, given that an unchecked fire could very well ignite the stored liquor, or worse yet, one of the large wooden crates containing still more of the surface-to-air missiles, the men went about their task with grave, humorless determination. The remaining two men were huddled over the control console, doing their best to carry out the orders just handed down to them by Babu Sukha. The youngest, Kadis Road Vakadi, meticulously carried out a pre-launch check following instructions jotted down by the other man, Govan Krishna Vunat, who squinted through his bifocals at the inner workings of the Sabre's computer guidance system. The system had sustained damage during the hijacking, and since Neshaw hadn't been able to get his hands on the necessary replacement parts, it was Vinat's thankless task to repair the motherboard and other components as best he could in hopes the launcher could be made operational. If there was one member of the Mujahideen closer to the breaking point than Bargadram Shili, it was Govan Krishna Vinat. A balding, soft-spoken man in his late fifties, Banat was a former employee at British Aerospace, makers of the Rapier missile, the model for the Sabre. Three months before, in a London pub, one of Pengat Shili's contacts had overheard Banat complaining he'd resigned from his job to protest the number of times he'd been passed over for promotions because, he claimed, of his ethnicity. Pengat and Derinesha were just then beginning to concoct plans to hijack a military train carrying warheads and launchers, and Banat was an ideal recruit to the Mujahideen cause. As it turned out, Banat's missile expertise was available at a very reasonable price, a vintage Aston Martin convertible, and the sexual favors of a high-priced call girl working out of a penthouse suite two blocks from Trafalgar Square. The sports car was presently garaged back in London, but the woman, a statuesque redhead was being put up in local first-class hotels rather than the string of derelict safe houses Derinesha invariably preferred for his men. 
Banat was infatuated with the woman. She made him feel young and virile. Though he knew there were undoubtedly other men in her life, when she was with him, it was as if there were no one on earth but the two of them. Whatever his problems, they would be left at the foot of the bed, along with his clothes, and the woman would take him to another place where he was like a god and she worshipped him. Her name was Briley. Much as he knew the importance of his assignment and the dangers he faced now that the launch compound was under siege, Banat found it difficult to focus on the matter at hand. One would have thought that his distracted state was due to fear or a sense of urgency, but that was not the case. The Mujahideen allowed him only one rendezvous with Briley for each city they traveled through, and this was supposed to be his appointed night in Katyam. Banat couldn't so much as brush his fingers against a circuit board without imagining what it would be like to stroke Briley's soft, smooth skin and drink in the heady aroma of her perfume. And despite all the loud commotion taking place around him, all Vanat could hear in his mind was the way Briley reached between his legs to take hold of him. God, he couldn't wait to see her. Vanat? The older man turned and saw Rockley Kode eyeing him with concern. Uh, yes? The countdown. Are we ready? Just then, a glowing ember fell down from the ceiling, glancing off his arm to the floor. As Vanat stared at the charcoal-like smear on his shirt sleeve, it was as if the reality of his situation had finally dawned on him. He wouldn't be seeing Briley again. Not tonight. Not ever. They were under attack, trapped in this oversized box like fish in a barrel. How soon before another incendiary charge came hurtling into their midst? And this time, there would be no roof to take the brunt of the detonation. The fireball would erupt inside the distillery, and it would be all over, just like that. Flames, explosion, gunfire... One way or another, he realized he was about to die here within these cinder block walls, and soon, had he lost his mind completely? Is the guidance system fixed? No, uh, there was too much damage. If Gary had been able to return with a new motherboard with more equipment, then maybe... This is no time for speculation! We have our orders! When the call comes, we must fire at least one of the missiles! I need to know if we can pick out a target and have any chances of hitting it! Fanat shook his head. Words spilled from his lips almost as if he had no control over them. He found himself trying to recall a nursery rhyme from his childhood in the English boarding schools. I shot an arrow into the air. Where it lands, I do not care. No, no, that can't be right. <laughs> I, I, I shot an arrow in the air. Where it lands, I know not where. No, that's not it either. Rodby Kode grabbed the knot by the shirt and began to shake him furiously. What is the matter with you? Why can't you give me a simple answer? Uh, a simple answer. Banat took hold of the younger man's hands and pried them away. If the guidance system is not working, the missile will go up, then come down. Where? Who can say? Maybe in the sea, maybe on land. If we're lucky, it will strike a city and kill many Indians. And we can pretend we meant that to be our target so that our enemies will be afraid. You and I will be heroes to the Mujahideen. Our enemies will speak of us with awe, the same way they speak of the Kashmir Shredder. <laughs> Bollywood will turn out a movie where you and I will be played by handsome movie stars. There! Is that simple enough for you? By now, several of the other terrorists had stopped what they were doing and were staring at Banat. He stared back at them, tears streaming from his eyes. <laughs> Butchers! With his little knife, Derry is the shredder. He stabs deep, then shreds his victim's organs to ensure death. <laughs> but us, we have missiles! Missiles! We stab our targets, and shrapnel does the shredding for us. Chop, chop, chop. We'll cut up our enemies, just like butchers. How glorious! <laughs> Enough! One of the men fighting the flames inside the distillery lashed out with his fire extinguisher. He's like a mad dog. The man who'd felled Vanat cast aside his fire extinguisher and drew a 9 millimeter Makarov semi-automatic pistol from his holster. He pointed the gun at the old man's head. He needs to be put out of his misery. No! He has been overworked. That's all. He will be okay. Overworked? Oversexed is more like it. That American whore fucked his brains out, and now there is nothing left between his ears. <laughs> the laughter was uneasy, and when the last few embers wafted down from what was left of the roof, the men were startled into silence. Looking up through the charred hole, they could see the sky, boiling over with dark smoke. It looked apocalyptic, like the end of the world. 
Rodvik Kode reached for the walkie-talkie. This is Babu Suka. I have orders directly from Varga to Ramshili. Prepare the missile for firing. I'll give you the signal. Rodvik Kode quickly listened, then switched off the communicator and set it aside. All eyes were on him now. Grim. Resigned. It is time. Make ready to fire the missiles. Krula Pass Airfield, Western Ghats. While his vintage Balsa Twin Gurkha warmed up at the edge of the tarmac, Dayu Murad hurried about the cabin, making certain everything was presentable. It was a quick task. The plane had been an unflyable junk heap left to him by a distant uncle in Bhopal, but he'd painstakingly restored it over the past 13 months. Now the craft was nearly as immaculate as it had been when it first rolled off the production line more than 30 years ago. Murad also had an older Gurkha that he kept as a backup plane and a source of parts. A notable exception to Murad's desire for authenticity in the twin balsa was the rear seating arrangement. The original Gurkha had seated six, with two pairs of bucket seats located in rows directly behind the cockpit. Murad had taken out the seats and replaced them with a wet bar, mini fridge, and a single well-padded bench seat, the back of which could be lowered a full 90 degrees creating, in effect, a bed, well suited for overnight layovers. Or, as was more often the case, idyllic love-making trysts in remote pastures or atop isolated plateaus. Though he had business cards stating he was owner of Krula Pass Air Tours, Murad was independently wealthy, thanks to the same uncle that had left him the Gurkha. As such, he rarely bothered to advertise his services, and the only clientele he actively sought out were attractive single women, deemed a worthy challenge for the self-proclaimed Casanova of Katyam. The redhead Murad had chanced upon while driving to the airfield was just such a prospect, and Murad hummed gaily to himself with anticipation as he readied the rear compartment of the plane. It was months since he'd had an American woman, and he was sure he'd have her. After all, hadn't she looked him in the eye and told him that she'd come to India to work on her Kama Sutra? Well, he'd show her a position or two all right. Another way Murad had strayed from authenticity while refurbishing the plane was installing a sound system. He'd rewired the cabin to accommodate six speakers as part of a $7,000 stereo system, complete with a digital remote control that could quickly queue up any of 50 different compilations he'd put together to suit a range of musical tastes. He took this woman, the American, for a jazz lover. He hoped she would want to do it to some Charlie Parker or Miles Davis, but if need be, he was prepared as well to ply her with anything from Kenny G to John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Ah, and there she was. Murad was puzzled to see her walking through the main gateway instead of driving, but the important thing was that she'd come. Murad clambered down from his plane and walked past the older Gurkha parked outside his hangar. He caught up with the woman on the tarmac. Where is your car? Back up the road. I got back in to drive it here and the engine was dead. Strange. I'll deal with it later. They started to walk toward his prized Gurkha. I'm glad you decided to come. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for inviting me. Not at all. It's a perfect time of day, too. One hasn't lived until they've seen the sunset on the Lakhadiv Sea. He helped the woman up into the plane, gauging her reaction when she eyed the rear cabin. This looks wonderful. It's like you have your own little suite on wings. Quite. In fact, I happen to have some provisions in the fridge. Some champagne, cheeses, fresh fruit. There is a plateau I know near the coast. If you'd like, we could sit down there and take our time enjoying the sunset. The woman fastened herself into the passenger seat. Oh, I'd love it. Oh, I knew this was going to be my lucky day. I just knew it. I feel the same. This was one of those times Murad wished he'd partnered up with another pilot so he could turn the controls over and focus himself entirely on hospitality. Here, after all, was a woman who, if she hadn't already done so, would definitely jump at the opportunity to join the Mile High Club. Alas, such pleasures would have to wait. Murad gave the controls a quick once-over in preparation for takeoff. Now then. On the way to our plateau, I can take several routes, depending on which sites most interest you. First, of course, there are the old churches that date back to medieval times. The pilot's voice trailed off. Out of the corner of his eye, he'd seen the woman reach into her purse 
and assumed she was taking out a compact. When he turned to her, however, he saw she was holding a derringer. Our first stop will be just off to the right. You can stay on the tarmac, but get as close as you can to the trees. I don't understand. We have some friends to pick up, and they aren't particularly patient. So I suggest you quit stalling and get a move on. It took Murad a moment to regain his composure, but finally he turned the key and pushed the starter button. Murad taxied the Gurkha along the runway. This late in the day, there were only a couple of other planes still out on the field, and both were untended, parked before a larger shared-use hangar on the far side of the runway. The hangar had windows, but Murad doubted anyone was looking out. For all intents and purposes, he and the woman might as well have been alone. Only a few moments ago, he would have relished such an arrangement. Now he was filled with fear and uncertainty. What had he gotten himself into? As they neared the trees, a grove of hardy, close-grown acacias, Murad saw two men crouched behind the one with the widest trunk. Their faces were obscured in shadow, but he had a feeling that neither of them was American. One thing he could see for certain, they were both armed. Closer. If someone spots them and there is trouble, you will be the first to die. Do you understand? Murad nodded. Rather than veer sharply off the runway, he took a wide turn and eased off the tarmac into the hard-packed earth of the airfield, which had been chiseled out of the side of a gently sloping range. He left the engines running. The other two men dashed from cover and quickly climbed up onto the wing of the Gurkha. The woman motioned for Murad to stay put while she opened the door. Gentlemen, meet my good friends, Dion! Nesha and Pengat Shili climbed into the cabin. Murad shuddered and glanced away from the men. It was already too late, however. They knew he had gotten a good look at them, and the fact that the woman made a point of making introductions only underscored the grim realization he had to face. These were wanted men, and he had seen their faces. Once he had fulfilled his usefulness to them, they would kill him. He knew it as surely as he was breathing. You have a nice plane here. The older of the two men slumped casually onto the bench seat. The other man had already opened the mini-fridge and taken out a bottle of carbonated mineral water. When he opened it, water spritzed out of the bottle and onto the floor. Normally, Murad would have been frantic about the likelihood of stains on the restored carpet. He realized that he no longer cared much about spilled water. He couldn't stop thinking about spilled blood. Derry Neshaw waved his gun at the playboy. Take us up. I see from the controls that you have a full tank of gas. That should be enough to get us to Maharashtra, yes? Academy of Arts in the Ghats When he heard the guards say that Varga Dramshili was on his way up the hill, Zirat Wall figured the time had come. All he needed was an opportunity. Unfortunately, with Shili headed their way, the guards stepped back from the window, not wanting it to appear as if they were being derelict in their duties. Before they could assume their positions on either side of the prisoners, however, they heard a droning sound in the air outside the hall. Together they returned to the window and stared out through the drifting smoke. One of them pointed, shouting to the other that helicopters were headed toward the academy. The moment the guards turned their backs to him again, Wall rose to a crouch, took a deep breath, then bolted forward. After two running steps, he leaped to the top of the stone staircase leading up to the main doorway. He knew that the door was locked from the inside, but he wasn't thinking about escape. Instead, the moment he landed upon the top step, he coiled his legs again, then once more sprang upward and outward. High, sustained vertical leaps, much akin to what American basketball players referred to as hang time, were a trademark for practitioners of Kalari Paratu, and Wall was no exception. While suspended in midair, he reached to the wall and, in one swift motion, unmounted both a half-sword and shield, when he landed, he was ready to use both. Detecting motion behind them, both guards turned from the window. With deadly accuracy, Wall had thrown the shield, discus style, striking the guard across the bridge of the nose with so much force that it almost embedded itself. The other guard was raising his assault rifle into firing position when Wall let fly again, this time with the half-sword. The guard stared down in shock at the sword embedded in his chest, he grabbed at the weapon, tried to pull it free, and pitched forward. Dead. Several of the younger boys were about to cry out when the older youths, prompted by the boy with the bandaged ribs, covered their mouths, then whispered for them to be quiet.
Trembling, the students watched Wall pull the sword from the second guard's chest and without hesitation plunge its blade through the heart of the man who'd been blinded by the hurled shield. Once he'd reclaimed his keys and the bloodied shield, Wall motioned for the two older youths to pick up the assault rifles. Do you know how to use them? Each of the youths nodded solemnly. Good. Wall led the youths to the top of the stairs, then unlocked the doors. You are to stay here and watch over your fellow students. If someone comes through that door without identifying himself first, you know what you must do. Rifles clenched tightly in their small hands. Again, the youths nodded. Before heading out the door, Wall picked up the sets of small sticks Varga Dramshili had tried to goad him with earlier. He tucked them inside the waistband of his dhoti, then stared out at his youthful charges. For a time, I must ask you all to be men, not boys. Always remember, fear, however strong, can always be tamed by valor. With that, he turned and left the room. It took two attempts and nearly twenty agonizing minutes for John Kissinger to muscle his way up the slime-lined walls of the well, but finally he made it to a point where Mac Bolin could reach down and help pull him up the rest of the way. The armorer was a mess. The two separate balls had left him splattered with foul-smelling stagnant well water, and at least half a dozen finger-sized leeches had attached themselves to his hands, arms, and face. He pried one off his cheek, leaving a trail of blood. Ugh. I think I'll pass on the thank you hug. While Kissinger caught his breath, Bolin surveyed the nearby distillery. The fire on the roof had burned itself out, but the palm fronds on the other side of the building were still ablaze. The smoke that continued to fill the air was every bit as dense as before, but now it began to carry a foul, pervasive stench, nothing like the earlier scent of brewing toddy. Both men cringed, recognizing the smell. Flash! Somebody's on fire! I'll circle around and check. Careful. You ask me, the only reason those bastards are still inside the building is because they think help's on the way. Those snipers have got to be out of the trees by now. I'll be looking for them, don't worry. If it's all clear, once I'm back out front, I say we flush these guys out of the building. Fine by me, but I wouldn't count on the DHL. Kissinger unslung his waterlogged backpack and pulled out the incendiary launcher. Water dripped from the casing, and leeches were crawling into the firing tubes. I'll handle that. Give me two minutes, then be ready to fire. Kissinger nodded and grabbed his colt and his walkie-talkie, both of which he'd managed to drop in the grass before plunging into the well. Bolin crept into the tea plants and began circling his way back to the knoll. He stopped briefly once and was able to see the front of the distillery. At the base of the bonfire, he saw the charred outlines of two bodies being consumed by flame. They were already burned beyond recognition but Bolin doubted any of the Mujahideen would have rushed out of the distillery only to throw themselves into the bonfire. More likely the victims were innocent bystanders, killed when the terrorists had stormed the grounds. Bolin was about to move on when he suddenly froze, then slowly dropped to a crouch. Less than 20 yards away, he saw steady movement in the brush. Someone, or maybe more than one, was headed his way. Bolin switched his gun to his left hand. With his right, he reached down and gently unsheathed the Russell Backwoods knife strapped to his boot. The Russell was an all-purpose instrument with a thick serrated blade, strong enough to be used as anything from a saw to a crowbar. At the moment, all Bolin cared about was its efficacy as a weapon of self-defense. The density of the tea plants worked for and against the executioner, giving him good cover, but also making it difficult for him to get a good look at his opponent. All he could do was stay put and wait for the enemy to come to him. Soon his patience was rewarded. A figure slowly materialized before him, taking shape with each step forward, each branch of tea leaves brushed aside. Bolin finally saw that it was a short Kashmiri, wearing a toddy tapper's weathered dhoti, but carrying a submachine gun. After each step he took, the man stopped and looked about, occasionally leaning forward to take a closer look at one of the tea plants. He was clearly following the path, however faint, Bolin had forged while circling to the rear of the distillery. Since the executioner had been following the same path back, he knew it would likely be only a matter of seconds before the two men came face to face. Once he determined that the other man was alone, Bolin tightened his grip on the knife and held it out before him, then crouched still lower in the brush. As the other man drew closer, the soldier could make out his features, 
hardened, attentive, eyes filled with concentration. Now he was only 10 yards away. 9. 8. The man took one more step forward, then stopped. He glanced away from Bolin, but the executioner knew it was only a ploy. He was sure he'd been spotted, and that the other man was just trying to catch him off guard. It wasn't to be. The moment the terrorist began to whirl, sweeping the submachine gun before him, finger on the trigger, Boland dived forward as if being shot from a cannon. Tea leaves slapped at his face, forcing him to involuntarily close his eyes. He timed his move perfectly, however. Not only did he knock the submachine gun from the other man's hand, but he also plunged the knife blade deep into the man's chest with so much force that the Kashmiri staggered, losing his balance. He fell backward, Bolin on top of him. The executioner let go of the knife and cupped his hand over the Kashmiri's mouth, muffling his cry for help. Blood seeped through Bolin's fingers. Even with his dying breath, the man's expression was less one of surprise than driven malice. The kill had been quiet enough, but Bolin stayed put a few moments nonetheless, senses alert for signs of any other Kashmiris in the brush. Above the fiery snapping of the palm fronds, he could hear activity inside the distillery and, far off in the distance, the faint drone of at least one approaching helicopter. Grimaldi, Bolin figured. Bolin proceeded with slow caution, taking the dead man's MP5 with him. He made it back to the knoll without encountering any other enemy forces, but he knew they had to be around somewhere, closing in. He and Kissinger couldn't afford to wait any longer to make their move. Keeping one eye on the distillery, Bolin quickly unslung his backpack. Along with more ammunition for his Desert Eagle, he had packed an Ingram Mac-10 and three Ben Berg 327 stun grenades. He slipped his gun back in his shoulder holster and carefully removed the grenades, setting them side by side in the grass, pins facing upward. Bolin was no more than 50 yards from the distillery, well within lobbing range. In quick succession, he rose from a crouch and heaved the first two grenades. The first detonated just to the right of the bonfire, doing little more than jostling the bodies. His second toss just missed the front window of the distillery and wasted itself on the cinder block exterior of the building. Bolin grabbed the third grenade, intent on tossing it as far as the distillery roof in hopes it would drop through one of the openings made by the DHL. Before he could make his lob, however, the Callwis 8A suddenly swooped into view, dropping below the smoke screen. Grimaldi banked the chopper sharply to his right, then rose up and hovered directly above the distillery. Gunfire erupted inside the building, and bullets began to plow into the chopper. Grimaldi stayed put, however. Moments later, he was on the transceiver to Poland. Don't throw that grenade! Repeat, do not throw your grenade! Why not? They've got a launcher in there! Suckers loaded, too! Four missiles, ready to fire! That's four! Lob a grenade in there, and this place turns into a jigsaw puzzle! Damn! My sentiments exactly! I'm blocking their line of fire now, but I don't know how long I can keep it up. They're chewing the hell out of my chassis. Bolin stared out and saw bullets spark off the helicopter's landing skids. He didn't even want to think about what it would look like if, instead of 9mm slugs, a surface-to-air missile were to come charging out of the chopper. He was pondering their next move when Grimaldi came back on the squawk box. Hey, I just heard from Kissinger. He thinks if I pull up a little higher, my rotor wash will push down enough smoke to foul up their game plan. What do you think? Like a chess player, Bolin thought through the possible consequences of such a move, looking for a way to throw the advantage back in their favor. An idea came to him. Look, I don't know how well you can jockey that smoke around, but if you can put a lid over the distillery and have some left over to spread out our way for cover, Cowboy and I can rush the place and try to shut them down. Sounds risky. I'll take risky over sitting by and waiting on their lead. And like you say, you can't hang up there much longer. Good point. What the hell? Let's go for it. Moments after Grimaldi signed off, the helicopter again pitched to one side, then lifted up, disappearing a moment inside the overhead smoke. Within seconds, the smoke began to drift downward like some biblical plague cloud enveloping the distillery as well as the building's perimeter. Bola knew the effect was only temporary, however, as the same rotor wash directing the smoke's flow would eventually help dissipate it. He quickly keyed Kissinger's frequency. Stand by. Ready when you are. Bolin tossed the transceiver aside and snatched up the fully loaded Ingram Mac-10. Along with his Desert Eagle, that gave him more than 40 rounds. Add that to the dozen Kissinger would be bringing to the dance, provided he'd reloaded, and it seemed they stood a good chance of pulling this off. At any rate, they were about to find out. Four, three, 
two, one, go! Bolin broke from cover and charged into the low-hanging cloud of smoke. As he passed the burning fronds and the charred bodies, the air grew thick with the smell of death. It was as if the Grim Reaper himself were close at hand, breathing down Bolin's neck. Academy of Arts and the Gods As he stormed the rear of the distillery, John Kissinger had to make a quick decision. Obviously, the fastest way inside the building was through the back door. Even if it was locked, he felt he could jar it open with one of the full four shoulder slams he'd perfected years ago during drug raids with the DEA. Such a slam was likely to throw him briefly off balance, however, and if there were gunmen poised on the other side of the door, even a split second of vulnerability could prove fatal. That left one other option. Propped against the back wall of the distillery were stacks of wooden skids, three layers high, holding empty kegs and barrels. When he reached them, Kissinger began climbing upward, choking on the smoke as he sought out foot and handholds as if scaling a mountain peak. This mountain was far from stable, however. Stacked unevenly, the skids groaned and wobbled each time Kissinger moved, threatening to collapse any second and take him down with them. Fortunately, the noise was drowned out by the drone of the helicopter. He continued upward, shifting his weight to stabilize the load beneath him. Finally, he was within reach of the eaves. He drew in a breath, held it, then grabbed hold with both hands and pulled himself up onto the roof. Sections of thatch continued to smolder from Kissinger's earlier incendiary round, but enough of the roof was intact to allow him to cautiously inch his way toward one of the openings. Once he reached it, the stony man armorer clasped his pistol in both hands and slowly rose to a crouch. As Grimaldi had forewarned him, he found himself staring down through the smoke at one of the stolen saber launch systems. None of the Kashmiris gathered around the weapon had yet spotted him. Most of them were either contending with the foul-smelling smoke that engulfed them, or else blasting away at the helicopter with their MP5s. Much as Kissinger wanted to take out the gunman first, he was more concerned with the youngest member of the group, who stood over the launcher's control console, clearly preparing to fire the first of the missiles. Not so fast. He took quick aim. A bullet tore through Rodvi Kode's neck. As his knees buckled, pulling him to the ground, he clawed at the console, trying to hold himself up and complete the launch. Rodvikode, half his head obliterated, let go and slumped to the ground. The console blinked and buzzed, but the proper sequence of commands hadn't been completed. The launch was aborted. Kissinger had little time for self-congratulation. His shots had drawn attention, and several men down in the distillery were quick to shift aim and fire at him. He ducked as the volleys whistled past, then popped back into view and returned fire, managing to drop one of the sentries. There were other gunmen shielded from Kissinger's view. One, crouched behind the far side of the launcher, slowly raised his MP5 and lined up his adversary in his sights. He thumbed the firing selector and was about to let loose on full automatic when the window behind him suddenly imploded, showering him with glass. It was Bolin diving headfirst into the building, forearms crossed in front of him to deflect the shards. He landed on Kissinger's would-be executioner, throwing off the man's aim. Still, the man managed to send a burst of auto fire, ripping up through the roof. He'd been trying to hit Kissinger in the head, but the rounds instead stitched their way across the armorer's chest. His Kevlar vest kept the bullets from piercing flesh, but the staccato thumps threw him backward and nearly took the wind out of him. As he staggered to one side, Kissinger stepped on a weakened section of roof. With a loud snap, the thatch gave way beneath him, and, as with the well only a few minutes before, he found himself in a freefall. He landed hard on the concrete floor of the distillery, grimacing at the additional abuse heaped on his already throbbing ankles. He stayed on his feet, however, and more importantly, he still had his colt. He put it to quick use, gunning down the man closest to him and sending another ducking for cover behind the launcher. All the while, smoke swirled around him, making it difficult to breathe and giving everything the eerie feel of a dream. Several yards away, Bolin fired a kill shot into the face of the gunman he'd dived onto, then scrambled away from the body. Once he joined Kissinger, the two men turned their backs to each other, maximizing their view of the perimeter around them. Overhead, the helicopter pulled away. Almost immediately, the smoke inside the distillery, like a theatrical curtain, began to rise. Bolin and Kissinger spotted two men attempting to flee through the building's front and rear doorways. A hail of gunfire dropped them in their tracks. Now, with the helicopter gone and a lull in the gunfire, the distillery became deathly quiet.
As Kissinger quickly reloaded, Bolin kept an eye open for enemy activity. I think that's it. Let's check to make sure. Fanning out, the two men slowly circled the launcher in opposite directions. Six Kashmiris lay on the ground, none of them moving. Kissinger was stubbing out a burning scrap of thatch when he thought he noticed movement underneath the launcher itself. Dropping to a crouch, he spotted Vanat curled up in a near-fetal position, staring out, his eyes wild with fear. Come out. The party's over. Lying on his side, legs bent at the knees, hands bound behind his back, Nasib Wall slowly opened one eye, just enough to allow him to glance across the floor of the farm building, where he was being held captive with the women workers. Two Mujahideen guards milled about him patiently, smoking cigarettes and occasionally glancing out the windows. Wall had overheard enough of their mutterings to realize that his fellow intelligence bureau officers were on the way, backed up by a tank regiment crossing the lake on powered barges. Already one helicopter had passed overhead. To Wall, it sounded like the call was he'd flown in earlier. So perhaps the Americans had brought in reinforcements as well. Much as he welcomed the news, the Indian intelligence officer had no intention of waiting helplessly to be rescued. While his captors assumed he was still unconscious, Wall had, in fact, come to shortly after being kicked by Vargadram Shili outside the building. He'd played possum while Babu Suka had dragged him inside, and when tied up, Wall had put to use his hard-earned mastery of katakali hand gestures, folding his thumbs inward on his palms to exaggerate the thickness of his hands and wrists. Though Suka felt he had bound Wall's hands tightly behind his back, when Wall later relaxed his thumbs, there was a faint slack to his binds. Now, after 15 minutes of patient, unseen wriggling, the Indian's hands were free. Slowly extending his arms, he next reached down to his feet, He'd taken care not to strain the knots securing his ankles, and they remained loose enough to work at without any excess movement. In less than a minute, he'd untied himself completely without the Mujahideen being any the wiser. What remained was timing his next move. The guards had also spoken of parading him and the women out into view long enough to make it clear they had hostages. Now that the helicopter had arrived on the scene, it seemed as if the time was at hand. Sure enough, a few moments later, Suka appeared in the doorway, exclaiming that something had gone awry with his plans to have missiles launched at the enemy. The guards were told to get Wall and the women on their feet. Suka said he would round up the other men and disappeared from the doorway. Wall closed his eyes and remained still. He could hear the guards drawing closer. As they leaned over to grab hold of him, he sprang into motion. Kicking his legs outward, he caught one of the guards in the shins, tripping him. In the same motion, he brought his hands up, grabbing the other man by the wrist and jerking him to the ground. An MP5 submachine gun dropped to the ground beside him. He swiftly picked it up and clubbed the man closer to him, knocking him unconscious. The other man, startled, fought to bring his gun into play, but Wall was a step ahead of him, already bounding to his feet. He lashed out with another kick, jarring the second gun free, then brought the stock of the gun he was holding down hard on the other man's skull, dropping him alongside his fellow guard. The women were equally surprised by Wall's sudden outburst. They eyed him uncertainly as he approached them, carrying a knife he'd taken off one of the guards. He began cutting at their bindings. It will be all right. Once he'd freed three of the women, he asked one to continue untying the others, then handed the guards MP5s to the other two, instructing them to keep an eye on the front doorway and gun down Suka should he reappear. What about you? I have another matter to attend to. Unarmed, Wall jogged to a back doorway and let himself out of the building. He spotted the path Vargadrum Shili had taken up to the academy and headed for it, hoping he would be in time to save his uncle. Over here! Following his directions, two of the Mujahideen took up positions near the trailer holding the country boat. The other twelve men he'd managed to round up had already spread out, taking cover at various points offering a clear view of the trailer. Suka figured he would have the captive women form a human chain around the trailer. When the enemy forces drew close, he would bluff and say that beneath the coconuts piled inside the boat were several of the Sabre's surface-to-air missiles rigged to plastic explosives that Suka would detonate if his demands were not met. Now that his plans to launch missiles from the distillery had been thwarted, he would grudgingly resort to Vargadrum Shili's ploy of using hostages to barter for free passage from Katiyam so that the Mujahideen might live to fight another day. They didn't have much time. 
The sentry in the observation tower had just reported that the tank regiment was still several miles away, but another helicopter was already in view, hovering low over the nearby rows of tea plants, its rotors turning the field into an undulating sea of green. At least a dozen soldiers were climbing down a sectioned rope ladder, dangling from the chopper, then dropping the last few feet to the ground. If they stayed low to the ground, they would be able to advance undetected, even from the tower. Suka turned back to the trailer and nodded to one of the men who carried, along with his MP5 submachine gun, a powered megaphone. Now! You men! Keep your distance! We have hostages, and we will kill them if you attack! Suka strode quickly back toward the farm building, angrily wondering why the women hadn't been dragged out yet. He got his answer when he passed through the doorway and found himself staring down the barrel of an MP5, clutched in the capable hands of one of the women. The women charged past Suka's lifeless body, followed by the other would-be hostages. One of them paused to grab Suka's handgun, giving them three weapons, which they promptly turned on the men crouched around the trailer. Other Mujahideen in the surrounding brush fired at the women, felling two of them, but the others took cover near the trailer, picking up the MP5s of the men already gunned down. They returned fire fearlessly, holding the Mujahideen at bay until the helicopter forces arrived on the scene. Caught in a crossfire, half the terrorists quickly threw down their weapons and surrender. The others continued to shoot and were quickly dropped by return fire. In less than two minutes, the skirmish was over. Bargadrum Shili couldn't believe what was happening. Halfway up the hill path to the academy, he'd seen the approaching call was 8A and had taken cover inside a pagoda set off the path at the edge of a lookout. Though nowhere near as high up as the observation tower, the pagoda still gave him a clear view of the grounds below. He'd witnessed through patches of drifting smoke the siege of the distillery building and seizure of the missile launcher. And now he could see Babu Suka and the others being obliterated by a pack of women near the husking area. It was all but over. Given a chance to lead, he'd failed Dari Nesha and his brothers. Unless... Shili turned and started back up the hill. Perhaps he could no longer take the boys of the academy down to the launcher, but they could still be used as hostages. There had been, perhaps, a dozen Mujahideen stationed uphill from where the battle was now taking place. If enough of the men refrained from joining the fight, he could marshal them together around the Kalaripayatu Hall. They could still barter for their freedom. Formulating a revised plan, Shili rounded a bend in the path. There was a sudden rustling in the brush to his right. As he whirled, the flat edge of a sword blade came crashing down on his wrist. Oh! Zarek Wall stepped out of the brush and kicked the man's weapon off the path, then stepped forward, striking him in the side of the face with the short sticks he'd taken with him from the martial arts hall. Shili's cheek began to bleed, just as Zerat's had earlier. That makes us even. Zerat tossed two of the sticks at Shili's feet, then assumed a fighting stance. Now, pick them up and let us complete our history lesson. But understand this, you do not represent all of Kashmir, only the lawless Mujahideen. There are no children here to instruct. My students are young men, not children. And it is you who need to learn this lesson, not they. Shili snatched up the sticks and glared at Zirat. As you wish, old man. Zirat quickly yeah. took the offensive. Shili, though inexperienced with stick fighting, was agile enough to parry the older man's first few blows. He even managed to get in a few thrusts of his own, though they too were blocked by his opponent. The sticks clattered against one another like castanets as the men circled around each other in the confined space, neither paying heed to the larger battle taking place downhill from them. As far as they were concerned, for the moment, theirs was the only fight that mattered. To Shili, it seemed as if he wasn't only holding his own, but slowly taking the upper hand and wearing down the Indian. Zerat, however, was merely conserving his strength and lulling the Kashmiri into a false sense of confidence. All the while, he patiently evaluated Shili's fighting style, detecting weaknesses to capitalize on. Once he had his enemy figured out, Zerat stepped up his own offensive, adroitly avoiding blows with the same frequency with which his own slashes and thrusts began to connect. The tide of the battle quickly turned. Welts sprouted along Shili's arms, chest, and face as he absorbed more and more punishment, each stinging blow taking more out of him. Soon he was forced to abandon his offensive strategy and concentrate solely on fending off Zirat's relentless onslaught. Finally, the Kashmiri sank to his knees and tossed his sticks aside, covering his head and face with his forearms. 
No more. No more. Tell me, if things had gone the other way, would you have shown mercy? When Sheely said nothing, <coughs> Zirat prodded him hard with the sticks, forcing him onto his back. And is that why you were on your way up to Arkalari? To show compassion to the youths you tormented? Yes, I was coming to free them. You lie the way you fight. You give yourself away too easily. Now, on your feet. I'll take you down to Uncle! the... Zerat turned and glanced over his shoulder. Najib Wall had just rounded the turn near the pagoda. His face beamed with relief at the sight of his uncle. I was concerned. I thought maybe... Watch out! Najib lunged forward, but it was too late. Bargadrum Shili had rolled to one side on the path and snatched up his fallen MP5. Najib grabbed the gun by the barrel and yanked it away from Sheely. Using it as a club, he struck Sheely on the side of the head. Still holding the MP5, Najib rose to his feet and turned to his uncle. No! Zarat was kneeling on the ground, hands pressed to his midsection. Blood seeped through his fingers as he looked up at his nephew. I will be fine. His eyes glazed over and he began to swoon. Najzib dropped to his knees and slowly eased his uncle to the ground. Zirat stared up at him, his eyes unfocused. I did this to you. Please, you can't die on me. You have made me proud. As Zirat died in his nephew's arms, Najzib noticed Shili stirring a few yards away. Enraged, his eyes welling with tears, Najib grabbed the man's MP5. It was only when the gun was empty that Najib slowly turned it away and set it on the ground. Perhaps there would come a time when he would feel he had avenged his uncle's death, but for now, Najib could only feel emptiness. Academy of Arts in the Gods Less than 30 minutes after the last gunshot had been fired, India's politicos were already hard at work milking the skirmish with the Mujahideen for all it was worth. They reasoned that such sacrifices were sometimes necessary in the name of the greater good, which in this case involved bolstering the Prime Minister's credentials as a man prepared to step forward and decisively stem the recent tide of terrorist attacks on Indian soil. The Prime Minister was presently airborne from New Delhi in the fastest military jet available, hoping to reach Katiyam before sundown so he could indulge in photo opportunities at the Academy. While they waited on his arrival, the press, or at least those members who could be counted on to provide favorable coverage, had been escorted to the pagoda near where Zerat Wall and Bargadrum Shili had both died after their symbolic duel. A high-ranking party speechwriter vacationing in Aleppo had been brought in and passed off as a military spokesperson, and he put the necessary spin on certain details as he briefed reporters on the events of the past three hours. Cameramen, meanwhile, busily clicked away, making the best of what little time they had before night fell on Katium. Some had earlier managed a photo or two of officials tending to the bodies of the duelists or the sight of several academy youths trying to console a grief-stricken Najib Wall. But these would be incidental shots, buried in the back pages of the newspapers and magazines, that would put forth the initial account of what the media was already peddling as the comeuppance in Katyam. On the front pages of those newspapers and the covers of those magazines, the Indian public would be treated to impressive wide-angle shots now being taken of the stalwart-looking 73rd Regiment, visible downhill in every direction, encircling the academy grounds with their tanks meticulously spaced apart at regular intervals, cannons pointed toward the now vanquished enemy, as if their mere presence had been instrumental in bringing about the Mujahideen's surrender. All this against the backdrop of a stunning Kirillan sunset, made all the more breathtaking by ribbons of smoke still rising from the heap of burning palm fronds. Adjoining news stories would pay lip service to contributions made by the American Secret Service and CIA, but the bulk of the credit for rescuing hostages and preventing the terrorist launch of surface-to-air missiles would go to the tank regiment, RAW, and the Intelligence Bureau, and to the hostages themselves, particularly Najib Wall and the women huskers who'd given the terrorists a taste of their own MP5s. And of course, there would be special sidebars devoted to the heroic martyrdom of Zirat Wall, 
playing up the irony that his stand against the terrorists came almost 30 years to the day after he had been decorated for his part in the liberation of Bangladesh from the Mujahideen's alleged sponsor, Pakistan. Conspicuously absent in all these accounts would be any mention of those truly most responsible for saving the day, not only for the untold thousands who would have likely perished had the terrorists succeeded in getting even one missile into the air, but also for their American president. But then the covert warriors from Stony Man Farm could never be acknowledged. They operated from the shadows, didn't in fact exist. Mac Bolin, John Kissinger, and Jack Grimaldi had yet to leave the grounds of the academy, along with the other Americans who had been part of the force dropped by helicopter into the tea fields. The Stony Man trio was uphill from the press and tank troops, cloistered in one of the rooms usually used as a dormitory for the youths of the academy. After being filmed by the press corps, all of the students had been whisked from the facility to a downtown Katyam hospital, where over the next two days, they would undergo testing and counseling for the trauma they'd been forced to endure at the hands of the Mujahideen. In their absence, the main gathering hall had been turned into both a command post and interrogation room. Besides Govan Krishtavanat, five other surviving terrorists, all cuffed around the wrists and ankles, were being questioned. Another six critically injured during the siege had been flown to a military hospital in Minar and would have their turn before the Inquisitors once their wounds had been tended to. Not surprisingly, the terrorists were being uncooperative. Their identification papers, including Vinat's, were obviously forged, but no one was willing to admit it, much less come forward with their real names. Photos had been taken, and they had been fingerprinted, however, and it was hoped that once the information was disseminated to the appropriate sources, results would come back and the pieces of the puzzle would start to fall into place. In the meantime, the authorities had to contend with their prisoners' silence, or, equally frustrating, their rote recitation of Mujahideen propaganda. Grimaldi and Kissinger stepped away from one of the interrogations. They're like those dolls with pull strings. They talk all right, but it's the same three or four things over and over again. And I'm not talking name, rank, and serial number. With them, it's, we are instruments of God, and Mujahideen is the lifeblood of Kashmir. We all have our slogans, I guess. Kissinger was sitting in a corner, bare feet propped on a desk, ankles packed in ice. Also on the desk was a laptop Grimaldi had taken from the helicopter. The computer came with a sophisticated built-in scanner and SATCOM link, both innovations courtesy of Aaron Kurtzman and his cyber crew and Kissinger had already been in touch with the farm, detailing what had just gone down and sending along photos taken of the Mujahideen, both dead and alive. As he waited for a response, he picked away at a mound of food heaped on a plate in his lap. He concentrated on a bed of seasoned rice, ignoring large chunks of something that looked like chopped artichoke hearts, the color of raw steak. Grimaldi pointed at the plate. What are they feeding us? Jackfruit. A fruit that tastes like meat. Or at least that's how they peddled it to me. Sounds interesting. Grimaldi plucked one of the pieces of fruit and bit into it. He grimaced and turned to one side, spitting it into the trash. No! Oh. <coughs> Just the way Mom used to make it. Damn you! Kissinger was shifting the ice pack on his ankle when there was a sudden disturbance across the room. Najib Wall had charged one of the Mujahideen, shoving him so hard the Kashmiri fell backward off his chair. Wall was quick to grab the man and haul him back to his feet, then shove him into the nearest wall. Answers! I want answers! The Kashmiri, clearly in pain, blood trickling from a gash in his chin, gazed sullenly at Wall. My righteous cause will prevail! My righteous cause will... <laughs> Wall's hands went for the Mujahideen's neck, choking the words in his throat. Several other men, two IB, one CIA, rushed over and grabbed Wall from behind. Let me go! He fought against them, but they powered him away from the Kashmiri, who rubbed his neck as he calmly hobbled back to his chair. I knew they should have taken him out of the loop, at least for now. You can't really blame him. Here he goes to help his uncle, only to have the guy die in his arms in a way that makes him think he's responsible. I'd hate to have to drag a load like that around. Which is exactly why they should put him on leave. I hear you. But tell me something. Suppose Hal took one to the head right in front of you. Or Stryker. Do you really think you let anybody put you on the sidelines when it came time for payback? Touché. 
And since you win, I'll be the one who goes and finds us something more edible for dinner. Grimaldi was about to make his way to the mess area when Mac Boland came in from an adjoining room and signaled for him to stay put. Any progress? Boland shook his head. He'd been conferring with the joint team that had taken charge of investigating the Mujahideen's presence in Khatiyam. Uh, they're still mostly bickering about turf. Everybody wants to be in charge and nobody wants to take orders. Where have I heard that one before? They've pretty much swept the grounds for evidence. Not much to go on, though. Meaning we've still got this Derry Nesha guy on the loose somewhere with a second missile launcher. Yeah. It's pretty clear the priest killings are tied to his escape and that they use disguises to pull it off. But beyond that, there's not much. What about Kadiam? Haven't they turned up anything about the prison break? Nisha and the other man ditched their getaway rig in a traffic jam and disappeared after killing some guy they rear-ended. IB has the local cops putting out APBs and trying to lay a dragnet, but my guess is Nisha's already long gone. You know those cockroaches. Give them a chance. They'll slip through the first crack they come to. So where does that lead us? In a holding pattern for the moment. You heard back from the farm? No, not... Hold on. Kissinger swung his feet off the table and sat upright in front of the laptop, viewing the screen. Even as we speak. Grimaldi and Bolin huddled behind Kissinger so they could all see what Kurtzman and the others had come up with back in the States. So far, photo profiling had come up with two matches. The man's Zerot wall had killed before being gunned down was Vargadrum Shili, one of three Kashmiri brothers with close, long-standing ties to Dari Nesha. Since neither of the other brothers had matched up with the headshots taken on the grounds, it seemed likely they'd played a part in Nesha's escape. Should be easy enough to confirm that. Just show mug shots to the clowns that let Nesha get away and see if they recognize anybody. That still doesn't leave us with much in the way of leads. Maybe this will help. Kissinger pointed out a photo next to an icon indicating a file being transmitted from the farm. It's the old guy we found curled up under the launcher. Looks like they've got a dossier on him. Now, that's promising. He's the one guy who's not spouting any rhetoric. Of course, he's also acting like he's ready for the rubber room. Kissinger glanced across the room at Vanat. The engineer sat in a chair with his legs bent upward and his arms wrapped around his knees, allowing him to softly rock back and forth, ignoring the CIA and IB agents trying to question him. The agents both seemed frustrated perhaps contemplating the use of Najib Wall's tactics as a way to get the man to snap out of his delirium. Boland continued to stare at the screen as Vinat's dossier came up. As he reviewed the engineer's background, particularly with regards to the last few months before Vinat quit his job at British Aerospace, Boland tried to formulate a strategy for getting the engineer to be more cooperative. Though he'd never so much as cracked open a textbook on psychology, Bolin had had his share of dealings with disturbed individuals over the years. He felt they had nothing to lose by his trying to get the man to open up. What he needed was some psychological ammunition. Finally, as he skimmed through a series of short letters Vanat had written to his employer's personnel office before his resignation, Bolin felt that he was on to something. Kissinger could see it too, just from the look in Bolin's eye. I think I just saw a light bulb go on. Bolin nodded glancing first at Vinat, then at Nasib Wall, who had walked away from his fellow officers and was now staring out the window at the fading twilight. I may have a way to kill two birds with one stone. Nasib Wall nodded at Mac Bolan. Yes, I think it can work. Uh, bloody well worth a try. Les Maris was a Cleveland-born CIA agent who'd worked enough foreign assignments with British intelligence to have mastered the passable accent of a native Londoner, Bolin indicated the door leading from the command center back to the hall being used for interrogations. Okay, then. Shall we? Maris led the way with Wall and Bolin close behind. Before we go in, I want to thank you. You helped me put things back in the right perspective. Prior to conferring with Maris, Bolin had taken Najib Wall aside to offer condolences on the death of the IB agent's uncle. He'd empathized with the Indian's grief recalling how consumed he'd been with a sense of helpless rage years ago, immediately following the deaths of his own family. The circumstances had been far different, but there was some common ground, particularly in terms of all the deaths having come about directly as a result of tainted contact with forces of evil, in Boland's case, the Mafia. 
Bolin had empathized with Wall's outburst, saying it wasn't only acceptable, but vital that he feel rage toward those who were ultimately responsible for his uncle's death. By the same token, he'd suggested to Wall that there were times when vengeance could best be achieved indirectly, through means other than brute force, such as in their dealings with Vanat. Wall still knew it would take time to work through his grief and sense of guilt, but as he followed Bolin and Maris into the interrogation room, he was determined not to be consumed by those crippling emotions. Instead, he would harness them, let them help him to focus on the best way to ultimately avenge his uncle's death. As the three men approached Vanad, the engineer trembled slightly with fear. He had, after all, witnessed the way Wall had roughed up one of the other prisoners and was wary of being the next target. As such, he was stunned when Wall instead took a key and unlocked the manacles around his wrists and ankles. My apologies, Dr. Vanat. It appears we are wrong to hold you prisoner. The moment he heard his name, Vanat's glassy gaze was tempered by a flicker of recognition. He glanced up, first at Wall, then Les Maris. Bolin remained a few yards back. His role wasn't yet called for. Maris extended a hand. Dr. Vanat, I am Gerald Cook, a senior executive officer at British Aerospace. I, too, owe you an apology on behalf of our entire organization. To Vanat, who, prior to his resignation, had driven himself to distraction in his failed attempts to establish a dialogue with the hierarchy at British Aerospace, was stunned by Maris's pronouncement. Uh, you want to apologize to me? Oh, quite right, sir. If I could just have a word with you away from these hooligans you've fallen in with, I'm in hopes that we can straighten things out and have you back where you belong, at British Aerospace. Bonat was now speechless. How many nights had he spent awake, playing over and over in his mind the things he felt his superiors should have told him in response to his charges of ethnic discrimination? How many times had he envisioned the grand moment when he would be vindicated, when his charges would be not only acknowledged, but also addressed promptly and in his favor. Could this really be happening? How... how did you find me? Uh, we, sir, have been looking for you night and day for the better part of four months, ever since your packet of letters finally found their way into the right hands. Mine. The photo we took of you was sent out on the wires, and as it happened, Mr. Cook was in Katayam for the day while en route to Trivandrum. Uh, to negotiate with them at the space center about replacing their lost saber missiles with our rapiers. Maris was anxious to lend credence to the incredible coincidence of a senior official being so close at hand within minutes of Vanat's apprehension. Bolin could see the tentative look on Vanat's face, as if he were, for the first time, beginning to question what he was hearing. It was time for him to move in and play his part of the charade. All right, enough kissing up to this bastard. He pushed his way past Wall and Maris and poked his index finger against Vanat's chest. Look, Mahatma, these dolts might think you're some poor little victim of circumstances, but if you ask me, I think you're as guilty as the rest of your towel-headed friends here, and I aim to prove it. Wall pushed Bolin back a step and stood between him and Vanat. That's enough. This matter is no longer under your jurisdiction. This guy came within a hair's breadth of popping our president with a stolen Sam. That makes him our boy, not yours. He was undoubtedly coerced. Some sort of brainwashing, no doubt. We have no intention of holding it against him. You guys make me want to puke. I think you've said quite enough. Yes, this matter is no longer your concern. If you insist on trying to make it otherwise, I'll have you brought up on charges. Me? <laughs> what charges? This is Indian soil. You have disparaged a fellow countryman with ethnic slurs. It will not be tolerated. Oh, great. Fine. You want to mollycoddle this traitor? Suit yourself. Just don't come crying to me when he stabs you in the back the first chance he gets. You've said enough. I want you off these grounds immediately. On whose orders? Mine. And I dare say I'll do what I can to back him up. Bolin looked at Wall and Maris, then smirked. Hey, what do you know? The Brits and Indies are chums again all of a sudden. There's the door. I suggest you use it. Oh, I'll use it all right. But when this guy winds up double-dealing on you, don't come crying to me. As Bolin started off, Najib Wall and Maris continued to escort Vanat the other way, toward the command center. 
I'm sorry you had to hear all that. Americans, you know. Yes, they are proof that the greater one's wealth, the greater their arrogance. But you needn't pay him any more mind. You're among friends now, and before we go any further, would you care for some tea? A bite to eat, perhaps? Anything you wish? Uh, I am a little hungry. Bernard's dossier had been comprehensive down to his dietary preferences, and when they passed through into the command center, the engineer was pleasantly surprised to find a table set out with nearly every one of his favorite foods. As he filled a plate, Maris and Wall exchanged a knowing look behind his back. They definitely had him where they wanted him. We'd like nothing better than to show that American just how much he misjudged you, Dr. Vanett. Oh, we can get around to that later. Uh, let the poor chap eat. Thank you. You're both very kind. It's just that we understand what you must have been through these past months. That is to say, we think we understand. Of course, I'm sure we actually haven't the faintest clue. It has been a difficult time. How in heaven's name did the Mujahideen manage to lure you over to their side? I mean, besides the fact that we were so boorish in the way we handled your grievances. Made comfortable and reassured, what little remained of Anat's paranoia gave way to an almost euphoric sense of relief. Here at last were men who truly understood him, who were not looking to merely seduce him for their own selfish purposes. Who better to unburden himself of the ordeal he'd been through all these months? How do they win me over? <laughs> How else? They used a woman. Bombay, Maharashtra State. Dayan Murad glared at Riley. You are an evil woman. <sighs> so you've told me, at least a dozen times since we left Khatiyam. Despite Murad's pleading, she had been smoking cigarettes almost non-stop the past three hours, flicking ashes on the control panel and littering the floor with crushed filters. Now she crumpled an empty pack and tossed it playfully at Murad, then blew smoke in his face. What happened to the charming gentleman so eager to flatter me out of my panties? Evil! Less talking, please. You have a plane to fly. I'm an experienced pilot. I can fly and talk at the same time. Nesha leaned forward and pressed the cold barrel of his Smith & Wesson revolver against the pilot's cheek. If you will remember correctly, you had the foresight to store parachutes for your valued clients. If need be, we can shoot you and float to safety while you and your precious plane crash to earth like a duck full of buckshot. Is that the fate you want? Murad stared ahead sullenly, but didn't answer. I asked you a question. I understand the situation. And? And I will not cause any more trouble. A sensible man. Nesha removed the gun from Murad's face and returned to his seat. Beside him, Pengashili had several maps unfolded across his lap. For most of the past three hours, during which they traveled northward over one small coastal town after another, the two men had divided their attention between the maps and Murad's customized radio. They constantly changed stations, seeking newscasts for the latest information on the day's events in Katyum. It was clear to Murad that the men, and most likely the woman, as well, were somehow linked to a prison break, the killing of two priests, and the takeover of an academy. Insofar as the newscasts kept referring to the incidents as the work of Kashmiri separatists, Murad also felt certain the two men seated behind him were Mujahideen. As such, he wasn't about to take their threats lightly. And yet Murad was also puzzled by much of the men's hushed conversation the past hour. He had only been able to pick up bits and pieces. But as they drew closer to Bombay, again and again Murad heard the two men speak not of further insurrection or acts of sabotage, but rather of plans for a movie and the need to make sure the props were ready. True, Bombay, referred to by many as Bollywood, was India's filmmaking center and home to a number of cutthroat producers who were terrorists in their own right. But Murad found it hard to believe either man had any intention of turning his sword into film shares. Were they speaking in code? It seemed unlikely. What did it matter to them if he overheard their connivings? He would more than likely be taking their secrets with him to his grave, wherever they wound up deciding that was to be. Or was he mistaken? Murad suddenly began to wonder if perhaps he wasn't marked for death after all. Maybe the Mujahideen were secretly considering him as a possible wingman. 
They seem the type likely to have need of a reliable pilot at a moment's notice, and the fact that he was Indian would be a plus for them while they were operating in his country. Perhaps, despite all their taunting and abuse, they secretly respected him for standing up to them. It was a common enough trait among those in power. Buoyed by his renewed prospects, Murad tried to think of the best way to go about convincing his captors that he was worth more to them alive than dead. When he saw Briley crush out her last cigarette, he glimpsed an opportunity and took his pack from his shirt pocket. He offered it to her with what he hoped would pass for a teasing grin. Here, maybe if you smell up my plane with my own brand, I'll be less upset. Briley snatched the cigarettes from his hand. Is that supposed to be some sort of joke? You're welcome. Briley lit one of the cigarettes and tossed the match at Murad. Asshole. Murad turned to the men in the rear seat and offered them a sly wink. I think she loves me. Shili and Nesha both glanced up. Murad had hoped to get a laugh out of at least one of them, but both men seemed only perturbed by his interruption. I told you to keep quiet and fly the plane. Murad decided to play out his hand. If you are trying to make a movie, I think I can help you with financing. It worked. The two men both glanced back up at him. My brother is an investment counselor in Bombay. He can get his hands on venture capital as easily as you or I could pick fruit from a tree. In fact, he lives only a few miles from Santa Cruz Airport. I could arrange for him to meet us. Nesha and Sheely looked at each other as if weighing the offer. Murad's mind raced. What a brilliant ploy he'd come up with. With all the recent terrorist acts in India, he knew that security had been beefed up at the Santa Cruz facility. Perhaps soldiers would be on the lookout for the men sitting behind him. Even if that wasn't the case, the airport was one of the busiest in the nation. There would be opportunities to make a break for it and lose himself in the crowds. Murad's fantasizing was interrupted when Sheely suddenly flicked open a switchblade and lashed out with it, his hand a blur. Murad felt a sting across his cheek, and when he put his fingers to his face, they came away red with blood. Sheely wiped his blade clean on the fabric of his seat. Eavesdrop on us again, and I'll slice off your ear. As for landing at Santa Cruz to meet your brother, that is not going to happen. You already have your instructions. And so Murad's short-lived hopes faded along with the last glimmer of daylight out over the Arabian Sea. The same darkness that began to cloak the western coastline also draped itself across Murad's heart and soul. Once again, he was filled with a sense of impending doom. Blood from his sliced cheek trickled down onto his shirt, but he made no effort to staunch the flow. What was the point? Soon the lights of Bombay came into view, illuminating the coastline like a vast trove of gems. In the past, it was a sight that filled Murad with excitement and anticipation. He flew there frequently, usually on weekends when his brother would be off work. For Murad, Bombay was spirited afternoons of cricket at the Azad Maiden, followed by a feast of specialties at Khyber Restaurant in Koloba. He and his brother would meet up with friends there and then continue their Koloban revelry across town, bar hopping and disco dancing at the clubs along Arthur Bunder Road. If they didn't hook up with any women to their liking, it was only a short taxi ride to Forest Road, where there were prostitutes at every street corner. Anywhere else in India, one needed a holiday to celebrate. But as far as Murad had always been concerned, in Bombay every day was a festival, every night a bacchanal. Not so this time, however. Now as the lights of the city grew brighter and more inviting, Murad could only stare at them with longing and sorrow. As Sheely had just reminded him, they wouldn't be landing in the city, much less setting foot there. Those weren't his instructions. Once he reached the harbor, Murad veered to his right. Below, the number of lights dwindled quickly. In time, they would leave civilization behind and find themselves in the wilderness. As Murad carried out his orders, Pengat Shili dialed a number on his sat phone. Murad listened carefully to the Kashmiri's end of the conversation. Apparently, the Mujahideen had established some sort of camp or base near Guin Plateau, a long abandoned Hindu shrine miles from the nearest town or roadway. Murad regretted having bragged to the women about his ability to set the plane down in meadows and pastures. Wherever it was they wished to have him land, he knew there would be no airfield, no security, no witnesses, no hope that he would live out the night. Sheely put the phone aside. They will be ready for us. Excellent. 
You can start your descent. We will tell you where to land. As you wish. As he had several times during the flight, the Carolyn toyed with the idea of crashing his plane, perhaps after putting the Gurkha through a few dizzying aerial maneuvers that would prevent the others from bailing out. That way, before dying, he would at least have the satisfaction of seeing fear on the faces of his tormentors. Also, he reasoned, taking the Mujahideen with him to their deaths would be a noble act, one certain to offset a lifetime of petty transgressions and enhance his stature in the next life. It was a nice thought, but ultimately Murad wasn't quite ready to give up his present life, much less willfully destroy his prized Gurkha. There had to be another way. Once he had passed over the small towns of Panvel and Karjat, Murad could see nothing before him but wide black plains and the shadowy outlines of hillocks and small buttes. Experienced or not, it would be impossible to land in such utter darkness, and judging from his fuel gauge, they would have to land soon. He was about to tell the men as much when, as if by magic, lights began to flicker to life, one by one, atop a nearby plateau. It quickly became clear that they were lined up in two neat rows, creating a makeshift landing strip. There you are. It looks like an aircraft carrier in the middle of the desert, yes? How flat is the plateau? Flat enough for a man of your talents to make a smooth landing. <laughs> Just pretend we're going to our little rendezvous. Murad held his rage in check. As he drew close to the plateau, he noticed shadowy figures with assault rifles standing beside the flickering oil lamps. Most likely they would douse the lamps as soon as Murad landed, returning the plateau to darkness. He would be swallowed by the night, most likely never to see the light of another day. Murad was lowering the plane's landing gear into position when it occurred to him for the first time that he was the only one inside the plane wearing a seat belt. Up in the air they hadn't encountered any turbulence, and it hadn't been an important consideration, but now, during landing, restraints were vital, especially for a small plane landing on possibly rough terrain. It was customary for Murad to advise his passengers to buckle up, but this night, he decided, would be an exception. Everything seemed in order as the plane leveled off and approached the plateau, so much so that Nesha and Shili turned their attention back to one of the maps. Then, at the last possible second, Murad made his move and veered the plane to one side. Suddenly, instead of coming in between the rows of landing lamps, Murad had the plane aimed dead center at the men lined up beside the left row of lamps. Like ten pins being struck by a bowling ball, the first two gunmen bounded away from the nose of the Gurkha. A third and fourth were crushed as they fell under the plane's landing gear. Murad had already made a point to land rough, and when the plane bounded over the bodies, Briley, Nesha, and Sheely were thrown around the cabin. Briley struck her head on the windshield and was knocked unconscious, while Sheely slammed hard into the stereo cabinet, sending a sharp pain down the length of his arm. Nesha was thrown to the floor and twisted his knee, but was otherwise unhurt. By now, the other men on the ground had dived clear of the oncoming plane, but with Nesha and Sheely aboard, they were wary of firing at the pilot. <laughs> Murad let out a raucous whoop as he began to weave the plane back and forth across the runway, hoping to keep his passengers off balance. Those on the ground began to suspect Murad's ploy and countered the only way they knew how, by firing at the plane's tires. Shot after shot bit into the dust being thrown up by the plane, and there were muffled explosions each time a bullet found its mark. As rubber gave way and the plane's wheel rims bit into the soft earth of the plateau, the Gurkha began to decelerate. Inside the plane, Sheely had been thrown against the side window, cracking both it and his skull. He was now out cold on the floor. Nesha, also pitched about the cabin like laundry in a dryer, had managed to keep hold of his Smith & Wesson. Once he got the sense the plane would indeed stop short of the plateau's edge, he took aim as best he could and fired at the pilot's seat. Shots ripped through the seat and burrowed into Murad until he slumped over the controls, bleeding from wounds to the back and neck. The plane continued to roll of its own accord for another 20 yards before slowing to a stop in the thick gravel. Nesha had made a point to leave one bullet in the chamber of his Smith & Wesson. He staggered forward and pointed the gun at the base of Murad's skull. Very clever. But not clever enough. Krula Pass Airfield, Western Ghats. Mac Bolin wasn't sure which was the ruder awakening, the alleged coffee he'd been given to sip on the way to the airfield, 
or the first glare of the morning sun peering over the mountaintops. Deciding it was a toss-up, he turned his back to the sun and spilled the rest of the coffee on the ground, half expecting it to sizzle in the dirt. Les Maris, the CIA agent, had driven Bolin up to the airfield in a company minivan. He held out his own foam cup, sloshing its contents around. Pico, it's really a black tea, not coffee. The secret is plenty of cream and sugar, and even then you've got to keep it stirred up. I think I'll just wait until they open a Starbucks. Bolin and Maris had spent the night in the dormitory, rising shortly before dawn to pick up where they'd left off the previous evening. Little of consequence had come to light while the men slept. The biggest news was confirmation that among the Kashmiri fatalities were two brothers, Bargadrum and Rugabir Shili. Bargadrum, it turned out, had been the man who'd killed Zerat Wall up near the pagoda, only to be gunned down himself by Najib, Zerat's nephew. The other brother, Ragabir, had died while impersonating a priest during the prison break in downtown Khatyam. The authorities were intrigued by the latter's death because he'd been stabbed in the chest and then nearly disemboweled, a trademark of the man who'd been sprung from jail, Dari Neshaw, a.k.a. the Kashmir Shredder. The irony of Ragabir's death was compounded when the warden at the detention center had identified the second would-be priest taking part in the escape as Pengat, Ragabir's older brother. Dr. Vanat, rousted from his sleep for questioning in the matter, had confirmed that Ragabir and Neshaw had had a falling out several weeks earlier. Vanat also said that all three brothers were extremely close, giving rise to a theory that Neshaw had yet to tell Pengat, his alleged right-hand man, about the real circumstances of Ragabir's death. A consensus had yet to be reached, however, on whether to make the information public in hopes of creating a rift between the two Mujahideen, wherever they might be. It was in hopes of determining the whereabouts of Pengat Shili and Derinesha that Bolin and Maris had driven up to the remote airfield overlooking Katyam and Bembanad Lake. Lying on its side downhill from the grove of hardwoods where the two men stood, was a late model Honda sedan. The vehicle had been spotted shortly after dawn by an amateur photographer who'd come to the airfield hoping to hire a pilot to fly him over the Academy of Arts for some freelance shots he could then sell to the Indian tabloids. Advised that airspace over the school had been declared off limits, the photographer had climbed one of the hardwood trees hoping to use his telephoto lens for the next best thing. Instead, he'd spotted the Honda, which, as it turned out, had been stolen the morning before from an upscale Katium neighborhood less than three blocks from the hotel where Vanat had planned on having his much-anticipated rendezvous with the American call girl known only as Briley. Jack Grimaldi and John Kissinger were presently at the hotel trying to get more information on Briley, who had checked out a half hour before the theft of the Honda. The Honda, meanwhile, was being searched by the same intelligence bureau authorities who the day before had investigated the murder of the two priests downhill from the academy. Maris and Bolin, content to leave the IB to its business, were waiting to speak to one Kalyanar Tendelma, one of the airfield's groundskeepers, who claimed to know how the Honda had wound up halfway down the embankment. When he'd been called at home about the matter, Tendelma had promised to drive up to give a statement. When Maris and Bolin had shown up ahead of him, Maris had cut a deal giving I.B. dibs on the car in exchange for first crack at the groundskeeper. As they waited for Tendelma, Bolin stared downhill at the distant academy. The fires were out, and the tanks had been withdrawn, but the academy was still off-limits to anyone but government officials, sanctioned members of the media and intelligence agents with the proper authorization. The most activity was in the adjacent paddies, where workers angrily labored to salvage a rice crop trampled by tanks and Indian ground forces, positioning themselves for the previous night's photo session. So vehement had been their anger this morning that the Prime Minister had been forced to cancel his belated visit to the grounds. To save face, it was said that the Prime Minister would be joining the U.S. President in Bombay for an impromptu state funeral procession honoring Zarat Wall. Maris was beginning to recount the good cop, bad cop routine they'd played on Vanat when he and Bolin were joined by a gangly man in his mid-forties, wearing a khaki uniform and matching cap, his calves wrapped in puttees. He looked like a caricature of a member of the Indian Army dating back to the days of Teddy Roosevelt. The man extended a hand to Bolin. Kalyanar Tendulma, at your service. I learned your language from television. 
Excellent shows like Dynasty and Mannix. He reached to his scalp and pulled a strand of hair down over his forehead, then cocked an eyebrow and pointed to Maris. Bookum Dano. <sighs> that would be Hawaii Five O, not Mannix. Yes, yes, Hawaii Five O, starting Jack Lord. <laughs> Tendulma closed his eyes and bobbed his head to the rhythm of the theme song. Maris glanced at Bolin and pretended to smoke a joint. Bolin nodded. No doubt about it. Their prize witness was stoned out of his mind. They were beginning to think they had traipsed up to the airfield on a wild goose chase. <laughs> Once Tendulma had finished his performance, Maris patiently indicated the disabled Honda. You saw how this car wound up down there? No, no, no. That's not what I told them. I said I knew whose car it was. Big difference. <sighs> Fine, I'll bite. Whose car is it? A woman. American, like you. Maris and Bolin exchanged another look. Maybe they were onto something after all. You saw her here. More or less. More or less doesn't cut it. You're going to have to be more clear. Just tell us from the beginning. Bolin hoped the man wouldn't do just that and launch into his life story, starting with infancy. It was last night, a little before sundown. We have a pilot here, Dion Morwad. Who thinks he's quite the ladies' man, like Hugh Hefner? He drives up and he tells me he knows he's late, but he happened to meet this foxy American woman in a Honda just down the road from here. She's a real hubba hubba, he says, and she wants him to take her on a quick tour. Now, Dion with him a quick tour means he flies a woman someplace where they can be alone and he can park his plane in her hangar, if you know what I mean.、Uh, yeah, I think I do. Go on. Tendulma indicated the bright orange markers that lined the nearby runway. He tells me this when I'm heading out to take in some of the cones, so I have my back turned to him for a while, and then I hear his plane pulling away from the hangar. I guess the woman must have drove up when I wasn't looking, but when I check around, I don't see her car. I can't see inside Diane's plane either because it's going the other way. So I don't know if he's got the woman with him or not, and I don't. Care much because I want to finish work and go to town and find a woman of my own. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, I go back to my cones, thinking Diane will be taking off any second. But no, I look back again and I see that his plane has pulled off the runway by these trees. I don't know why he does this, and when I look, I can see under the plane and I think I see legs. You know, the legs of somebody on the other side of the plane coming from out of the woods to get on board. A woman's legs. If she were wearing pants, maybe. But a woman wearing pants and cardigan? I don't think so. Even if she is an American.、Uh, then he was picking up a man, or maybe more than one man. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm not playing Jack Lord, then you know. I'm not playing detective. I just want to finish work and have my weekend. But you saw the plane take off. Yes, that I saw. But you didn't get a good look at anyone inside the plane, not even when it was taking off. No, I finish my business and go home to eat and shower. Then I go to the clubs. No luck. This morning I get a call asking if I know anything about the Honda Accord. I tell them I think I know who it belongs to. They say they want to know more, so I say I will drive out. Here I am. And on the way, you happen to smoke a little breakfast. That is personal business. When you smoke, do you ever see things? You know, like hallucinations. That is personal business. But if you must know, I do not smoke on the job. I know what I saw, and this Honda is not a hallucination. All right, all right. Do you know when this Dian fellow got back last night? Obviously, we'd like to talk to him. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. I looked in his hangar before I came over here. He never came back last night. Is that normal? Most nights, no. Fridays, though, maybe. And why is that? Dian has a brother in Bombay. Some weekends he likes to fly up there. Who knows? Maybe he talked the woman into going with him. It's happened before. This brother of his. Do you happen to know his address? No, but Dian has an office in his hangar. Maybe the address is there. Hmm. Good idea. Let's have a look. They were halfway to the hangar when a nondescript Ford Taurus pulled into the airfield. Bolin recognized Jack Grimaldi behind the wheel and left Maris to contend with the groundskeeper. He reached the parking lot as Grimaldi and John Kissinger were getting out of the Taurus, having driven straight from the hotel where Briley had been staying. Any luck? Sort of. 
She paid off her tab in cash, no surprise there, and hasn't been seen since. But we checked a couple nearby stores and hit pay dirt at this used bookshop. She bought a few travel books on Bombay, a couple books on the film industry there, too. Film industry? Yeah, I don't get that part either. How about here? That lead pan out? Boland nodded and relayed the information they'd gotten from Tendelma. I don't think this Maraud guy is in cahoots with them, though. My guess is he got strung along. If we can get his brother's address and phone number in Bombay, hopefully we can clear a few things up. Speaking of Bombay, I got word from the farm that the president's on his way there. He wasn't due there until tomorrow. I know, but there's going to be a service up there for Nudge Seabwall's uncle this afternoon, and the president wants to be there for it. That's crazy. It's bad enough he can't be talked out of canceling his trip, but going to Bombay for a funeral service? He might as well wave a red flag in front of Pakistan and the Mujahideen. Don't think he hadn't been told that. Needless to say, we got orders to pull up stakes and head for Bombay ourselves. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Wow! Stony Man computer expert Akira Tokaido saved the images he'd been viewing and yanked off his headset. Carmen, get a load of this! Carmen Delahunt, an attractive redhead sitting 20 feet away, took off her reading glasses and glanced up from her terminal. What's up? Come take a look. Be right there. Delahunt logged a few final notes, then pushed away from her desk. Well-dressed and smartly groomed, Della Hunt looked far younger than her years. She'd spent more than half her life using her high-tech know-how in the war against crime and global terrorism, first with the FBI, then as a part of Aaron Kurtzman's cybernetic brain trust. Next to Barbara Price, Della Hunt was the second highest-ranking woman at Stony Man Farm, and she carried herself accordingly. She wasn't only decisive, but also quick-witted and sharp-tongued, traits that tended to be magnified late in the day, when she often skipped dinner in favor of caffeine and sugar-charged snacks. Her vice of choice at the moment was a payday bar, which she dunked in Aaron Kurtzman's patented 30-weight coffee as she joined Tokaido at his computer station. Let me guess. You blew up a sat-cam shot of that nude beach you use for a screensaver. Let's see what you got. Tokaido reloaded the image he'd been observing. I'm telling you, this is straight out of the X-Files. Peering over Tokaido's shoulder, all Della Hunt could see on the monitor screen was a dark blur. I'm guessing an aerial night view of a desert somewhere out in the boonies. Not bad. It's some Orion sat intel footage from last night. We're about 80 miles northeast of Bombay, just across the Ghats. Nothing but an old Hindu shrine site that... Hang on. Here we go. On the screen, Della Hunt saw a series of small flickering lights begin to appear. The first two looked like fireflies. But once a third light shone, it was clear they were forming a pattern. Two parallel lines gave off enough light that she could begin to make out bits of landscape, and near each light, a barely discernible figure. Landing lights? Yeah, but for who? Like I said, this is the middle of nowhere. Forty miles to the nearest highway and twice that far to Nasik. And it's not just that. There's flat desert all around them, but they set up their landing strip on a plateau. Sounds like drug smugglers. Or were you maybe thinking more along the lines of Hindu extraterrestrials? Ganesh, the elephant from Venus? Go ahead, laugh. Or actually, check this out first, then see if you think this is some kind of joke. Tokaido advanced through a few seconds of footage, then slowed down the playback. Okay, it's coming right up. Behind them, the door to the computer room opened, and in strode Hal Brognola, carrying a few pages of notes scribbled in his notoriously illegible handwriting. Delahunt waved him over. What do we have? Something on the Brightly woman? I've got plenty on her back at my desk. This is Akira's baby. He thinks he's found India's Area 51. I'm not talking UFOs, Carmen, all right? Here, Chief, have a look. Brognola and Delahunt eyed Tokaido's terminal just in time to see the shadowy outline of a small plane approaching the plateau. As it touched down, it plowed through one line of the flickering lamps as well as the figure standing beside them. You see that? Freaking planes mowing down guys like they're weeds. Could be an accident. I don't think so. Tokaido quickly backed up the footage and played it back. I mean, look. It's not like the plane's out of control. The pilot just lines these guys up in his sights and lays into them. Poor bastards probably never knew what hit them. Brognola glanced down at his notes, then stared at the grisly display on the screen. Where is this? Anywhere near Bombay? How'd you know that? That's why I get paid the big bucks. 
Now, tell me what this is about. As the footage continued to play out, Tokaido quickly explained where and how he'd come upon it. I ran a check to see if anybody's reported it. Nothing. This was last night, huh? Brognola's eyes were fixed on the screen. He paid close attention to the plane, following it as it slowed to a stop near the plateau's edge, after taking out nearly the entire left row of landing lights and the figures standing beside them. Run it one more time, would you? And if there's any way you can zoom in on the plane, that'd be great. I can, but you're going to lose some clarity. Let's try. Coming up. Tokaido readied the footage yet again, this time magnifying the image of the plateau as well as the plane. As he'd predicted, while the basic shapes were enlarged, the details were grainier and less focused. The sharp lines of the plane softened until it looked like some giant bird swooping down onto the plateau, and the figures near the landing lights now looked less like men than large bugs. Clustering together, those who hadn't been plowed over started rushing toward the plane. Before they could reach it, however, the image on the screen abruptly changed to an aerial view of Bombay's Marine Drive. Every bit as bustling as the plateau had been desolate, its street lights a glimmer so that from the camera's perspective, the thoroughfare looked very much like its proverbial nickname, Queen's Necklace. What happened? Uh, Orion sends things out in snippets. Unless somebody orders a lock on some specific view, it jumps ahead and starts taking footage from another angle. Sort of like a surveillance camera panning back and forth. Personally, it drives me nuts. But they figure it's the only way to cover a lot of ground without launching another 20 sat cams. Do we come back to the plateau? Yeah, quick sweep, 15 minutes later. I checked already, and guess what? The whole area's cleared away. No lights, no plane, no figures. You want to look? No, I'll take your word. Can you pin down some coordinates? No problem. Tokaido brought back the previous image and overlaid a GPS readout. Along with longitude and latitude, said to be accurate within 50 yards, the database also spit out a description of the area in question. Goween Plateau. Nice work, Akira. Now, let's see if you can factor in a couple more things. Lay it on me. I was just talking with Cowboy down in Cuttium. He and Jack checked out the hotel where this Briley woman was staying, and it turns out she just bought some books on Bombay. Not only that, but Stryker just finished talking with some guy at an airfield near the Arts Academy who thinks she took off from there around sundown last night in a twin prop. Same kind of plane we were just looking at. Yeah, I think so, yes. While the others were talking, Tokaido had been racing his fingers across his keyboard, factoring in data like a schoolboy tackling a story problem in mathematics class. You got a specific takeoff time for Kadiam? Brognola checked his notes. Around 6.30 p.m., their time. Close enough. Make of the plane? Gurkha. Balls of twin. I don't have a model number. I'll be able to pull that up on my own. You need anything else? Tokaido shook his head. Once he'd finished programming all the data, he queued up a customized analyzing application. Della Hunt and Brognola watched as he pressed a last few keys, then leaned back in his seat. Abracadabra. Just out of curiosity, if we didn't have computers, how many hours do you figure it'd take to assemble and go through all that data you just processed? One guy? Right. One guy in a library, like in the olden days. You should know, Hal. You were around then. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. One guy. Who knows? Ten hours? Maybe twelve? As they were speaking, Tokaido's computer beeped. All eyes turned to the monitor. In quick succession, a series of images flashed across the monitor screen. First up was an aerial map of India's west coast, over which a mileage graph appeared and automatically calculated the distance between Krula Pass airfield and Guin Plateau, taking into an account ten different flight paths. Next came a rotating 3D schematic design of a balsa twin Gurkha, complete with all pertinent data on engine make and horsepower, passenger and load capacities, maximum cruising speed, fuel capacity and flight range. Lastly, a weather map was downloaded and superimposed over the aerial map. Multicolored shaded areas took into account everything from cloud formations, jet streams and directional winds, along with their velocity, to likely areas for updrafts and any other meteorological variables that could have a bearing on flight time. All in all, it took the computer 14 seconds to process the various data and answer the question foremost on the minds of the people clustered around the workstation. If the Gurkha had taken off from Katyam at 6.30 p.m. with a pilot, 
a full tank of gas and several passengers, could it have conceivably reached the Indian state of Maharashtra in time to be the same plane the Orion spy satellite had filmed landing atop Guin Plateau? On the terminal, a green line slowly snaked upward along the Indian coastline from Khatyam, veering inland once it reached Bombay. Had any of the aforementioned factors come into play in a way that would likely have slowed the plane down, the indicator line would have turned yellow or even stopped moving and turned red. Instead, the line remained a constant green and smoothly completed its trek, coming to a stop directly atop the plateau. The calculated arrival time flashed across the screen in capital letters. The hypothetical plane had touched down 5.42 minutes ahead of the time posted on the Orion Sat Intel footage of the real plane's ill-fated landing atop the plateau. Does that answer your question? I think so. Good work. It also explains those guys getting mowed down. This guy whose plane they hijacked must have decided to play hero when he was coming in for a landing. Not that he lived long enough to tell the tale. He probably never got out of the plane alive. That would be my guess. So, what we've got now are leftover Mujahideen skulking around the mountains playing Che Guevara? Is that it? Well, I think we have to keep in mind that Mujahideen didn't have all their eggs in one basket down in Katyam. Prognola glanced at his notes again. We took a good bite out of them. But if our intelligence is correct, there's still enough of them scattered around between Kashmir and Calcutta to make life hell for us. But it's the ones in Maharashtra we need to be worried about most, right? I mean, their top two guys were in that plane. Exactly. Stryker's already on the way up with Jack and Cowboy. They were going to start looking for leads in Bombay, but I think I'll give them a call and have them check out this plateau first. Even if the Mujahideen moved in and out, there's bound to be some kind of trail we can pick up. What about this woman who was in the plane? Riley? Yeah. What kind of name is that? She put both her names together. Her real name's Brenda Riley. You did find something. Sure did. I was pulling everything together when Akira called me over. Let's have a look. They headed toward Delahunt Station. Tokaido went off to get coffee. I came up with a lot. How about just the headlines to begin with? Fair enough. Delahunt sat at her computer and pulled up the file she'd been working on. We took the identikit composite from this Govan Krishna Vanat guy and ran it through Aaron's archives. Good thing the poor guy was so sappy on her. His description was damn near camera perfect. Brognola eyed Delahunt's monitor, which she'd split into two separate screens. On the left was Vanat's identikit image of Briley. The simulated headshot was nearly identical to a file photo of Brenda Riley, taken following a prostitution bust two years ago in Las Vegas. I don't want to hear any wisecracks about red hair. Fair enough. She switched to the file where she'd merged all her findings into a single document. Brenda Michelle Riley, born 1976, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Clean record through high school, even graduated class salutatorian. She got a drama scholarship to UCLA, but dropped out after two years to do the modeling actress thing. An agency signed her, but nothing came of it. The screen filled with the agency's black-and-white comp sheet of Brenda, showing her in various poses, always smiling, eyes still shining with a sparkle of small-town innocence. Tokaido came strolling over. How's that girl-next-door look? Probably why modeling didn't pay off. This was during the height of that heroin-chic look in all the fashion mags. She looked too wholesome. But that changed quick enough. She must have fallen on hard times. Because next, I've got her down for two arrests over an eight-month period, one for substance abuse, the other for check forgery. She wriggled off the hook both times, but must have figured she'd worn out her welcome, because after the second arrest, she moved to Vegas. Classic downward spiral. Textbook. She trimmed her name to Briley when she got a showgirl gig at the Tropicana. She only lasted a few weeks. What happened? Let's see... Delahunt brought up an entry from the Clark County Sheriff's Department, including a booking mugshot of Briley staring sullenly out at the camera. She fell in with a croupier who was scamming at the blackjack tables. He brought her in on the act, and they got caught. Again, no prosecution, but she lost her work permit and wound up lap dancing at a place called Olympic Gardens, just north of the Strip. From there, it was prostitution, first on the street, then operating out of a condo on the west side with four other girls. Twelve arrests, but she usually made bail and was out before her mattress cooled. Is that where that first photo of her came from? Uh-huh. 
She went to trial three times and got off with fines and a slap on the wrist. At some point, she must have hooked up with a major player, because next thing we know, she's in D.C., living rent-free at some choice digs in Georgetown. Gossip rags link her to some business bigwigs, a couple ranking senators, and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Taking care of his joint, no doubt. Yeah, I'm guessing escort work. She's there two years. Then there's a six-month gap before she turns up last spring in London. Now life is definitely good for her. Rents a million-dollar penthouse off Trafalgar Square, drives a Bentley, does the club scene four or five nights a week, usually with up-and-coming politicos or finance geeks. Not to mention our friend Dr. Vanat. I don't have anything putting them together, but seeing how the two of them dropped off the map around the same time, you have to figure he was one of her clients and wound up getting sweet-talked into running away to join Derry Nesha. Which means she probably knew he could help out with these missile shenanigans the Mujahideen were putting together. Give the man a cigar. Tokaido had been doing his best to keep up with the flow of information, but there was something that puzzled him. What I don't get is how she wound up in bed with the Mujahideen, so to speak. Good question. And I wish I had a good answer, but I ran half a dozen word searches on her files and came up blank. Maybe that's something to do with that six-month gap between Washington and London. You're probably right. If you want, I'll dig a little deeper. Sure. But first, did you turn up anything on her that had to do with the movies, especially in India? Bollywood? I don't think so. Or wait a minute, maybe I did. I'm asking because Briley apparently bought some books on the Indian cinema at the same shop where she picked up the guidebooks to Bombay. Della Hunt reworked the screen. Pulling up a no-frills search engine, she and the rest of the entire cybernetic team had been developing over the past five months. The program was designed primarily to help locate criminals and terrorists suspected of operating under assumed identities and therefore untraceable by means of a paper trail. It scanned headshots of an individual, in this case the file photo from Brenda Riley's Vegas arrest, then configured a three-dimensional model, incorporating as many as two dozen distinguishing facial characteristics. Once converted to a bitmap file, the model was run through a gauntlet of graphics databases for matchups. As with conventional word searches, one often ended up with a lot of matches that were either off the mark or totally irrelevant. But as Della Hunt quickly demonstrated, the program just as often succeeded in the photo scan equivalent of pulling a rabbit out of a hat. My first run-through turned up over 600 hits, but after some quick weeding, I was able to throw out all but 30 that were clearly her. You know, things like passport photos, driver's licenses, yearbook pics, her Vegas shot. And then there are these. Della Hunt brought up a block of photos taken at a variety of nightclubs. These are Fleet Street tabloid shots of various celebrity spottings in London last spring, right before Briley most likely hooked up with Vanat. She turned up mostly as just a face in the crowd, you know, two people away from whoever the paparazzi were really going for. There are three shots here, taken the same night at different nightclubs, where she's on the dance floor with the same entourage. See the guy in the middle of each shot? He's some big shot Indian film producer by the name of Jahan. Abdul Jahan? Are you kidding me? You know him? I know of him. He turned to Della Hunt. He did that cheesy thriller about the Queen's brother-in-law making his own A-bomb, right? Nuke of Earl? Yep, I'm afraid so. What a great flick. I mean, it was one of those movies that was so bad it was good. You know, like those Italian spaghetti westerns. Hell, I think he even won something at con with it. Most popular or something like that. I don't know a thing about it. Yeah, well, what's the last movie you saw, Hal? Patton? What can I say? Anyway, Jahan was in London a few weeks trying to line up financing for a sequel to Nuke. From the looks of it, Briley got hooked up with the crowd he took out clubbing every night. Any follow through? Yeah, apparently not. Like I said, this is just before she and Vunnut pulled their disappearing act. There's no link between her and Jahan after this, so I figured it was just socializing on her part. That probably would have been my guess at first, too. Brognola checked his notes, then looked back at the image on the screen. Briley no longer had a look of innocence about her. She seemed hardened, the type who liked to party mostly because it was an easy way to make inroads with the wealthy and powerful. Brognola suspected her profile professional sex object was misleading. Women like that would give the impression they were being used, 
but when push came to shove, it often turned out that they were the ones pulling the strings. I might be wrong, but something tells me we might have uh, Lady Macbeth on our hands. Bombay, India. From the beginning, Briley had been charmed by Derry Neshaw's unpredictability, but there were times when it got to be too much for her. This was one of those times. Here it was, not even 10 o'clock in the morning, the day after his escape from prison. And what did he want to do? Check out the remaining Sabre missile launcher? Plot strategy with Pengat Shili and his other top confidants? Make passionate love with her and then sleep in until noon? No, what Derry wanted to do was dress up like a tourist and roam the grime of Chowpatty Beach and then trek down to some place called Narraman Point. And why? Oh, he claimed this was important, that he wanted to see how security was shaping up for the state funeral taking place later that afternoon near Malabar Hill. But was that really necessary? Did they really have to get up early and straggle down here to realize that, especially after the missile scare in Khatiam, no expense would be spared to keep the Mujahideen from getting close to the president or prime minister? No. Briley knew the real reason Derry had insisted that they come here and risk detection was that he wanted to look at a statue. A statue? Had he gone mad? This was only her first visit, but Briley already hated Bombay with a passion. The guidebook she'd bought in Khatiam had talked up the city's boisterous vitality and diversity, but all that Briley saw was nearly 20 million souls crammed into a space far smaller than Manhattan, most of them poor and unsightly, living off the streets, loud, scabrous, needy. Even now, with the sun barely up, they were already out by the thousands, wading into the bay with their clothes on, then straggling out to watch a shabby clot of street performers do tricks while their children scrambled around the sand with their hands out, begging for rupees. It all disgusted her to no end. Forget about the strategic targets Derry was always talking about. Bombay, she thought, was where a few well-placed warheads could really do some good. She kept those thoughts to herself, of course. As Neshaw led her by the hand past people vending food on the beach from rickety carts, Briley's face was locked with a faint smile and a look of contentment. It was no easy feat, especially as her senses cringed at the oppressive smells around her. Not just the good spiced curd, fried vermicelli, chutney, roasted chickpeas, but also the rank odor of unwashed bodies. It was enough to make her nauseous. Hadn't these people heard of soap? Deodorant? Toothpaste? How much more of this was Derry going to subject her to? Oblivious to Briley's discomfort, Neshaw slowed, eyeing the food selections as if he were a gourmet viewing a culinary feast. Please don't stop, Briley pleaded silently, but to no avail. Neshaw steered her toward a grizzled-looking vendor scooping dark-colored globs from an unsanitary-looking deep fryer and stuffing them into white doughy rolls. You'll have to try some of this. Neshaw bought two, holding one out to Briley. Pao Baji, potatoes and chilies and batter. Um, I would, but my stomach's still a little unsettled from the flight. Too bad. Perhaps later. This or maybe some bell puree. Perhaps. Briley watched him happily devour the second pao baji. Despite her paranoia, she had to admit Derry was unlikely to be recognized. Last night he'd cut off his beard, trimmed his eyebrows, and had his head shaved. Now, wearing sunglasses, a straw hat, floral print shirt, and Bermuda shorts, he looked even less formidable than he had in prison with his bleached beard and unkempt hair. And with her beside him in her modest capri slacks and a cotton blouse, Briley was sure they could pass for any number of middle-class American couples out steeping themselves in the wonders of India. As he ate, Neshaw raised the binoculars strung about his neck and peered past the crowd toward Malabar Hill, where the funeral of Zarat Wall would take place. Briley looked in the same direction. She'd read in the guidebooks about how the Parsi dead were disposed of at the Towers of Silence, but the spires weren't visible from the beach. All she could see that hinted of the funerary ritual were several large, black-winged vultures circling lazily in the vicinity, no doubt waiting for their dinner to be served. You think it's barbaric, don't you? Briley looked at Nesha, startled that he'd realized what she was thinking. I know it's some kind of custom. The Parsis are Zoroastrians. They hold earth, water, and fire as sacred. 
For them, it's wrong to violate the elements by cremation or burial. I understand that, but still, to feed their dead to the birds? It's very ecological. And when you think about it, what's so smart about stuffing people in boxes and burying them in holes? Maybe so. Not that Briley was convinced. She sympathized with the wealthy who lived in the expensive apartments nearby and had to deal with vultures dropping half-eaten limbs and bits of flesh into their patios, not to mention the local reservoirs. It all struck her as every bit as barbaric as the antics of the acrobatic troupe performing nearby. Incredibly, they were using an old circus catapult to launch children, no more than ten years old, far out into the bay so that they could swim their way toward various floating plastic statues of Ganesh and local saints that had been tossed into the water last night to mark the end of Ganesh Chattagri, which, as near as Briley could figure, was India's week-long answer to Halloween, or New Year's Eve. Seeing that Briley was watching the performance, two younger children scampered over. Their hands were out, and they pleaded to her as they gestured out into the bay. For a donation, their brother will touch a floating likeness of Ganesh and make sure your dreams come true. I'll pass. Briley tried to keep a smile on her face as she shook her head at the children. Nesha, however, crouched before them and handed them a few rupees. As he spoke with them, Briley watched another youngster let out a whoop as the catapult sent him hurtling out into the sea, arms and legs flailing. The bay was shallow, and even though the boy flew more than 50 yards through the air, at the last second he straightened his body and hit the water at a flat enough angle to avoid striking the bottom. Briley was amazed. It was like watching the cliff divers at Acapulco, only here the dives were horizontal rather than vertical, and performed by children. The youth surfaced quickly and swam to the nearest statue, a Ganesh the size of a refrigerator, sitting cross-legged in a pose of meditation. Holding on to the bobbing effigy while he caught his breath, the boy waved back to shore, smiling. Behind the boy, Briley noticed that the sky had turned leaden. Far out to sea, she could see heavy rain streaking from large swollen clouds that seemed to have materialized out of nowhere. In moments, as if to announce the storm's coming, a strong salty breeze rolled across the bay. Briley shuddered as Nesha rejoined her. Monsoon, long overdue. It'll rain out the parade, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> it will come, and for an hour it will seem like Bombay is ready to sink under such a downpour. Then the storm will move on, and the sun will come out. All the while, people will go about their business. If there is enough of a wind, the streets might even be dry again in time for the parade. I guess I have a lot to learn about this part of the world. Nesha took her by the hand. Come, I want to show you the statue before it rains. You are not forgetting our meeting, are you? We have time. Nesha led her to the street and flagged down a passing taxi. When you paid those children, what did you wish for? A dilapidated cab pulled over, and he opened the back door, gesturing for Briley to get in. For success with our mission, of course, and that you will one day come to love this part of the world as much as I do. Briley had no ready answer for Nesha, so as she moved past him into the back seat of the cab, she merely smiled again and stroked his cheek letting him draw his own conclusions. Nesha sat next to Briley and put his arm around her, then called out for the driver to take them to Nariman Point. It was slow going. They were on the main thoroughfare, and traffic, even for a weekend, was every bit as congested as it had been in Katiam when Nesha and Pengat were fleeing the detention center. Adding to the slowness was the presence of troops and city workers setting up barricades for the funeral procession that would later carry the body of Zirat Wall to the Towers of Silence. Nesha scowled at the sight, directing most of his anger at the troops. Look at these puppets of the Shiv Sena. How dare they appropriate the name of their great Shivaji. They desecrate the great man's legacy to justify their agenda of Hindu nationalism and Muslim oppression. They need to be stopped at any cost. And I will, sooner than anyone suspects. Listening to Nesha's rantings, whispered in her ear so the cabbie wouldn't overhear, Briley was lulled into a familiar reverie. At times like this, when Derry talked of the future with such passion, determination, and confidence, she would do her best to forsake her cynicism. If she could manage to get caught up in his fervor, it was like an aphrodisiac. She would find herself thinking of all that would come her way should he succeed. Wealth. Fame, a life of idle leisure. 
No longer would she have to ply her sexual wiles in the name of Nesha's cause. She could indulge in passion for passion's sake alone, the way she liked it. Let Nesha pursue his desire to rule over these teeming, festering masses. Let him feel he could crush them by force of will, teach them to love and respect him. Briley could live with this. She would gladly fuel his hunger for power, his desire to be enthroned. She would be content with the spoils that fell her way as the power behind the throne. When Briley put her life into this perspective, any sacrifice seemed tolerable. And so she listened, rapt, until at last the cab pulled to a stop in front of the Oberoi Towers. So many dreams. Perhaps I should have paid those children a few more rupees, eh? Briley clasped his hand. I believe in you. I know you're just being kind, but let me show you that it really is possible. Nesha paid the cabbie, then led Briley along a newly built promenade leading out to Nariman Point. Located halfway down the peninsula, the promenade overlooked not only Back Bay, but also, jutting inward toward the heart of the financial district, a large rectangular expanse of water left over from the latest reclamation project by which Bombay, over the centuries, had claimed land from the sea to build upon. All in all, it wasn't the ideal place to erect a statue that Maharashtra's ruling party hoped would one day rival America's Statue of Liberty. Most had favored something on the other side of the peninsula, near the gateway of India. But once completed, the pedestaled, 40-foot-high likeness of folk hero Shivaji would be visible not only to ships approaching Bombay Harbor, but also throughout Back Bay. The statue, rising from the tip of the promenade, was supposed to be completed in time to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Bala Saheb Thackeray's founding of the Shiv Sena party. But Briley could see that was never going to happen. The 40-foot-high pedestal seemed finished, but as for Shivaji and his majestic rearing stallion, both were, for the most part, mere skeletal outlines through which the morning sun glared, silhouetting the flocks of pigeons that were apparently of the opinion that India's ruling party had made them a fanciful birdhouse. There were no workers in sight, and a few hundred people were slumbering around the base of the pedestal, having moved their sheets and bedrolls so that they could sleep a while longer in the relative coolness of the statue's shadow. They looked to Briley like beached seals. Isn't it magnificent? Nesha took a step back. The wind had picked up, forcing him to take off his hat and use his hand to shade his eyes as he studied the statue from top to bottom. It will be when it's finished. He nodded. For what seemed an eternity, Nesha stared silently at the guano-splattered edifice. Then, taking off his sunglasses, he dabbed the corners of his eyes. Briley couldn't believe it. Derry was weeping. Are you all right? Fine. Tears of pride, that is all. You know how I feel about Shivaji. It is proof that my dreams can come true. Tell me about him again. Are you sure? Briley was actually tired of hearing about Shivaji. But she knew how much Derry liked to expound on the founder of the Maratha Confederacy, which overthrew the Mughal Empire in the late 17th century and ruled western India until being subdued by the British. Although most historians tended to focus on Shivaji's technological foresight and his penchant for religious tolerance, Nesha was more fascinated by his hero's military prowess, particularly in his clashes with the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. Never mind that Shivaji had been a Hindu, and Aurangzeb, a Muslim like Nesha. To Derry, that was beside the point, an unfortunate miscasting that could be overlooked. The previous year, before Nesha had put her up at her townhouse in London, he'd taken Briley to Pune, Shivaji's birthplace, 70 miles southeast of Bombay. There he'd told her how the great Shivaji had reclaimed his hometown from the Muslims by teaching lizards to carry up the ropes by which his troops scaled the steep walls of Simhagad Fortress. And Nesha's escape from the detention center in Khatiam had been, in part, inspired by his hero's escape from custody in Agra, shortly after the completion of the Taj Mahal. In Shivaji's case, however, instead of smuggling himself out disguised as a priest, he'd hidden himself in a large basket of sweets and waited for the authorities to deliver him to his freedom. Once we have finished our mission, I will go down in history as the Shivaji of my time. And then in a thousand years, there will be those who aspire to be the next Dairy Nesha. 
They had spent only a few minutes before the statue, and yet, as she looked around, Briley suddenly noticed that they were surrounded. Where moments before there had been only hundreds of people on the promenade, now there were thousands, with thousands more on the way, flowing forth from the city, the women's saris snapping loudly in the breeze. Briley was stunned, concerned. She doubted anyone had overheard Nesha's ramblings. How could they have? chattering as everyone was in their noisy slew of incomprehensible dialects. But why risk the chance? Don't forget, we're meeting Abdul in an hour. Yes, yes, of course. What would I do without you? Taking a cell phone from his pocket, he led her away from the mob. Nesha called one of his Bombay contacts, who owned a powerboat and was idling out in the bay, pretending to fish as he awaited the call to pick up Nesha and Briley and take them around Malabar Point to the north part of the city, where Abdul Jahan had converted one of the old textile mills into a motion picture facility. Nesha told the other man where to meet them, then stopped at a nearby kiosk to buy a half dozen different morning papers. As they started down a wide wooden staircase leading back down to the beach, the newspapers rustled loudly in Nesha's hands as he tracked down stories and photographs about yesterday's events in Khatiyam. Briley knew he was eager to see what the press had made of his escape and the discovery of a missile launcher at the Academy of Arts, and to her it looked as if he were skimming the print for two key words only, Derry Nesha. Nesha cursed several times when he came across accounts painting the Mujahideen in a negative light, but he was amused by the boastful claims of authorities eager to take credit for having supposedly dealt a death blow to the Kashmiri separatists. Fools. They would think they'd killed an octopus if they nipped off one of its tentacles. Rounding Nariman Point, they came to the mini harbor remaining from the Back Bay Reclamation Project. The shoreline had been taken over mostly by Koli fishermen, descendants of the aboriginals who'd first settled Bombay. Though more prevalent 15 miles to the north in Versova, the Kolis had entrenched themselves here as well. Clappered shanties bordered the beach creating a squalid makeshift village that contrasted sharply with the gleaming skyscrapers across the water. Fishermen, as well as the notorious Koli women, were already out in force. Some were preparing to head out for the day despite the approaching monsoon, while others were unloading boats filled with fish pulled from the sea during the night. The stench made the other smells Briley had thus far endured seem like perfume. She worried that she and Nesha would wind up reeking of fish when they met Abdul. How long before the boat is here? Nesha didn't respond. Briley saw that he was transfixed on an article in one of the papers. He shook his head to himself as he read, and under his breath he cursed, not like before, but more in alarm. What is it? Nesha, clearly troubled, handed the paper to Briley, pointing out a paragraph in a story about the prison escape. In describing how Nesha had managed to walk out of the prison disguised as a priest, the article described in detail how the man who'd provided him with his clerical robe and hat had been left behind in the cell, stabbed in the manner of the so-called Kashmir Shredder. They'd made a point of printing Ragabir's name and pointing out that he had two other brothers in the Mujahideen, Bargadrum, who died in the siege at the Academy of Arts, and Pengat, who had participated in the escape and was presumed still at large with Nesha. I should have told him. Pengat? How could I have thought it wouldn't come out? What was I thinking? I'm sure you did what you had to. I know that. But for Pengat, you saw how devastated he was when he learned about Vargadrum. Briley nodded, recalling the fit of wailing Pengat had unleashed last night when, at the hotel they checked into for the night, he'd learned of his younger brother's death on the television news. He'd not only wept, but also spit and fumed, swearing vengeance on whoever was responsible for shooting Vargadrum. I need to see Pengat before he finds out from somebody else. I understand. Go, I'll take the meeting. Are you sure? I can handle Abdul. That's what I'm afraid of. <sighs> Dairy, that was a long time ago. Abdul and I are friends, nothing more. I want to believe that. Then do. We've been through too much not to have trust in each other. Yes, of course. Briley leaned forward and kissed him lightly. Now go. Do what you have to. Everything will be fine. Nesha smiled again, this time with more ease. You are an amazing woman, Briley. Briley winked back at him. What would you do without me?
Goin Plateau. Gotta hand it to Akira. We're damn near right on the money. Grimaldi was at the controls of Dayon Murad's Gurkha Thresher. Though smaller, less powerful, and nowhere near as well maintained as the twin balsa Murad had flown from Katyam the previous night. The Thresher helped along during the last leg of its flight by strong tailwinds from the approaching monsoon, had reached Guin Plateau only five minutes later than the ETA Tokaido had put together back at Stony Man Farm. Not a moment too soon. Sitting up front, beside Grimaldi, Kissinger peered westward at the large, swollen clouds massing on the far side of the Ghats. Looks like a doozy coming in. Sure does. What do you think, Sarge? Still want to put it down? Bolin glanced up from the topo map he and Les Maris were analyzing in the back seat. I think we've got time. And if there's any evidence down there, we'd better get a look at it before the rains wash it away. Good point. In that case, let me take a quick pass and get a better look at our runway. In the morning light, it was clear why Murad had landed atop the plateau the previous night. The surrounding desert was pocked with gullies and ridges of deep sand that shifted readily under the wind's forceful hand. And as for the need for landing lights, as Grimaldi brought the thresher over the plateau, he saw a series of deep shafts dotting the surface. What are those? Skylights for the caves? They're kind of all-purpose shafts. You say those shafts are bad, mothers? Right on. Back when this used to be a shrine, the monks used them for lights, air, plus a way to get the rainwater down into holding pools inside the caves. Thank you, Professor. Hey. If you're stationed somewhere long enough, you eventually get to know a few things about the place. Whatever the case, those pits will eat the hell out of your landing gear if you give them a chance. Not bloody well likely. <laughs> Not bad. Better than your Isaac Hayes, at any rate. Shut your mouth. Kissinger scanned the area around the plateau through his binoculars, then called out to Maris. I thought you called ahead and made sure the welcome mat was out for us. I did. Must be we beat the reception committee. Fine by me. Man, do I hear that. How are we supposed to do covert ops when we always get stuck playing buddy-buddy with the legits? No offense, Les. Ha, ha, ha. Is this the part where I'm supposed to ooh and ah because you guys are more covert than CIA, whoever you are? Hey, we're Special Task Force for the Secret Service. Yeah, and I'm Wild Bill Donovan. Bolin grinned at the battering, but he could share Grimaldi's sentiment about always having to deal with outsiders. There was a part of him that longed for the earlier days, when there were fewer players on the field, and it was easier to operate alone. Now it seemed that every country in the world had followed America's lead and exhausted their alphabet with acronyms for various crime-fighting agencies whose main function was tripping over each other's toes while the bad guys got away. India was no exception. Once it had been determined that they would be flying up to inspect the plateau, Maris had to pull his CIA cloud to get India's intelligence bureau to turn around and call in some favors from the Shiv Sena party's intelligence arm in order to make sure any military in the area wouldn't mistake the thresher for enemy aircraft and start heaving ordnance once it entered Maharashtran airspace. Thankfully, at least that part of the equation had panned out, allowing the thresher to come in for a landing without interference, save for a few small bumps and dips on the hard pan. Once he touched the plane down, Grimaldi had no problem veering around the shafts and bringing the plane to a stop well short of the plateau's edge. Passengers may now deplane, and thank you for flying air thresher. Okay, call me superstitious, but I get nervous when I'm in a plane named after a doomed submarine. I think this baby's named after the bird. That are those folks who work the patties. Whatever. Let's go see what kind of souvenirs we can pick up. From the moment the men stepped out of the plane, it became clear that the Mujahideen had been careful to cover its tracks. Though packed and hardened by the sun, the surface of the plateau still had enough play to leave footprints and plane tracks, but none were to be found except for those made by the thresher. Everywhere else the earth bore only widespread swirls and scratches, and even those were fading as wind whipped across the plateau. Bastards must have swept the place with tree branches. That only works so well, though. Bolin crouched over a dark stain on the ground. Got some blood here. Probably from those guys who got mowed down. That of the poor schmo who did the mow- Hey! Grimaldi grabbed at his head, but the wind had already plucked off his trademark baseball cap and was carrying it back toward the plane. 
As he jogged after it, Kissinger called out to Bolin and Maris. Hey, get a load of this! Kissinger was squatting before one of the shafts. As the wind gusted across the opening, it gave off an eerie, moanful wail. Vishnu's ghost? Not that! Kissinger pointed to a series of rungs chiseled out of the rock leading into the shaft. They don't look new either. What do you think, Professor? Ladders. The monks would use them to sneak up to see if any pilgrims were on the way. Get out! Maris pretended to scout the horizon, then called down into the shaft. Okay, hurry, boys. Get dressed and put away the chest set. We got customers. Kissinger smirked at the CIA agent. You're a real stand-up guy there, Maris. Maybe you should get your own sitcom. While you two try out your material, I think I'll check out this hole. Son of a bitch! Glancing back at the plane, they saw Grimaldi retrieved ball cap pulled down tight over his head, angrily kicking one of the thresher's tires. As they headed over to the plane, the men saw that the tire was flat. Damn! Damn is right! Puncture? Grimaldi nodded, pointing to a metal shard as thick as a pencil, jutting from between the tire's treads. Probably part of one of those landing lamps that guy bowled over. Is it fixable? The storm's coming in quicker than I expected. If there's a repair kit and some kind of compressor stashed away in the hole, I can get us out of here in 15, 20 minutes. Kissinger regarded the storm front. How about if I give you a hand and see if we can get it done in 10? I'd just as soon wait until later to take a shower. Let's go for it. While you two are doing that, I think I found something to keep us busy. Maris gestured to Bolin. He was facing away from the plane, glancing downhill toward the desert floor. About fifty yards from the base of the plateau, the wind-swept sand was undulating almost like an ocean shoreline. As the grains were pushed eastward, away from where the men were standing, they left exposed a tangled heap of what had at first looked like firewood. Now, however, as more and more sand fell away, Maris and the others could see that the pile wasn't made of branches, but rather the arms and legs of at least six men tossed together into a shallow grave. Bombay. Growing up in Pennsylvania, Briley had experienced her share of fast-moving summer storms. There had been plenty of times that she would stand atop the hill a quarter mile from the family farm and watch the clouds drift toward her. Once she felt the first drop of rain, she would turn and race downhill trying to outrun the storm. She would rarely succeed. The storm would overtake her and she would wind up drenched by the time she got home. Not that she minded. As a child, Briley loved the rain, and nothing pleased her more than to stand out in the yard after her run, laughing as she panted for breath, letting herself get soaked. Her mother would rush out onto the porch and tell her she was crazy and yell for her to come inside. Her mother was so clueless. She had no idea that the last place she ever wanted to be was inside the house, especially if her father was around, awaiting a chance to be alone with his precious little Bren Bren. No, she preferred the rain. Somehow the rain always made her feel clean again. But Briley was no longer a child. The thought of ever being clean again seemed laughable to her, and as she watched the monsoon rake its way toward shore, she felt nothing but annoyance. She wasn't sure which she dreaded more, being pelted by the rain or spending another minute suffocating on the stench of dead fish. The smell was everywhere, but it seemed worse whenever one of the Coley women trudged by, round-shouldered, sullen-faced, Saris knotted tight around their waists, arms weighed down with gigantic fish, some as large as pillows. They glared at her, shouting oaths, occasionally spitting in her direction. Now Briley understood why the guidebooks had called them contentious. She looked past them out to sea. Where the hell was the boatman who was supposed to take her away from all this? Had Derry given him the wrong directions? Had the man become intimidated by the storm and taken the boat ashore elsewhere? If he didn't come soon, Briley was going to get wet, and she doubted any amount of rain could wash away the foul smell invading every pore of her body. She wanted to get aboard the boat and call Abdul to delay their meeting, so that she could have a chance to take a shower and change. She hated to admit it, but she wanted to look her best for him. She tried to tell herself it was all political, that it was always easier to contend with men if they could be compromised with desire. But deep down, she knew there was more to it than that. She was the one filled with desire. Stop it, she told herself. She was with Derry now. If he succeeded, he would be better able to provide for her. 
So what if he was impotent? He was always willing to look the other way and let her tend to her needs, especially when they served his as well. Of course, he drew the line when it came to Abdul. Abdul, for her, was off-limits, except for business. Maybe that's why she had these stirrings inside her. Abdul was forbidden fruit. Ah, God damn it! Suddenly, the monsoon reached shore. This was nothing like the rain in Pennsylvania. There were no warning sprinkles. It hit her with the force of a cold, stinging shower. Briley was about to head for cover beneath the promenade when one of the Kali women veered toward her. Kutia! She gave Briley a sharp push and sent her staggering backward. I wasn't talking to you! Get away from me! The other woman lurched forward, pushing Briley again. She was joined by a second, older woman who was carrying a small wooden bucket filled with fish bait. After conferring with her younger friend, the older woman turned to Briley, her eyes filled with hate. Without warning, she jerked her bucket forward. Another three Coley women joined the fray, surrounding Briley on all sides. Most slapped at her with open palms, but one woman swiped at Briley with one of her fishes, while another struck Briley's shoulders and forearms with the flat edge of the knife she used to gut fish. Amazingly, save for a handful of curious children, no one else paid any attention to the altercation. They ignored the pounding torrent as well, going about their business as if such things were an everyday occurrence. Stop it! Briley pushed the women away. They kept coming after her, however, some of them laughing scornfully. Finally, Briley was able to grab the bucket away from the woman who doused her. She swung it sharply, hitting the woman on the arm. The woman with the knife responded by taking a more vicious swipe at Briley. With a loud thunk, the blade bit into the bucket and stuck. Tugging hard on the bucket, Briley managed to yank the knife from the other woman's hand. As she tossed the knife and bucket aside, the Coley women closed in on Briley once again. Now, as well as slapping, they began clawing at her. Some grabbed at her purse, slung across her shoulder. Get away! Get away! She punched one of the women with her fist and flailed with her elbows until she'd managed to ward the others off. Her purse had come unclasped, and she quickly reached inside, pulling out her derringer. The older woman had just pried free the knife from her bucket, and she waved it menacingly at Briley. Then the woman started to take a step toward her. Dropping the knife, the woman sagged to her knees. As the others rushed to her side, Briley saw her chance to escape and ran. There were too many people around the staircase leading back up to the promenade, so she went the other way, bowling over an old man mending his fishing net, and then bounding up a wide dirt path between two rows of shanties. Behind her, she heard the angry cries of the Kohli women as they began to chase after her. The loud slapping of wet saris against the women's legs sounded like the flapping wings of a bird, like vultures, Briley thought. She ran faster. Soon she had left the fishing village behind and was running up Free Press Journal Road toward the heart of the financial district. In sharp contrast to the ramshackle shanties on the beach, the buildings here were tall, modern structures made of steel, brick and concrete, a testimony to Bombay's place as the economic heart of India. Though it was Saturday and the stock exchange was closed, the streets were nonetheless busy. Rain quickly inched its way up to the curb, slowing traffic to a standstill and allowing Briley to dash between cars as she tried to put more distance between herself and her pursuers. Once she crossed the street, she paused to catch her breath and glanced back over her shoulder. She could see the women, half a block away, slowed by their saris, haranguing passers-by and pointing Briley's way as if seeking help in the chase. As on the beach, however, everyone either shook their heads or ignored the women altogether. Still, Briley wasn't about to let up. She broke into a run again, taking the sidewalk. She thought of seeking out one of the museums in hopes it would provide a refuge, but realizing she might not be admitted smelling the way she did, she went the other way and soon found herself caught up in the sea of Indians trying to cram their way into the church gate station. Rather than try to get past them, she waded into their midst, doing her best to mingle in and worm her way forward. By the time she passed through the turnstile into the train station, she felt confident she had managed to elude the Kolis. Of the two train lines servicing Bombay, Churchgate served the western side of the island, away from the safe house where she'd hoped to shower and change. There was a stop within two blocks of Abdul Jahan's studio, however, 
So Briley paid her fare and followed the attendant's directions to the loading platform. At this point, gussying herself up for Abdul seemed petty and trivial. She was just glad to have escaped her brush with the fisherwomen. Besides, she figured she could play on Abdul's sympathy when she recounted her close call. The crowd outside the terminal was nothing compared to what Briley encountered when she reached the loading platform. People were packed in so tightly, they covered every square inch of the platform. There was chaos when the train pulled in. People stormed for the nearest doorways of each rail car, waiting for them to open after arriving passengers had departed on the other side. Still concerned the Coley women might show up, Briley wedged herself into the mob and let herself be carried along. Somehow, she managed to find her way into one of the cars. The Bombay train system typically ran 150% ahead of capacity, and today was no exception. All the seats had been taken, and Briley was forced to stand near one of the vertical handholds, hemmed in on every side by other passengers, all of them Indian, all of them soaked by the monsoon. When the train began to pull out of the station, Briley felt herself being nudged and jostled. She knew it had nothing to do with the Coley women or any attempt to molest her. People just had nowhere else to move. Still, the confinement was stifling, and when they'd reached their first stop at Marine Lines, two passengers boarded for every one that got off. Briley felt herself squeezed in even tighter. She was close to tears. Shutting her eyes, she tried to calm herself. This too would pass, she told herself. This too would pass. Gian Plateau. It's got to be the guys who got hit by the plane. Seems that way. Maris and Bolan had just made their way down a steep path leading from the plateau. The monsoon had cleared the mountains and was sweeping toward them, forcing them to shield their faces against the sting of windswept sand. They'd already decided that even if Grimaldi and Kissinger managed to repair the tire, there was no way they were going to be able to take off until the storm had blown over. Once they checked out the graves, they figured they'd duck into caves and wait for the others to join them. Halfway to the unearthed bodies, Maris lost his footing and fell to his knees. He was pushing himself back up to his feet when he felt something just below the surface of the loose sand. Holy shit! Bolin backtracked and saw that Maris had literally stumbled onto yet another mass grave. Though shallow, it had been dug a good two feet deeper than the one they'd seen from the plateau. And it was only when Maris and Bolin started scooping away handfuls of sand that they could get a good look at the bodies. There were eight of them, and unlike the others, they had been laid to rest neatly, in rows, wrapped from head to toe in what looked to be parachute material. Fucking bizarre. Sure is. Bolin peeled the shroud off the head of one of the dead men and saw that his face had been crushed by brute force. Rigor mortis had set in, and sand fleas swarmed over the exposed flesh, which was discolored, but had not yet begun to decompose. These guys haven't been down long. Maris was inspecting another of the corpses. Agreed. Lots of blunt trauma going on, too, which makes me think these are the ones who got run over. Makes sense. It didn't seem like the Mujahideen would just dump their people in the ground, no matter how much of a hurry they were in. Okay, but if that's the case, then who are those other guys? Good question. Bolin and Maris moved away from the first grave and headed toward the second. As it had appeared from atop the plateau, the dead men had been tossed haphazardly atop one another. Unlike the Mujahideen corpses, not only had they been deprived of burial shrouds, but they had also been stripped to their shorts, not unlike the slain priests back in Katium. Bolin reached for his desert eagle. Something tells me this is the reception party that was supposed to meet us. Oh, shit. If that's the case... <coughs> A bullet struck Maris in the side and he pitched to the ground, bleeding. Bolin whirled, tracing the direction the shot had come from. More than ten men were charging out of the caves beneath the plateau, half of them wearing the familiar track suits of the Mujahideen, others the olive-colored fatigues of the Shifts and a militia. Even with the poor visibility caused by flying sand, Bolin could see that most of the uniforms didn't fit the men wearing them. It was obvious they'd ambushed the men whose bodies Bolin and Maris had just discovered, no doubt executing them after taking their clothes. Sons of bitches! Maris hauled a 9 millimeter Browning pistol from his shoulder holster. The gun was covered with blood, 
but Maris had no trouble firing it. He squeezed off rapid shots at the advancing Mujahideen, dropping two of them. Bolin had equal success, but that still left them outnumbered. The Kashmiri terrorists were better armed, too, most of them firing MP5s. They returned fire as they fanned out, clearly intent on surrounding Bolin and Maris. With no other available cover, Bolin and Maris had no choice but to take up positions behind the bodies of the slain militia. How bad did you get hit? Uh, it smarts, but I'll be fine. Besides being outnumbered, Bolin and Maris were put at a further disadvantage by the wind, which was in their faces, forcing them to constantly blink away flying bits of sand. Several enemy rounds, meanwhile, struck the bodies they were crouched behind, making them twitch as if they were stirring back to life. Knowing they had to ration their shots, both men held their fire, waiting for the Mujahideen to make a better target of themselves. The Kashmiris weren't playing along, however. The odds stacked in their favor. They were content to lie lower in the sand and make their way slowly forward on their bellies. Behind them, the storm clouds looked ever more menacing in contrast to the sunny sky to the east. Rain will be here any second. Hopefully we can make some use out of it. Maris? The CIA agent lay still, gun in hand, his face buried in the mesh of human limbs he'd taken cover behind. Bolin reached over and checked the man's pulse. He didn't have one. Glancing down, the executioner saw blood pool out from underneath Maris's body, turning the sand red. He was gone. There was no time for mourning. Another volley of gunfire rattled the corpses, forcing Bolin to drop lower to the ground. He took the browning from Maris's hand and rolled sideways, then came up firing. A Mujahideen less than 20 yards away took three hits across the midsection and toppled to the ground. Behind him, another Kashmiri stopped his retreat and flattened himself behind a ridge of sand. This close, Bolin could see the man's legs trailing back from the ridge and lined up a shot, firing through the sand. The other man flinched and started to rise to his feet only to keel over, his scalp turned crimson by a kill shot to the head. Bolin, anxious to get his hands on one of the submachine guns, prepared to bolt from cover, using the rain as a screen. He hesitated, however, when he heard another sound far louder than the storm, issuing from inside the cave. Moments later, a British SAS Land Rover charged from the cavity. It was an older model, its pink panther salmon coloring faded, but still an effective camouflage. The vehicle had two 7.62 millimeter machine guns, mounted fore and aft, and there was a man in back serving as tail gunner. Bolin had no idea whether the Mujahideen had seized it from the militia or had otherwise appropriated it. All that mattered to him was the fact that the rover would have no trouble navigating through the sand toward him, neutralizing any gains he'd just made by felling two more of the enemy. When he saw the gunner pivoting the machine gun his way, Bolin abandoned any thought of going after the MP5 and dropped to the ground, awaiting the deadly hail. The machine gun barked out rounds as fast as they could be fed into its firing chambers, but to Bolin's surprise, none of the shots seemed to be striking anywhere near him. When he heard the Mujahideen's MP5 join in the chatter, with the same ineffective result, Bolin risked a glimpse above the corpses. I'll be damned. It was Grimaldi at the wheel of the rover, Kissinger manning the tail gun. They were attacking the Mujahideen from the rear. At one point, Grimaldi idled the vehicle and made use of the front-mounted gun, drilling 7.62mm hellfire into a Kashmiri about to lob a grenade. The terrorist recoiled, dead on his feet, and the grenade exploded in his hand, fragging another gunman several yards away. Emboldened, Boland broke from cover, emptying his Desert Eagle, and then switching to Maris's pistol as he charged through the pummeling rain toward the gunman he'd nailed moments before. Once the browning was depleted, Boland tossed it aside in favor of the MP5. When gunfire whistled past him, he spun, fanning a spray of 9mm parabellum rounds at the last standing would-be ambusher. The Mujahideen fired an errant burst, then slumped to the sand. It was only then that Bolin realized he'd taken a hit at some point. His forearm was bleeding, and when he let the rain wash away the blood, he saw that he'd been grazed near the elbow. Considering his prospects less than a minute ago, he wasn't about to complain. Bolin turned as the Land Rover approached. Grimaldi flashed a wave while Kissinger remained vigilant and back, on the chance there might be survivors still lurking out in the sand. Grimaldi pulled up alongside him. How the hell did you pull that off? This pink panther? We were about to take some pot shots from up by the plane when Cowboy said maybe we ought to try taking one of the shafts first. 
We climbed down and voila, keys in the ignition, ready to rock and roll. Why the hell they didn't use it is beyond me. No element of surprise. When you started that thing up, it was like thunder. Maybe so. Where's Maris? He didn't make it. Shit. Where's the body? Back with the others. Boland was indicating the shallower of the two graves when Kissinger interrupted. We got a problem, guys. Big time. Boland and Grimaldi glanced toward the mountains and saw what Kissinger was talking about. Surging across the desert toward them, every bit as fearsome as a phalanx of Mujahideen, was an eight-foot-high wall of water crushing and submerging everything in its path. Flash flood! No way I can outrun it! The caves! Kissinger gave Bolin a hand up onto the rear of the vehicle. Let's go! Grimaldi slammed the Land Rover into gear and jerked hard on the steering wheel. Wet sand fantailed behind the vehicle as he sped away, cutting as sharp a turn as he could without tipping over. The plateau was a good 50 yards away, far closer than the flood. The water, however, was racing faster than the rover could ever hope to go. It was going to be close. As they sped toward the nearest cave, Bolin saw the water close in on the nearest of the Mujahideen fighters. The body rose up for a brief moment, then was pulled under by the force of the wave, disappearing from sight. Next, the flood surged toward an aged acacia, one of the few trees on the desert plain, so old its trunk was nearly as wide as the Land Rover. The tree resisted a second or two, then snapped loudly, becoming little more than an oversized piece of driftwood dragged along by the water's sheer force. Faster! Pedals to the metal! They were now twenty yards from the black maw of the cave. The flood was, at most, thirty yards from the rover, and gaining fast. Kissinger clutched the machine gun's mouth for support. We're not gonna make it! He was only partly correct. Grimaldi powered the rover forward, managing to get halfway into the cave before the water hit them. Kissinger and Grimaldi were both ejected from the vehicle and thrown against the cave wall. Grimaldi managed to get an arm up to blunt the impact, but Kissinger was off balance and struck his head and shoulders against the hard rock. Unconscious, he fell to the ground and was nearly crushed by the rover as it toppled onto its side. Though shaken, Grimaldi had the presence of mind to grab the stony man armorer and jerk him clear. The flood was moving at such a pace that it raced by the cave rather than surging into it. Still, enough water coursed into the cavity that Grimaldi was hard-pressed to drag Kissinger from its path. Finally, as the water came up to his waist, he gave up and slung one arm around his friend, leaving the other free to tread water. The water lifted both men up to a ledge, and when the level ceased rising, Grimaldi helped Kissinger onto the shelf and then crawled up beside him. His arm was scraped, and he was bruised all up and down his right side. But he was alive, and thankful for it. He was dragging Kissinger farther from the edge when the man sputtered and came to. <coughs> Sit tight! We got through it! Back! Grimaldi stared out at the lapping waters and the crushed heap that had been the Land Rover. There was no sign of Bolin. I don't know. I think we lost him. Don't fight it. That was Bolin's first conscious thought as he found himself being swept along by the floodwaters. Unlike Grimaldi and Kissinger, he'd been thrown away from the cave when the water had caught up with the Land Rover. At first, he'd been pulled down beneath the surface and pushed along the outer facing of the plateau, and for a brief moment, he'd even been pinned to an outcropping for so long that he felt his lungs were about to burst. The rock had finally given way, however, and he'd found himself pushed upward until he was able to get his head above the waterline. Now, as he struggled to stay afloat, the plateau fell away from him. The battlefield where he and Maris had discovered the graves was underwater, and there was no telling where the bodies were or where they'd wind up. There was nothing but uninterrupted plains stretching westward, and the flood, constantly nourished by the monsoon, showed no signs of abating. Bolin had no idea how long his strength would hold out, but he saw no choice but to let himself be carried along and hope that he wouldn't be pulled back under. The water was cold and brown and littered with debris, mostly uprooted shrubs and small trees. Occasionally, a body would pop briefly to the surface, only to disappear moments later. Bolin could feel himself weighed down by his boots and clothing, but he wasn't in a position to do anything about it. He had to kick and tread water constantly just to keep going with the flow. It was difficult to have any sense of time or distance, but after what seemed like miles and hours, though he knew it was neither, Bolin felt the current diminishing beneath him. 
The storm was moving past, too, and patches of blue actually began to appear overhead. Bolin wasn't about to celebrate, however. His legs were beginning to cramp, and his arms, especially the one that had been nicked by gunfire, were weakening. He doubted that he could ride out the flood much longer. Forty yards to his right, the old acacia, or what was left of it, floated by like a crude ship, its gangly branches, the masts, scraps of leaves, the shredded sails. Summoning his strength, Bolin began to swim at an angle toward the tree. He was hindered by the fact that he was being swept along at a faster pace. It would do him no good if he aligned himself with the tree, only to find himself too far ahead of it for it to be of any use to him. And so he narrowed the angle of his approach until he was swimming almost perpendicular to the flood's course. His strength was sapping, but he refused to give up. Pushing himself, he lengthened his strokes until finally he was within reach of the tree. His fingers closed around one of the branches. The euphoria was short-lived, however, as the limb snapped under his weight and he was pulled away from the tree again. Twice more he tried to gain a hold, with the same results. Finally, however, he reached a branch thick enough to support him. Hand over hand, he pulled himself closer to the tree's trunk, half of which was above the waterline. It was only when he reached the trunk and clambered up onto it that Bolin allowed himself to collapse. He gasped for breath, his lungs aflame, his arms and legs both numb and throbbing at the same time. He told himself he would rest a moment, then try to stand up and support himself against one of the upward thrusting branches. His body had other ideas, however, and within seconds, he'd passed out. Bombay. Two blocks into the Muslim quarter, the cab Dari Neshaw rode in sputtered to a stop. Given the car's condition, he was surprised he'd made it that far. As he was paying the driver, a throng of street urchins waded through the knee-high water, volunteering to help push the taxi uphill to where the street was only flooded a few inches. The driver waved them away angrily, accusing them of having stuffed rags in the gutter to keep the street from draining properly. Nesha suspected such was the case, but he wasn't about to intervene. He paid the driver and opened his door. The water was so high it nearly flowed into the cab. Nesha had to crouch, then leap to the sidewalk to keep from getting wet. In the aftermath of the downpour, merchants were just beginning to haul their wares back out for display, having already used brooms to sweep the grimy water from the sidewalks in front of their storefronts. The sun was out, and far to the east the remnants of a rainbow hung over the ghats. Nesha hoped it was a good omen. As with every other city the Mujahideen had encamped at during their months-long mission across the subcontinent, Nesha had arranged for Spartan living quarters, this time in a two-story hovel just down the block from the Manara Mosque. He'd chosen a safe house in town rather than on the outskirts because he felt his men were less likely to draw notice here, where the neighborhood's population was almost exclusively Muslim. Given that between three and four hundred new arrivals set foot in Bombay any given day, he doubted anyone would question the sudden appearance of the few men he'd brought with him from their larger base at Guin Plateau. Nesha stopped to buy a bag of fruit from one of the vendors, then made his way to the safe house. Though their second-story quarters faced the street, to reach the private entryway, he had to pass down an alleyway. He looked around. One of his men, disguised as a homeless beggar, was supposed to be standing guard near the rickety staircase at all times. But there was no one about, save for a pair of cats fighting over one of the countless millions of rats that thrived off the substandard sanitation in everywhere but a few elite pockets of the city. Nesha glanced up to the second story. The blinds were closed at the safe house, and there was no one out on the balcony that faced the street. As he warily started up the staircase, he unzipped his fanny pack, allowing him quick access to his gun, a World War II Japanese-made Taisho 14 8mm pistol. One of his men had won it in a poker game back in New Delhi. Nesha had helped himself to the weapon after arriving at Guin Plateau, preferring it to the Smith & Wesson he'd taken during his jailbreak. He waited until he was up the steps and inside the building before pulling the gun out. The apartment his men were staying at was halfway down the deserted hallway. All of the other apartments were vacant. Nesha's men had coerced the landlord into displacing the other tenants, claiming that a beggar afflicted with leprosy had broken into the building and died in the hallway, contaminating the entire floor. It was quiet, and Nesha approached the doorway cautiously, cursing the floorboards when they creaked under his feet. He had a key to the apartment, of course, 
but he wasn't sure he wanted to use it. He was deliberating his next move when the door to the apartment swung open. Instinctively, Neshaw took a step backward into the shadows. He saw that it was one of his men, Lata, a doe-eyed, frail-chinned Kashmiri in his early fifties. The man was unshaved and dressed in rags, carrying a small wooden flute and a ratty turban filled with small change. He peered into the shadows. Derry? Neshaw stepped forward glaring at Lata as he slipped the tie show back into his fanny pack. Your post is downstairs, Lata. In the alley. I'm on my way. I had to use the bathroom. Oh! You're supposed to be a beggar. Use the street. Uh, I would have only... Oh! No excuse. What if I was I be? I could be standing here with 20 men behind me and no one would know it because you left your post. He left his post because I asked him to. Lotta stepped to one side as Pengat Sheely stepped into the hallway. Pengat was armed, and he was aiming his gun at Neshaw. There was hatred in his red-rimmed eyes. With a jerk of his head, he gestured for Lotta to leave. The man was only too happy to oblige. What is the meaning of this? Neshaw already suspected the answer. Let me ask you a question first, Derry. Can you give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you right here, right now, for the dog you are? I understand your anger, but this will solve nothing. I will have avenged Ragobir. That is something. I came as soon as I saw the papers. Why? So you could kill me too? I didn't kill Ragobir. Lies! It's the newspapers that lie. For what reason? Why would they want to lie? Because they were told to. Because they too were lied to. <laughs> what kind of answer is that? You are distraught, Pengat. You are filled with grief and rage. So it is not easy for you to see that... Don't talk down to me! Sheely raised his weapon, pointing it at Nesha's face. His arm was trembling. Don't you dare talk down to me! I did not mean to... I'm not one of your little sheep! That is true. You are my oldest and closest friend. More lies! Vikrab and Andesh safely back in Zalam. They are your close friends. You let them stay home, out of harm's way, while you led the rest of us to slaughter! Neshaw felt it was time to assert himself before Sheely steadied both his aim and resolve. You just told me you were not a sheep, that you are not a child. Then prove it to me. Put down your gun so we can discuss this man to man. He gestured at the doorway behind Sheely. Inside, so this does not become a spectacle. You mean so that I do not expose you to the world for the fraud you are? Neshaw stared hard into the man's eyes. If you have no interest in the truth, then go ahead, pull the trigger, kill me and be done with it. Take charge of Mujahideen or call it all off and send them all on their way, if that is your wish. Make it so your brothers died in vain. Sheely hesitated a moment, then slowly lowered the gun. He kept it in his hand, however, using it to wave Neshaw into the apartment. Neshaw complied. As he passed through the doorway, he saw that the apartment had been ransacked. Newspapers were strewed across the floor, most of them ripped into tatters. The cots had been tipped over, as had the only other pieces of furniture, a plain card table and five folding chairs. It looked like the work of vandals, but Neshaw guessed this was Sheely's doing, no doubt his first reaction upon reading the details of Ragabir's death. Neshaw wasn't about to trigger another outburst by attempting to write a chair to sit in. Where are the others? I didn't want anyone around. As you say, I wanted us to be able to talk man to man. You'll excuse the mess. Of course. You felt provoked, which is exactly what they want. So we are back at that, then. Explain it to me, this provoking. Help me to understand. They have provoked you in hopes it would come to this. You taking sides against me. Can't you see, Pengat? They're using you to drive a wedge between us. Sheely said nothing. But Neshaw could see that he was buying into it. They are afraid. They are afraid of our power. Afraid of the threat we pose. I wish that I could believe you, Derry. I tell you, it's the truth. All my life. Before God. Neshaw risked turning his back and went to the window, drawing open the blinds so that Sheely could see the Minara spire down the block. Here, in sight of the mosque, I'm telling you, I did not kill your brother. I loved him. Sheely stepped back from the harsh glare pouring into the room, trying to hide the fresh tears welling in his eyes. You resented him. You despised him because he was willful, because he spoke his mind. We were past that. 
You know that. I heard him tell you as much. Sheely glanced away, casting his eyes to the floor. As if trying to rally his anger, he snatched up one of the newspapers and held it out so that Nesha could see the headlines, which told of new developments in the breaking story out of Katyam. Kashmir Shredder kills his own in brazen escape. If you didn't kill Ragubir, then who did? And why did they do it with a dagger? Nesha felt trapped. He thought fast. Who is to say they used a dagger? Are there any photos showing that he was stabbed? No, but... That is what they want you to think. They probably shot him, then thought of this way to put the blame on me. Why go to so much trouble? I've already told you, so that you would turn against me. It's their only chance of weakening us or stopping us just when we're about to succeed. Sheely turned the newspaper around and stared at it, as if seeing it in a new light. He cast it aside and waved at the other papers. What about the other news? I don't know what you mean. Sheely swallowed hard. A tear streaked down his cheek. He wiped it aside. The news about Vargadrum. They say he was shot more than 30 times at close range. 30 times! This was the first Neshaw had heard of it. I did not read that. I had no idea. Shot 30 times! By the nephew of that defiler they are holding a parade for today. Neshaw felt his own rage building. He willed tears to his eyes. I am sorry, Pengat. This is a terrible thing that has happened. Dragobir and Vargadrum both dead. My brothers. They are dead because of me. No. Yes. They joined the Mujahideen because of me. I talked them into it. To hell with acrobatics, I told them. To be part of a circus when there is work to be done for Kashmir. It is a disgrace. This I told them. They were happy at what they were doing, but I changed all that. I brought them into the Mujahideen. I battered and bullied until they agreed to join. Now their blood is on my hands. I might just as well have killed them myself. That is madness, Pankat. You mustn't think that way. They died for a righteous cause. So we keep telling ourselves. Meanwhile, more and more of us only die. Sacrifices are difficult to accept, I know. But they are necessary. Pengat ignored Nesha and indicated the antiquated MK3 suitcase transceiver lying on the floor near the overturned table. All morning I tried to reach the others at the plateau. Nothing. What if they've been killed now, too? You're forgetting, Pengat. The monsoon. They were probably forced to take cover. They may not be near the radio. Or they may be dead. Now that Sheely had given himself over to despair, Nesha felt that he was reachable, that he could be brought back into the fold, and made use of. Pengat, if you must dwell on death, make it worthwhile. How would I do that? By helping to strike back. We have to strike back at those responsible for Ragabir's death, and especially Vargadrum's. Why do you say especially? The parade today, the ceremony at the Towers of Silence. Vargadrum's killer will be there too, mourning his uncle. And not just him. The Yankee president will be there too, and India's prime minister. Ha! What are we supposed to do about it? The parade route will be teeming with Shiv Sena, with American CIA. Anyone who looks Muslim will be singled out. They are probably watching the streets here, right now, ready to follow anyone suspicious who heads in that direction. We can't just give up. We have come too far for that. I don't see how we can do anything. There is a way. If it is important enough, there is always a way. Not always. Pengat, I was there this morning. I have had a look at the route they will be taking for the parade. It can be done. Sheely glanced up at Nesha, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Almost without thinking, he holstered his weapon, caught up in the familiar camaraderie. How? Nesha smiled. He'd done it. He had Pengat back on his side. He braved a step forward and put an arm around the other man's shoulder, physically drawing him into his confidence. I have a plan. Guin Plateau. There was still a job to be done. A mission to be carried out, so John Kissinger and Jack Grimaldi went through the motions. But their hearts weren't in it. As they explored the cave while waiting for the floodwaters to subside, they told each other that Bolin was all right, but their words sounded hollow. They'd fought side by side with the executioner for what seemed like an eternity, cheating death at every corner, yet resigned that one day, for each of them, the odds would go against them, and this would be the result. Already it had happened with other members of the farm, and one day it would happen to them. But somehow they always thought that Bolin was different, or at least that he would be the last of them to go. 
Obviously, they were wrong. Mac Bolin was Stony Man Farm. The notion of carrying on without him seemed absurd, a travesty. And yet there was still an enemy out there to be fought, an enemy that would lose no sleep at the thought that one of their fiercest adversaries had been taken out of the game. With or without Bolin, the Kashmiri insurgents would have to be brought to justice or put out of operation. And since they'd come to Guin Plateau to search out clues as to where the Mujahideen would strike next, search they did. There was little left of what had been the old Hindu temple. All of the most important sculptures and artifacts had been extricated from the caves and shipped to museums, where they could be shown in an environment safe from vandalism and desecration. Where there had once been miniaturized temples and shrines carved out of the cave walls, now there were only scalloped chisel marks. And the monks' quarters, once breathtaking in their Spartan simplicity, were now strewed with litter and smelled of bats. Grimaldi walked among the cheap, soaked cots and bedrolls in the largest of the dimly lit underground rooms. Though elevated from the floor of the cave and spared the wrath of the floodwaters, the quarters had nonetheless wound up under a few inches of rainwater that cascaded down one of the shafts reaching up to the plateau. Looks like they were using this as a base camp. But why? The closest town isn't a Sikh, and that's a good fifty miles away. I know they're theoretically close to Bombay, but to get there, they'd have to play Hannibal and cross the Ghats. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sure they had their reasons. Grimaldi ventured toward another of the air shafts, this one used as a chimney, set as it was over a crude stone hearth. Next to the fireplace was a crate filled with foodstuffs, fruit, rice, spices, sacks of flour and dried meats. A plastic tarp had been thrown over the crate, but rainwater had collected in pools and soaked through, ruining everything. A second crate rested on a stone bench nearby. Inside was an array of weapons and ammunition, along with large containers filled with lamp oil. As he inspected the crate, Grimaldi's attention was drawn not to the wares, but to the box itself. Should have known. Yo, cowboy! I think I found something! So did I! Kissinger had disappeared, but he returned moments later, passing through a large, carved archway leading to one of the adjacent caves. There are truck tracks over there, bigger than the rovers. Big enough for something capable of hauling a major load? Like the other Gurkha? Not exactly. I figure it was at least an eight-wheeler. Why do you ask? These boxes. They didn't get them from behind the nearest supermarket. Kissinger glanced at the crate on the bench. Grimaldi pointed to markings stamped on the side. There was lettering, both in Hindi and English. They had no clue what the former meant and the English lettering spelled out words that both men assumed had to be Hindi as well. Certain key words jumped out at them, however, as they were easily translatable. One was Trivandrum, home of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. The other was Saber. Sam's. Uh-huh. I think we found the other missing launcher. Or at least where they were keeping it. The horse has already left the corral. That explains why they didn't mind setting up shop here in the boonies. With those surface to airs, they could reach out and touch anybody within, what, a 500-mile radius? Something like that. Can they rein them in any? You know, shorter range? As in hurling one at Bombay? Kissinger nodded. He knew what Grimaldi was getting at. Down in Cottium, they only had the president to take a crack at. Here, they can take down the prime minister, too. Why don't you go check on the plane? If it's still in one piece, try to patch through to the farm and give them the news. That's one call I'm not looking forward to making. Yeah. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to be out looking for his body. Thoughts of Bolin putting a damper on their discovery. The men split up. Grimaldi started climbing the wet, chiseled rungs leading up through the chimney. Kissinger checked the munitions crate for some field glasses and found a British Simrod day-night binoscope. The batteries were still good, so he slung the strap over his shoulder and waded through ankle-deep water out of the cave. Outside, the desert looked like the surface of another planet. Denuded by the flash flood, the ground, where it wasn't still underwater, bore trench-like culverts and small, smooth hills of sand. All the bodies, both from the graves and the earlier skirmish with the Mujahideen, had been swept from sight. How far they'd been carried away was anyone's guess. When he scanned the eastern horizon with his binoscope, Kissinger couldn't spot any of them, and he suspected most had been reburied under the displaced sand. A shadow sweeping across the ground drew his attention skyward. The vultures were already out, circling overhead. 
Kissinger realized there was a good chance he would have to wait and let the birds do his searching for him. Once they drifted down and began poking through the sand, he could track after them and scare them off, then tend to whatever remains he came across. What a life! Kissinger was about to call up to Grimaldi when something caught his eye off in the distance. He squinted against the sun's glare, trying to get a better look. It was a figure, far off, maybe two or three hundred yards away, moving slowly across the sand toward him. Son of a bitch! Kissinger raised the binoscope again and peered out, shifting the focus ring until he had a clearer view. Son of a bitch! Heading toward him across the desert, back from the dead, was Mac Bolan. Bombay Vultures were also in the air eighty miles west of Guin Plateau, haunting the skies over the wooded section of Malabar Hill. Staring at them, Najib Wall was beset by the same uneasiness he'd felt every time he'd come to the Towers of Silence. He was no longer the devout Zoroastrian he'd been as a boy, but he understood and respected the philosophy behind this, their chosen way of dealing with mortal remains. But understanding something and being comfortable with it were two different things. Since childhood, when he was first brought here to attend rites for his parents, victims of a car accident, Wall had been plagued by recurring nightmares in which vultures the size of pterodactyls would sweep down at him out of nowhere, champing beaks lined with razor-sharp teeth eager to sink into his flesh. The image lingered with him during subsequent funerals when, as was custom, friends and family watched the deposition of the dead from a pavilion in the adjacent park. Their landscaped gardens blocked the towers from view, so that all he could ever see of the proceedings was the coming and going of the birds. From a distance, they still seemed frighteningly large. This day, however, Wall was, for the first time, on his way to see the birds up close. The deposition of his uncle's body would not take place until later in the afternoon, following the funeral parade, which he had opposed, only to be overruled by other family members. But given the need for heightened security, I.B. had been ordered to inspect the tower-like structure that bore the exposed corpse and arrange for guards to be stationed to prevent their use as possible sniper posts when the Prime Minister and America's President came to attend the final rites. There were those who found Wall's request to be part of the inspection team sacrilegious, but he didn't care. He had to see for himself the fate that awaited his uncle, and would one day await him. Now standing before the gates to the tower where his uncle would be brought, Najib Wall put aside his loathing. Less than ten feet away, atop the archway through which he would soon pass, perched a row of vultures, as still as statues save for their eyes, which seemed trained on him. He forced himself to stare back at them, to eye them in detail, in hopes he could overcome his fear. The first thing he noticed was their size. Up close they were still large, but no more so than pheasants, and certainly nothing close to pterodactyls. They were ugly, too, from their bald, wrinkled heads and hooked beaks to their seemingly withered necks. More than fearsome, they seemed deformed and pitiable. It was only when they were joined by another, and Wall saw the flapping of the familiar dusky wings, that he had any sense of the grisly majesty that had haunted him all these years. Even then, he was able to shed, at least for the moment, his fear of the birds. By custom, the only ones allowed to enter the tower were select hereditary pallbearers. There had been vehement protests within the local Parsi hierarchy when they learned of the proposed inspections, but I.B. had insisted, and, as a compromise, Wall and several other Parsis within the Bureau had been given permission to enter. Still, as one of the white-clad pallbearers opened the metal gates, he stared at Wall with disapproval. The man followed Wall inside, closing the door behind him. After three steps into the circular tower, which measured some thirty yards across, there was a pitched incline leading down to a central pit. It was there, in the pit, that the bones of the deceased were tossed after they'd been picked clean by the vultures. The pit was lined with charcoal and sand so that, in the event of rain, the decomposing remains wouldn't leach into the earth, contaminating it in violation of the same tenets that had given rise to the ritual in the first place. The platform was still damp from the monsoon, which had washed away most traces of the deposition that had taken place earlier in the morning. 
that didn't prevent a few vultures from fluttering down and pecking at the stone slope. To see the scavengers in action unnerved Wall. He turned away from the site, drawing a deep breath to collect himself, then quickly carried out his inspection. The enclosure's high stone walls rose straight upward, then tapered slightly outward. The vultures had an easy footing, but there was no way snipers would be able to take up positions along the walls. At best they could perhaps lob grenades or fire a mortar from where he was standing, but if guards were stationed outside the gates and adequate aerial surveillance was provided, Wall doubted the Mujahideen would even consider approaching the grounds, much less the towers. Wall signaled to the pallbearer that he was ready to leave. The other man, now expressionless, turned and opened the door. As he left the enclosure, vultures staring down at him, Najib was sure of one thing. He would never again set foot in the Towers of Silence. The pallbearer remained behind as Wall headed for the park. I.B. had set up a command post near the pavilion. One of his fellow agents waved him over and said there were two new developments to report. First, there was a shooting at the fishing village near Narman Point. A Kohli woman was shot at close range by another woman, an American by most accounts. Wall's mind flashed at once to the briefing he'd received that morning. The word from the CIA was that Derry Neshaw had fled Khatiam the previous night in a plane, accompanied not only by Pengat Shili, but also a woman, an American woman. How is the Kali woman? She died in surgery. Was there a description of a shooter, other than her being American? Contradictory descriptions, yes. All that anyone agrees on is that she wore a scarf, slacks, and a light-colored blouse. Which she's probably not even wearing now, thanks to the rain. Still, Najib felt certain there had to be a link between the woman and Nesha. And if she was in Bombay, then the odds were, so was he. Which meant that the Mujahideen terrorists, undaunted by their defeat in Khatiam, were indeed in the city. As a precaution, he told the other man to double the guards at each of the Towers of Silence and to call in more men to help the Shiv Sena militia reinforce the perimeter around the park. What was the other matter? It's unrelated, but no less important. I just received a call from RAW. Over the past 12 hours, they have intercepted several SIG intel communiques from Pakistan ISI concerning a proposed attack on Jaisalmer. Jaisalmer? There must be a mistake. That was my first thought. But they put the messages through 11 different encryptions, and each time it was clear. They're targeting Jaisalmer. But why? Jaisalmer has no strategic significance. There's nothing there but an old fort and tourist shops. You are forgetting, just like I did. This year, they are celebrating Ganesh Chaturdi there. Najib mentally kicked himself. Yes, he had forgotten. There had been a new resort built on the outskirts of Jaisalmer, with a large man-made lake using water siphoned from the Rajasthan Canal. There was a lot of controversy over the development, as well as its plans to inaugurate a local celebration of Chatterdi, using the lake as a place where revelers could haul their replicas of Ganesh and other deities. The fear had been that the event would turn into a carnival, catering primarily to tourists, but once the schedule had been locked in place, it became clear that citizens throughout Rajasthan had become fascinated by the concept and planned a pilgrimage across the Tar Desert to attend. How many people showed up? Wall figured the number would run into the tens of thousands. More than half a million. There are so many they have extended the festival through the weekend. Half a million? Where are they staying? The fort, the town, the desert, wherever they can set down tents. Already it is the third largest gathering for Chaturdi next to here and Pune. Now it made sense to Wall. 500,000 Hindus camped out in the open desert. What better target for a Muslim attack? Jaisalmer was less than a hundred miles from the Pakistan border. Pakistan had a whole arsenal of land-based SRBMs that could clear that short distance and turn the desert into a killing ground. And if Pakistan chose to follow up with ground and air forces... Are they just out to butcher Hindus, or, or could they have their eyes on the canal? I can't believe they try either one. Neither can the Prime Minister. He is convinced there has to be some kind of mistake. But until he knows for sure, he has to put the armed forces on high alert. This is absurd. All this focus we have put on stopping the Mujahideen, and now we have Pakistan preparing an act of war. It's madness. There's been no warning. No sword rattling in Islamabad. They are supposed to be meeting with us to discuss peace, not war. Put yourself in Pakistan's shoes. 
What better time to strike at us than when we are preoccupied, not only with the Mujahideen, but also Chatterjee and the presidential visit. And a funeral? Wall glanced back at the Towers of Silence and the hovering vultures, who, like Pakistan, apparently, were hoping that at any minute there would be dead to feast on. It was only now beginning to set in. No longer was India's main concern the isolated terrorism of Kashmiri separatists. No, now the country, unbelievably, seemed on the brink of all-out war. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Once he passed through the security checkpoint, Huntington Weathers drove his Lincoln Town Car down the access road that passed through Stony Man Farm. The moonlit grounds looked deserted, but Weathers knew if he looked hard enough, he would see black suits stationed strategically throughout the farm, maintaining their around-the-clock vigil over the compound. Just as the land had been painstakingly planted, landscaped, and cultivated in the manner of a legitimate farm, the main house looked like any number of sleepy country estates dotting the Shenandoah Valley. Beneath its rural facade, however, the house was a veritable armed fortress, complete with not only reinforced steel doors and walls and bulletproof glass, but also anti-aircraft guns mounted beneath a retractable roof. Weathers yawned as he was admitted through the front entrance of the farmhouse. He was still battling the fog of deep sleep he'd been roused from nearly an hour ago by an urgent call from Hal Brognola. Of course, there was no such thing as a call from Brognola that wasn't urgent, especially at this hour. Once in the building, Weathers was escorted down to the tunnel linking the house with the annex. A black suit had brought up one of the tram carts. Weathers exchanged perfunctory greetings as he climbed aboard. Then both men traversed the tunnel silently. Tall and distinguished, his short cropped hair turning grayer with each passing month, Weathers looked as if he'd never left his former job as a university professor at Berkeley. Stick a piece of chalk in his hand and put him behind a lectern facing an auditorium full of students, and most of his co-workers felt he could readily pick up where he'd left off, attacking the chalkboard with deft strokes as he expounded on cybernetic theory and drummed home his never-ending campaign to make sure the world put the science back into computer science. On the phone, Brognola had mentioned wanting to tap Weathers' encryption expertise, a sideline pursuit that appealed to his professorial side, rife as it was with patterns, mathematics, and formulations. Whenever Kurtzman, Tokaido, and Carmen Delahunt were stumped, trying to decipher foreign intel or looking for a way to help another agency beef up its own dissemination, they invariably turned to Weathers. Tokaido was off napping after a 14-hour shift, but Kurtzman and Delahunt were still at their computers when Weathers entered the room and made a beeline for the coffee maker. Brognola was present, too, rolling an unlit cigar between his fingers as he stared at the largest of the computer monitors lining the wall farthest from the workstations. On the screen was a SATCAM photograph of the South Asia subcontinent overlaid with graphics delineating borders in major cities. It took Weathers a moment to see that he was looking at the Indian state of Rajasthan, as well as portions of Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, and the Pakistani states of Punjab and Sindh. Another snag in the peace talks? Brognola turned and extended his hand to Weathers. Hunt, I appreciate your coming on such short notice. Anything to help. Weathers waved across the room at Kurtzman and Delahunt, then turned back to Brognola. Now, what's this about an encryption problem? We're under the gun, in more ways than one, so I'll cut straight to the chase. Over the past hour, we've tapped into communiques passed between India's RAW and their intelligence bureau. For their part, they're claiming they've done the same thing with ISI in Pakistan, unearthing some plot to fire a missile at some religious gathering in the Tar Desert near Jaisalmer. The Ganesh Festival. I was monitoring that early in the week. It's turned into something like a Hindu Woodstock, correct? In terms of people showing up, yes. Half a million. But it's looking like they have more in store for them than peace, love, and music. If a missile crashes their party, it'll be wholesale slaughter. What about interceptors? India's working on it. Ground and air. Only they've got a split focus, given the situation in Bombay. They're canceling the parade, I assume. With the president, you never assume. He got the prime minister to back him. Then I take it none of this has been made public? Absolutely not. They don't want to start a panic, either in Bombay or Jaisalmer. 
That many people crammed together, you trigger any kind of stampede and they'll start trampling each other trying to get away. Not a pretty sight. Besides, there's a chance it's all a false alarm. How so? Pakistan just came out saying they have no such plans, that a prank call somehow found its way into the loop. Delahunt called out from her station. That's some prank! We'd expect Pakistan to deny everything, though, wouldn't we? We're looking into that angle. In fact, that's what we need your help with. But first, let me finish, because it gets more complicated. I'm following you so far. Good. Prognola moved over to the map on the large monitor. He used his cigar as a pointer as he talked. While you were on the way over here, Aaron tapped into an ISI feed out of Islamabad, and in Pakistan, the shoe's on the other foot. I'm not sure what you mean. They're countercharging that they've seized a raw inter-office memo analyzing strategy for a missile strike at two key nuclear weapon sites in Punjab. Prognola pointed to a cluster of dots on the map, all centrally located in the Indus River Valley. Multan's a heavy water facility. Daragazi Khan is less than 90 miles away. They've got a uranium mine there, Bugglechore, that's nearly played out, but still produces enough to be processed into 20 metric tons of yellow cake a year. That, plus they're scouting for more uranium deposits in neighboring areas. If India takes out the mines around Dera Ghazi Khan, they still have Laki up north. True. But there are reports Laki is underproducing, too. As far as long-term planning for yellow cake reserves goes for Pakistan, the new sites around Dera Ghazi Khan are the future. If India takes them out, it'd be a major blow to their nuclear programs. Kurtzman wheeled over to join the two men. Not to mention dusting monsoon clouds with uranium. Weathers stared at the map a moment, putting things into perspective. If all this is true, we're saying the president flew over there to talk peace and is going to wind up getting caught in a crossfire. It's looking that way. And I don't need to remind you that both India and Pakistan have nuclear capacity. It's not likely to stop with one exchange. Mutually assured destruction. Not a pretty picture. Not at all. Provided the threats are legitimate. For starters, there's the timing. Out of nowhere, we have both India and Pakistan pointing fingers at each other, based on intel that both claim is fabricated. India is denying these strike plans in the Indus Valley? Yep. Raw and IB both claim it's all new to them, and the Prime Minister has assured the President no such plans are on the table. Again, you'd expect a denial from them. Normally, I'd be the first to agree with you. But let me throw the last bit of fat into the fire. The big feds signaled to Kurtzman, who'd brought along his remote keyboard. He clicked out a few commands, and, as he had the day before when accessing the President's vulnerability to a missile attack in Maldives, he overlaid the computer view of Rajasthan, with a shaded circle with a 500-mile radius. He adjusted the circle's placement until the aforementioned target sites in Pakistan fell within its uppermost crescent. Other cities located within the circle included Bombay, New Delhi, Jaisalmer, and two of India's valuable nuclear sites. Consider this. Suppose someone got their hands on a short-range launcher and decided to heave missiles at both Pakistan and India. Like that kid in the fairy tale who dropped nuts from a tree onto the heads of two giants and got them to kill each other. Because each thought the other had hit him first. Exactly. Weathers looked at Brognola and Kurtzman. We're talking about the Mujahideen, aren't we? We just got word from Stryker at Gawin Plateau. He and the guys had a close call that I'll get into later. But the bottom line is they figure the Kashmiris had that second missing saber system stored at the plateau as late as last night when Nisha was flown in from Kadiam after his jailbreak. And they've set up there on the Aravali mountain range? We don't know that for a fact. We've checked all aerial surveillance and haven't pinpointed anything looking like a launch site. We only speculated Aravali because it's the closest place they could have gotten to that would put them within striking distance of both Jaisalmer and the Indus Valley. Depending on what they've got hauling the launcher, they might have been able to cover more ground, in which case we have to consider this target area could be a little off. Wherever the hell Nesha plans to fire from, our theory is this. He's had his people plant these rumors about missile strikes to bait India and Pakistan into prepping for any option ranging from preemptive to retaliatory strikes. With everybody's finger close to the button, all he has to do is fire some sabers near Jaisalmer and the Indus, and he'll have both countries ready to go to the mat. Pakistan and India self-destruct, and Kashmir not only has its independence, it could also make a play to expand its borders while the dust is settling. 
This is worst possible scenario. To have things come to this is quite a stretch. You're probably right, but we can't afford to fiddle around and let Rome burn. Understood. Where do I fit in? The communiques that started this whole escalation. What we have to do is trace them back as best we can and hopefully prove that they were sent out from the same source. Some hacker working for Neshaw. I'd work on that presumption, yes. I've assembled most of the data already, and I'm making some headway with it. But I think you can cut through some of the codes quicker than I can, which will leave me more time to tend to any other fires that pop up. If we can come up with some kind of proof that Nesha planted these rumors trying to play Jack the Giant Killer, then we can go to India and Pakistan and tell them to back off any plans for full engagement should the Mujahideen get off a shot before we track them down. I'll certainly do the best I can. Good. I'm counting on you. Come on, I'll show you what we have so far. Hertzman led Weathers back to his station. Brognola, meanwhile, stared at the large screen a moment longer. He could only hope there wouldn't come a time when Kurtzman had to start calling up graphics, tallying body counts in what could well be the worst global bloodbath since World War II. Carmen Delahunt was unwrapping the last payday bar in her wholesaler's 20-pack when Brognola joined her. You're going to have peanuts sprouting out of your ears if you keep putting those away. I'm more worried about working them off at the gym before they go to my thighs. Once she'd finished the candy bar, she took off her glasses and pinched the bridge of her nose, stifling a yawn. When Akira comes back on, you're down for 40 winks. I'll make it an order if I have to. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to finish what I was doing while everything was still fresh in my mind, or what's left of it. I know this Briley woman's small potatoes compared to what's come up, but I managed to come up with a few new things on her. Good. And who knows, it could wind up being more important than you think. Especially if it turns out she's this woman they're looking for in that shooting in Bombay this morning. I sure hope so. Remember how we were speculating that she must have made some kind of connection before she moved from Vegas to Washington? She went from call girl to top dollar escort. You'll have to explain to me what the difference is sometime. But if it has anything to do with making more money, that's what happened. What about her benefactor? Della Hunt queued up a still photo, obviously taken from a casino surveillance camera. It showed a dealer passing out cards to four players at a blackjack table. Two of the players had their backs turned to the camera, but the other two, a man and woman sitting two chairs away, were clearly visible. Briley and Derry Nesha. In the flesh. It looks like she's the better player of the two. He went bust, drawing to twelve, when the dealer was showing three. She stayed on fourteen. This was called from footage at Caesar's Palace two and a half years ago, about a month before Briley split for Washington. How the hell did you get your hands on that? You asked me to dig deep. I dug deep. You're the best, Carmen. <laughs> Remember that when I hit you up for a Christmas bonus. This is all circumstantial, of course, but as you'll see here, they left together once Neshaw went through all his chips. She called up another photo, taken a few minutes later than the earlier shot. Briley had slipped her arm through Neshaw's and was laughing at something he'd said to her. I wonder how Neshaw managed to get to Vegas without throwing up any red flags. I don't have anything on that, but there are any number of ways. My guess is he used forged credentials and came in with a player's junket. They're usually all high rollers, so the casinos aren't likely to look too closely at anything but their bank rolls. They rake it in off these guys because once they start losing, they aren't going to hop back on the plane and fly halfway around the world back home. Monte Carlo's a lot closer than Vegas. Like I said, Neshaw's not much of a gambler. If you ask me, he takes Vegas over Monte Carlo because he's specifically recruiting somebody for Washington and figures he's better off going American. Or, to put it another way, Brenda Riley fits the profile of the kind of woman the target in Washington goes for. Della Hunt switched from her Vegas file to a gallery of photos she'd put together of Briley out on the Washington social circuit. She'd come up with 14 different shots covering the two-year period. In the first five photos, she was accompanied by the same man, a GQ-looking type in his mid-forties, who in all but one of the shots was wearing a different tailored Armani suit. He looks familiar. Name's Martin Gerard. He was with NSA for a few years, then came into some money and started up a think tank specializing in Eurasian socioeconomic studies. I sniffed through State Department records, and his passports stamped heavily on the side of South Asia. Pakistan and India. And Kashmir. If you're Nesha, here's a guy whose brain you'd like to pick. 
So he had Briley pick it for him. It fits. They were together on and off seven months. Time for a lot of pillow talk. You said Gerard was with NSA before he went private? Yep, seven years. What area? I think it was communications. Delahunt switched screens, highlighting the pre-think tank portion of Gerard's resume. Yeah, looks like mostly SIG Intel work. Encryption. What's that? Can you sidebar the Gerard material into a file transfer over to Hunt? I think he might be able to get something out of it. Not a problem, but let me finish first. There's more? Hey, I'm like those monsoons. When it rains, it pours. Rain away. It's the six-month gap between Washington and when Briley wound up in London. Turns out she made a little side trip to India, a place called Pune. Seems she'd done such a good job in Washington that Nesha had decided to indulge her. Della Hunt uploaded a video player on the computer and loaded a file into it. Look at this. Brognola eyed the monitor. Briley, dressed to look like a cross between Wonder Woman and a dominatrix, stood before a clapboard being held by a stagehand. Written on the chalkboard was a film title, Spy Lass, as well as the name of the film's director and producer. The latter name jumped out at Brognola. Abdul Jahan, the guy she winds up clubbing around with in London. The same. Apparently, Briley wanted to try her hand at acting and... Well, judge for yourself. Action! Daya Karo. On screen, Briley proceeded to deliver the worst example of bad acting Brognola had ever seen in painfully bad phonetic Hindi. He got the idea that she was supposed to be in the process of seducing someone, but she looked more as if she were flashing hand signals from the deck of a Coast Guard cruiser. Ouch. She's still better than Keanu Reeves. I guess I should be glad I don't know who that is. Yes, you should. Anyway, the film was only supposed to be a quickie. You know, one of those straight-to-video numbers, but it wound up taking six months. Because her acting was so bad? That, plus the fact she was sleeping with the producer. Jahan? The same. It turned up in the Indian cinema magazines. Jahan's a notorious womanizer, and he's got a reputation for taking his female stars a little more under his wing than most. Funny. I was under the impression Nesha was doing the same thing. I mean, why else would she have been in on his getaway from Cuttium? I can't help you on that one, Chief. Maybe Nesha was just an employer and didn't care about her personal life. Then why'd he bother playing Svengali and put her in the movies? I don't think I'm going to be able to find out the answer to that one in cyberspace either. Yeah, you're right. What happened with the movie? It's supposedly in post-production, but I'll bet you anything it winds up getting shelved indefinitely. This Jahan guy's already moved on to other projects. I've got him down with 18 different movies in the pipeline. 18. My favorite is Moon Over Mars. It's about a computer geek who invents a time tunnel and winds up on a lunar colony under attack by Martians. I'd bet you any money he kicks ass and gets the girl. You'd win. At this point, I'd love it if this whole showdown between India and Pakistan turned out to be just another of Jahan's harebrained fantasies. Wouldn't that be nice? Look, I figure I've got another few minutes to pull everything together. Then I'll run off a hard copy for you to look over while I catch those 40 winks. Brognola didn't respond. Della Hunt glanced up and saw him looking across the room at the main computer screen. How? Do me a favor, Carmen. Before you go on break, could you go over all the production info on the films Jahan's doing? It'll cost you a box of paydays. Done. What am I looking for? I want to know if Jahan's filming anywhere in Rajasthan. Bombay, India. Abdul, this is incredible. Abdul Jahan smiled modestly. My men just followed the designs and specifications you sent us. Along with the money. Please, I am a filmmaker. I never discuss money. That is why God created the accountant. <laughs> <laughs> They shared a familiar laugh as they circled the large, futuristic-looking space tank, taking up half the workspace. A crew of prop masters was busy putting on a few final touches, painting the tank's foam cannon a gunmetal blue, applying decals to give the impression that the weapon was part of India's moon colony arsenal in the year 2555, and adjusting the central hinges that allowed the would-be vehicle to be split in half for easy transport and reassembly on location. Although the tank was really little more than a shell of plastic and fiberglass, 
once mounted over a Humvee and filmed in the right light, it would pass for the difference between life and death for the colonists under assault by the deadly forces of Martian warmonger Zog-7. Or so Jahan had been led to believe. Paid the outrageous equivalent of eleven million dollars to be the hands-off producer of Moon Over Mars, Jahan's involvement in the film had been negligible. He'd laughed over the script, provided the props and costumes, and used his clout to secure the use of various film sites. Other than that, he'd turned a blind eye to the venture, figuring it was yet another mad whim of the man he knew as Kumar Bose, the supposed computer chip recluse who'd thrown away his money on Spylass. Meanwhile, he'd funneled his fee into projects closer to his heart. It never crossed his mind that Kumar Bose was an alias for Dari Nesha, and that the lunar space tank he'd built to such demanding specifications would be fitted over not a Hummer, but rather a Sabre missile launcher, presently concealed in the back of a semi bound for the film's location in the Tar Desert, twenty miles north of Jodhpur. You'll still be able to get this to us by this afternoon. Our first day of shooting is tomorrow, and we don't want to wind up behind schedule from the get-go. I've made all my deadlines so far, haven't I? For this film, yes. I'm still waiting to hear about a release date for Spy Lass. Jahan held his hands out in a gesture of resignation. What can I say? Sometimes great art must evolve at its own pace. <laughs> you are such a liar. That movie will never see the light of day, and we both know it. One never knows. Jahan eyed Briley intently. After arriving at the studio, she'd mentioned how drenched she was, and Jahan had suggested she shower in one of the changing rooms and help herself to something from wardrobe before their meeting. She'd chosen a low-cut red sequin cocktail dress with a slit skirt and black high heels, the only things that fit her, or so she'd claimed, with a fresh application of makeup and her damp hair pulled up in a knot skewered by long wooden pins, she looked like a high-priced hooker ready to hit the executive lounge at the nearest Hilton. She should know. To her own amazement, despite everything that was going on around her, ever since hearing Jahan's voice on the phone, Briley's one thought had been getting him alone and rekindling the passion between them. Derry wouldn't have to know. Perhaps we could negotiate a release date. What would Kumar have to say about that? I told you. He's been detained elsewhere. He won't be coming. How unfortunate. One man's misfortune is another's paradise. Briley reached out and dragged a fingernail across the producer's arm. Jahan, who'd gotten his start in the Indian film industry as a leading man, was still a handsome figure, with a well-sculpted physique he maintained through daily workouts with a personal trainer in a mini-gym, adjacent to his office on the top floor of the converted textile mill. Jahan took Briley's hand and kissed it. Let us finish our business first. Bastard. Briley reached into her cleavage and withdrew the next payment due to Jahan for his services. Um, it's a little wet, and I'm afraid it smells a little of fish. That's the way I like my checks. Jahan took the check and put it into an envelope he found lying on the nearby workbench. Besides, once the bank cashes it, it will smell like rupees. Briley smiled and glanced back at the prop tank. How do you plan to get that to the film site anyway? Cargo plane. I promise it will be on Jodhpur within the hour. Speaking of an hour, that's about how much free time I have on my hands. Goin Plateau. Jack Grimaldi snipped off the tip to the plug he'd used on the punctured tire and stepped back to admire his handiwork. The Gurkha thresher had withstood the brunt of the monsoon with minimal damage, and after transferring gas from the reserve fuel tank, Grimaldi figured they were good for a few hundred miles before needing a fill-up. Ready with that compressor? One way to find out. They'd found the unit among the Mujahideen's provisions in the caves, and though it had been partially submerged by the floodwaters, Kissinger had done a good job of drawing the spark plug. When he tugged the crank start, the compressor rattled noisily to life, startling a pair of vultures perched above the cockpit. They took to the air, heading out over the desert. Good riddance. Another minute of those ugly bastards sizing me up and I was going to let them have it. I had the same idea. Only I was thinking more along the lines of roasting one on a spit. I'm starving. 
There's some grub back in a cave that might still be edible. No, I don't eat anything I can't recognize. Bull, I've seen you scarf down your share of mystery meat back at the farm. Stew doesn't count. The compressor nozzle was a poor fit on the plain tire's stem, but enough air found its way in to slowly inflate the tire. Grimaldi spit on his finger and rubbed the plug, looking for bubbles. There weren't any. Hot damn. Now let's hope this sucker doesn't conk out before it finishes the job. I'm going to check the laptop and see if Aaron's gotten back to us. Go for it. Moments after Kissinger climbed inside the cockpit, Boland appeared, looking drained from his long climb up the side of the plateau. No luck? No. The birds led me to a couple of Mujahideen, but there's no trace of Maris. Seemed like a long shot. Yeah. Boland dropped tiredly to the ground and inspected his arm. He'd cleaned the bullet wound and dressed it with gauze from a first aid kit inside the thresher. It still hurt like hell, but there was no blood showing through the gauze, so he figured he'd get off with just another battle scar to add to all the others he'd collected over the years. Grimaldi finally shut down the compressor, then snapped the inflated tire with his fingertip. It sounded like a ripe watermelon. Music to my ears. Kissinger emerged from the cockpit, carrying the laptop. A couple of things. Hunt tracked down the origin point for that bogus first strike intel Aaron was talking about. That fast? Well, Carmen lent a hand. She turned up some ex-NSA guy in Washington that our girl Briley had her hooks into when she was working D.C. Some guy named Gerard. Turns out he was ground floor on the Orion Project and stationed here a few years figuring out code intercepts on both sides of the fence. What did Briley do? Blackmail him into going turncoat? He's not the one. Hunt honed in on SIG intel coming out of the cities Gerard was stationed at. Bingo. He finds out one of Gerard's old cronies is still working out of New Delhi. We're not sure how yet, but he managed to hack his way into both ISI and Raw's intercept systems. IB's on their way to take him in for questioning, but my guess is the Mujahideen fed him the bogus info when they were in Delhi rigging that car bomb. And he waited for their signal to plant it on the grapevine. Adds up that way to me. I say things got put on hold when Nesha wound up in the slammer. They decided to go with their Kadiam option first, and when that didn't pan out, it was on to plan B. Once they sprang Nesha and flew him here last night, it was all systems go. Got to hand it to our cyber guys. Once again, they earn their keep. As for where the Sabre might be right now, it's a long story, but they're going with the theory that the Mujahideen are using a film site in Rajasthan as a front for launching the missiles. A film site? Where'd they come up with that one? Like I said, it's a long story. Something about Briley and a film producer. That woman gets around. She sure does. We've got a report she might have killed some woman in a fishing village a few miles from the parade site in Bombay. Is Nesha with her? Don't know. Let's get back to this film site business. Do we have people moving in on that? They're trying to, but there's a problem. Gee, that's a first. This producer, I think his name is Jahan, has seven different movies filming in Rajasthan. And they're using a dozen different locations scattered all over the place. India sending out recon planes, and NSA has repositioned Orion sat cams so we can hopefully get a bird's eye once they bring the launcher out into view. Do we have enough fuel to get to any of these sites? Kissinger checked the computer. Closest ones to here are just outside Jodhpur in some backwater place called Pachpadra. Pachpadra is about 60 miles closer. Bolin thought it over and went with a hunch. Let's try Jodhpur. Bombay. From the Mahim train station, Derry Neshaw boarded a motorized trishaw for the short trip to Abdul Jahan's film production facility. This was one of Bombay's worst pockets of abject poverty, surpassed only by the squalid conditions a few blocks away. Should Neshaw manage to extend his sway as far south as Bombay, one of his first orders of business would be to rid the city of slums like this. He would have mass housing built across the water in New Bombay. Small homes, yes, but with plumbing and electricity. And if the people were reluctant to move, he would force them, for their own good. And then he would level the whole area here, burning everything in sight to the ground if he had to, so that they could start from scratch, this time using some sort of enforced planning. People would be made to understand that they could not just swarm in like rats and make nests out of trash anywhere they pleased. Yes, they might resist at first, and perhaps he would have to initially rule with an iron hand. But Nesha was certain that once he'd rehabilitated the people, made them less willing to accept conditions like this, Bombay would be the better for it. Less than ten blocks away, 
Neshaw came upon just the sort of new community he was thinking about. The refurbished textile mill that housed Jahan Filmworks was surrounded on all sides by landscaped gardens and a ring of clean, modest apartments, each complex in turn having its own plot of land where children could play and tenants could grow crops. It hadn't always been like that. Ten years ago, the mill had been surrounded by the same squalor as everywhere else in the area. But during the 1993 riots, when thousands died and the city burned in skirmishes between Hindus and Muslims, the slums had been reduced to smoldering rubble. Abdul Jahan bought the land, creating this island of new development. There were those who said Jahan had taken advantage of the riots and had the land torched by the same organized crime bosses who'd financed most of his early films. Jahan denied it, of course, but Neshaw suspected otherwise and had admired the Hindus' resourcefulness. Figuring the producer was a kindred spirit and potential ally, Neshaw had arranged a meeting with Jahan several years ago, introducing himself as Kumar Bose and asking to invest in one of the man's next films. A friendship of sorts had been formed, and in exchange for continued funding, Neshaw had been granted a number of favors, most notably Briley's would-be film debut in Spylast. And, of course, now Jahan had been duped into providing a needed pretense that would allow the Mujahideen to set up a Sabre missile launcher in Rajasthan, and, if all went well, trigger an outbreak of war between Pakistan and India. When he reached the main entrance to the filmworks, Neshaw, now wearing the plain white shirt and tan slacks that was his uniform of sorts while posing as Kumar Bose, presented a forged business card and said he wished to speak to Jahan. As he'd hoped, he was admitted without being searched and having to explain the Taisho pistol concealed in his fanny pack. The main lobby was large, the floor laid with marble, skylights allowing bright light to shine down on the walls, where posters from all of Jahan's films were prominently displayed, framed in gold, with small signs boasting the impressive box office numbers for each release. Nesha went to the receptionist's desk and introduced himself, again as Bose, saying he wanted to belatedly join the meeting his female associate was having with Abdul. I'm not sure where they are right now. Let me check for you. Thank you. Nesha walked away from the desk and pretended to admire one of the posters. Beneath his pleasant facade, however, Neshaw was concerned, agitated. The boatman, who was supposed to have brought Briley here from Naraman Point, had reported that he'd been unable to find her when he showed up after the monsoon. He'd assumed she'd ducked out of the rain and waited on shore for her, only to learn there had been a shooting not long before his arrival, during which a female Kohli fishmonger had been shot to death by a white woman, who'd subsequently fled the scene. Neshaw had learned all this while at the safe house with Pengachili, plotting an attack on the funeral parade for Zarat Wall. He'd promptly called the studio and had been told that Briley had indeed shown up for the meeting and was currently with Shahan. When he'd asked to speak to Briley, they had paged her, but for some reason neither she nor Jahan had responded. The operator had suggested that perhaps Briley and Jahan were out touring the back lot. Neshaw, however, had other suspicions— He'd quickly finalized plans with Sheely, then had given the man a grateful embrace and sent him on his way, so that he could change and come directly to the studio. Neshaw glanced back at the receptionist. She smiled at him, phone to ear. Still trying. Neshaw nodded, but his patience was wearing thin. He took a cigarette from his fanny pack and blew smoke as he paced the lobby. When the twin doors leading to the ground floor production facilities opened, he turned and saw workmen wheeling out a large cart filled with old props and a mobile wardrobe rack filled with costumes. A man in a snug-fitting suit was supervising the activity, while at the same time talking with a reporter who frantically scribbled notes. From what Nesha could pick up of their conversation, the items were on their way to a charity auction for victims of the latest cholera epidemic north of the city. As the workers headed out of the building to bring up a truck, the supervisor led the reporter across the lobby, where he pointed out several of the movie posters featuring some of the props and costumes that would be in the auction. Nesha glanced at the abandoned cart. Something caught his eye. He casually walked over and picked up a set of steel claws. Nesha was admiring the craftsmanship that had gone into the making of the claws when the supervisor came up behind him. Mr. Bose, what a pleasure. Nesha smiled and shook the man's hand then drew his attention to the claws. 
How much for these? The auctioning was to start at 20,000 rupees. But of course, if you would like them, they are yours for the taking. Nonsense. Neshaw went to his pockets and withdrew a money clip. He peeled off bills worth 30,000 rupees and handed them to the other man. For a good cause, Neshaw exchanged pleasantries with the supervisor until the workers returned. Then he excused himself, placing the claws in his fanny pack as he approached the desk again. I'm sorry, but I can't seem to reach them. Perhaps they left for lunch through the back way. I see. Perhaps while I'm waiting I could have a look at some of the sets. I won't be a bother. The receptionist handed Neshaw a visitor's tag and pointed out the doors behind her. Of course. You know where they are. I'll keep trying to reach Mr. Jahan. Thank you. He passed through the doors. It was like passing into another world. In contrast to the quietude of the lobby, the production hallways were abuzz with activity. The sound stages were all the way down the corridor, but Neshaw had no real interest in looking at movie sets. He had other business on his mind. He milled around an alcove lined with vending machines, waiting for a moment when no one was looking. Then, with purposeful strides, he crossed the hall and entered a little-used stairwell. Up the steps he climbed, making his way to Abdul Jahan's office on the top floor. Sated, their passion spent, Briley and Jahan lay entwined on the couch across from his desk. Briley stroked the hair on Jahan's chest and smiled. <sighs> I'm curious. How many women have you had on this couch? None that rival you. <laughs> Always the silver-tongued devil. You will notice I haven't asked how many men you've been with since we were last together. Briley nuzzled her lips against Jahan's ear. None that rival you. Jahan glanced at his Rolex watch. Son of a bitch! My helicopter. Prompt as ever, damn them. Where are you going? Jahan gently untangled himself from Briley's embrace and reached for his slacks. I need to check on this site for a film we're doing near Tanay Creek. And after that, I have to attend a charity auction. I want to see how much your outfit from Spylast will fetch. A costume from a movie no one has seen? Not much, I'd think. Ah, but can you imagine how many housewives will thrill at the thought of greeting their lovers dressed like that? Though, of course... No one could possibly fill it out as well as you. <laughs> it's getting awfully thick in here. Briley grabbed her dress and undergarments off the floor. When do you think we'll see each other again? That depends. As long as you're on Kumar's leash, I think it will be difficult. He doesn't own me. So you say. We are involved on a lot of projects together at the moment. When that is over, I will be more able to come and go as I please. You'll see. Jahan slipped his feet into his sandals and finished buttoning his shirt, then moved close, running his hand along Briley's bare shoulder. I'll count the days hungrily, but in the meantime, my empire awaits me. They kissed briefly. Then Jahan gathered his things and pressed a button next to a dumbwaiter, dating back to the building's textile days. Jahan had had the interior enlarged and fitted with a tooled leather bench so that he could sit in comfort as he was whisked up to the heliport or down to the production facilities. He ducked into the opening and winked back at Briley as the doors closed. We all have our empires waiting for us. Briley finished dressing. She was stepping into her pumps when she heard a knock at the door. Thinking it must be one of Jahan's assistants, she threw the door open to tell them they'd just missed him. Instead... She found Nesha standing in the doorway. Derry! Hello, my love. I see you managed to make it here on your own? Yes. Yes, I did. Her mind raced. How long had he been standing outside the door? How could she keep him from coming in? The couch was disheveled. He would know. Gathering her wits, she stepped forward and kissed him. I'm so glad you made it. How did it go with Pengat? Well enough. Let me just get my purse and we can go. I'm in no hurry. Nesha gently pulled her arm away from him and strode past her into the office. There was nothing Briley could do to stop him. Where is Abdul? Briley glanced up at the ceiling. She could still hear the helicopter idling on the roof. Uh, he was called away. You know, Abdul, there's always some crisis to attend to. I was just on my way out. Abdul is a busy man. Briley saw that he was staring at her dress. I had to change when I got here. 
The boat never came, and I was caught in the monsoon on the way to the train station. A nice choice. Very uh, fetching. It was all they had available. One of the straps is tangled. Oh, you're right, it is. She straightened the strap. Her hand was trembling. How did you like the fishing village? Quaint, yes? I guess that's one way of putting it. And the people there, very friendly. Briley stared at Neshaw. You heard. Heard what, my love? The shooting. I was attacked by a group of women. One of them had a knife. That's not the way they're telling it. It's the truth. The way they're telling it around the village. The woman was shot for no reason. Or perhaps it was because she was one of the unwashed masses. I know how much they repel you. It wasn't like that. I'm telling you, I was attacked. They threw water on me, tried to steal my purse. And the woman with the knife... Fine. If that's what you want me to believe, I will. Why would I lie to you? (laughs) You're right, of course. You being such a woman of your word, I have no right to be suspicious. Forgive me, please. Why are you acting like this? I don't understand. You know what I mean. The way you're accusing me. I haven't accused you of anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nesha went over to the couch, humming to himself as he straightened the cushions. You would think a man like Abdul would keep his office presentable, or at least have someone to do it for him. He was napping when I arrived. He said he was up all night making sure the tank was ready for delivery on schedule. And? He's having it flown out to Jodhpur. It may already be there. Very nice. I'm starving. My stomach's settled. Why don't you take me out to lunch and let me try some of those foods you were showing me at the beach? Nesha glanced around the office filled with film memorabilia and a few objets d'art. He picked up a large ceramic vase resting on its own stand under a fixed ceiling light. It was a present from Nesha to Jahan, a token of appreciation prior to the first day of shooting for Spylass. Nesha had bought it at an art gallery down the block from Shore Bazaar. He couldn't remember the price, but he remembered it was roughly the same as he'd paid for the Bentley Briley had at her disposal to use while she was in London. Nesha looked at it briefly then turned to Briley. When he saw that he had her attention, he held the vase out, then let go of it. Why did you do that? I never claimed to own you, and I wasn't aware that I kept you on a leash. I was more than happy to look the other way when you were with other men. I understand you have your needs. All I asked was that it be with strangers, men whose eyes I would not have to look into afterward. A simple request, easy enough to honor. I can explain. But Abdul... Abdul is another matter. We are friends. I do not care to look into the eyes of my friends and know they have been with my woman. That is crossing the line. Uh, It wasn't anything like that. You have to believe me. Believe you? What is that saying you Americans have? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Derry, listen to me. He forced himself on me. He lured me up here and then he... I heard laughter between you. Laughter. Laughter. Laughter and talk about when you could do it again. Forced himself on you? I don't think so. Please, Terry, g- give me a chance. Dirt! <laughs> That's what you are to me, dirt! And to think that I cared for you! He turned his back to her and strode to the window overlooking the back lot. Briley stared at him, shaking. She had seen Derry angry before, but nothing like this. She knew there were many things he couldn't tolerate, and above all the others, he couldn't tolerate betrayal. Briley glanced down at her purse. The Derringer, she thought. If she used the Derringer on him, she could flee to the roof. The helicopter was still there. She could throw herself at Abdul's mercy. Briley? She glanced up. Nesha was still looking out the window. Do you love me? Briley was taken aback. She didn't know what to say. She fumbled with her purse. Do you? Briley's hand slipped inside the purse, fingers closing around the small gun. Yes. I've been trying to tell you that. Then perhaps we can work things out. I'd like that. Come here. Let me hold you. Briley hesitated, then stepped toward Nesha, keeping her hand inside the purse, Derringer at the ready. With her other hand, she reached out and tenderly touched the back of Nesha's neck. The tension seemed to go out of his back. He started to turn toward her. I'm so sorry I hurt you. Nesha faced her. His expression seemed tranquil. He was doing his best to smile. It's all right. I know it won't happen again. Briley nodded, relieved. She let go of the Derringer and drew her arms around Nesha. Maybe they would get through this after all. Oh, I promise. They kissed. 
Then Neshaw drew her closer into his embrace. Briley looked over his shoulder and saw her reflection in the window glass. She hadn't realized how badly her lipstick was smeared from her time with Abdul. She was reaching up to wipe a smudge from her cheek when she felt a sudden burning stabbing sensation in her sides. She tried to pull away from Neshaw, but he continued to hold her close. The pain increased and it became difficult for her to breathe. Finally, she felt herself getting dizzy and lightheaded. Her legs gave out beneath her, and she sagged against Nesha. I will hear no more lies from you. Never again. Nesha eased his grip on Briley. She fell away from him, blood coursing down her legs, her dress clinging to her in tatters. As her life drained away, the last thing she saw were Nesha's hands dangling above her, blood dripping from the razor-sharp talons that encased his fingers. On the roof, Abdul Jahan was attempting to take a call on his cell phone. Yes, I know. I have no idea what it's about, but I certainly aim to find out. Keep it running. I'll be right back. The heliport straddled two ridges of the textile mill's roof, which was made up of glass triangles to better let light into the upper floors, where Jahan's production staff had their offices. The elevator shaft for his private dumbwaiter rose up like a chimney next to the heliport. But before he climbed in, he put through a hurried call to his production manager. Look, I don't know what's going on out there, but we've got military planes and helicopters flying all over the place above our sites in Rajasthan. They're making so much noise we can't film. Why Rajasthan? I just told you, I don't know. I've been trying to get off the ground to Tane Creek, but my phone won't stop ringing. And it's not just aircraft. We've got troops roaming around in the set in Sikan, turning everything topsy-turvy. What are they looking for? Are you deaf? I don't have answers. Answers are what I'm looking for. I want you to get on the phone and start making calls. Get the film commissioner first. And if that doesn't work, try the military or whatever else you have to. Every hour that goes by with our cameraman standing by picking their noses is money out of our pockets. You'll be at an Nate Creek if I come up with anything? Yes. I forgot the shooting script back at my office. But once I pick it up, we'll be on our way. I'll start looking into matters immediately, sir. Sooner than that. If there are any more cost overruns on this production, the money will be coming out of your pocket. As Jahan got into the dumbwaiter, he deliberated whether to call the Prime Minister. He had the man's private number, but given the funeral parade and the visit by the American president, Jahan doubted it would be a good time, even if he managed to get through. Why did this have to happen to him? Five minutes ago, he'd been feeling on top of the world, five minutes after being on top of Briley, and he'd hoped to at least be able to savor the moment. But no, he had to deal with the military harassing his film sites. Were they trying to disrupt things so he'd have to pay them off to get out of his way? He wouldn't put it past them. The only thing in India more corrupt than the politicians were the generals. Bribes for this, bribes for that. Who needed it? When the dumbwaiter's doors opened and he stepped into his office, Abdul Jahan was suddenly no longer concerned about graft and disrupted filming schedules. The first sense he had that something was terribly amiss was the sight of his prize vase lying in shards on the floor. What the devil? He scrambled out of the dumbwaiter, then crouched over the broken pieces and tried to put two of them together. He quickly realized it was a hopeless task. The vase was ruined. What had happened? Had Briley taken offense to something he'd said and thrown one of her tantrums? If so, he'd have to teach her a little more respect. Or maybe it was vibration from the heliport. Looking up, he could see the ceiling fan shaking slightly. He would have to tend to that. He was still glancing upward when he detected movement out of the corner of his eye. <gasps> Ten yards away, before the window, Nesha, the man he knew as Kumar Bose, was hunched over Briley. Or at least Jahan thought it was Briley. There was so much blood it was hard to tell. When Nesha glanced up at him, Jahan shrank back in horror. All around his mouth, Nesha's face was smeared with blood, and when he raised his arms, Jahan saw that he was wearing the metallic claws from Ghost of Shivaji. They dripped not only with blood, but also entrails. Fighting back a wave of nausea, Jahan staggered toward his desk, reaching for the intercom. Before he could get to it, however, Nesha was upon him, his right arm a sweeping blur. The weapon ripped into Jahan's arm with so much force that his hand was nearly severed from his wrist. With his other hand, Nesha took a swipe at Jahan's face, shredding it in five different places and taking out one of his eyes. 
He fell back onto the couch. Let us see how attractive the women find you now, Abdul. Let us see how many of them will want to come lie beside you when you look like this. Jahan was barely alive, in no position to defend himself. But Neshaw wasn't finished. He raised his talons one last time, then buried them in the filmmaker's groin. There he left them, unstrapping them from his fingers and pulling his hands away. Neshaw looked back and forth at his two victims for a moment, then he moved swiftly to the dumbwaiter. He climbed in and pressed for it to go up. By the time he reached the heliport, he had his pistol out. He aimed it at the pilot as he climbed into the passenger seat of the chopper. Take it up! The sight of the gun and Neshaw's bloody countenance was all the convincing the pilot needed. He jockeyed the controls and lifted the chopper up into the air. Staring out his window, Neshaw saw a handful of military jeeps pulling into the back lot. Soldiers poured out and began to rush toward the building. But Neshaw reflected triumphantly, they would be too late. Where are we going? Good job, but... Bombay. Pengat Shili knew the reason they had chosen Marine Drive for the parade route. To have sent the President and Prime Minister through the middle of the city would have subjected them to potential assassins on both sides of whichever street they traveled down. By contrast, from Naraman Point to Malabar Hill, Marine Drive, for the most part, hugged the shoreline of Back Bay, cutting in two the land area that security forces would have to watch over. Granted, there were people on the beach, but there were far fewer than the tens of thousands who crammed the other side of the street. Also, those on the beach were out in the open and easy to monitor, especially from the air or out in the dozen or more military boats moored in the bay. On the beach, there were no multi-story buildings, rooftops or towers to provide cover for lurking snipers. And yet, it was at Chowpati Beach that Shili and ten of his fellow Mujahideen planned to stage their attack on the caravan as it passed by en route to the Towers of Silence. Getting there hadn't been easy. There had been checkpoints where anyone wishing to view the parade from the beach had been walked through metal detectors and, if deemed necessary, first for weapons. Shili and the others had outwitted the authorities using the same ploy by which Najib Wall had created a diversion during the early stages of the siege in Katyam. They had paid children to throw firecrackers on the ground 20 yards away from several of the checkpoints. And during the ensuing chaos, which in nearly every case drew soldiers and inspectors away from their posts, the Mujahideen, dressed in the ragamuffin attire of street performers, had slipped past the metal detectors and quickly disappeared into the throngs already cleared to go to the beach. The ploy's success had been particularly gratifying to Shili as it would mean Najib Wall had provided an unwitting assist to his own execution, as well as that of his beloved Prime Minister and the American President. As they crossed Marine Drive, each of the men had strategically dropped what most certainly would pass for an innocent wad of chewing gum. The pliant substance, however, wasn't gum at all, but rather high-grade C5 plastique, each piece embedded with a remote detonation sensor no larger than a thumbtack. Separately, the charges, when activated, would give off only the weakest explosions, capable at best of crippling anyone walking nearby or disabling the drivetrain of any vehicle passing over it. Triggered simultaneously, the explosives would not only do considerably more damage, but they would also force the parade to an abrupt halt, making each vehicle a stationary rather than moving target for the follow-up barrage, which the men would be launching from the beach. As the fanfare of a marching band announced the beginning of the parade, five of the Kashmiris spread out among the other celebrants, each of them carrying with them Chinese-manufactured F-44 spigot mortars. No larger than coffee cups, the mortars encased in shield cowls could be pulled out and readied for firing in a matter of seconds, and each came equipped with focal lenses, viewing apertures, and calibrated adjustment arcs to ensure accuracy far greater than one would expect from so small a weapon. The shells they fired were filled with both explosives and frag scraps that, within a 10-yard radius, would likely maim anyone they didn't kill outright. As for Shili and the others, they took up their positions around the catapult Neshaw had watched heave children into the bay earlier that morning. When he'd spoken with the children who'd come to him begging for donations, Neshaw had paid them 10,000 rupees, a week's wages for their entire family, to let some of his friends come by later to use the catapult. For some tricks, he told them. Now that they were here, Shili had paid the family the same sum to remain nearby during their performance. 
the better to give the impression that the Mujahideen were part of an extended family, thereby decreasing the chance they would draw scrutiny from the shore police and security forces out in the bay. The family was more than happy to play along. After all, most of the effigies of Ganesh had either already sunk out in the bay or had been claimed by souvenir hunters, not to mention the fact that everyone was now more interested in the parade than sideshow theatrics. Be that as it may, Sheely felt it was important that he and his men maintain their cover as street performers, and so perform he did. It had been years since he had done most of the routines that had made the Sheely brothers a crowd favorite back home in Kashmir, but the instincts were still there, and as long as he didn't get carried away, he knew he could competently pass himself off as a practicing gymnast and acrobat. He juggled, did handstands, and with his fellow Mujahideen holding a thick rope taut between them, he even got up and did the easier portions of his old high wire rack, balancing himself as he walked, lay, and even danced five feet above the sand. He performed in tribute to his slain brothers, Ragabir and Bargadrum. Perhaps, he thought, he could earn their forgiveness if, in carrying on in their behalf, he could use the ways of the circus to meet the ends of the Mujahideen. All the while Sheely was performing, two of the other Kashmiris gradually turned the catapult so that it was aimed at the street rather than the bay, all the while laughing and gesturing at the children, as if to show them that they could climb up on the apparatus to get a better view of the parade when it came by. Though they drew a few curious stares from the shore police, the authorities had been given no reason to suspect foul play was in the making, and they left the Mujahideen alone. It took the parade nearly 20 minutes to wend its way around the bay. The funeral music of the marching band grew louder and closer, as did the cheering of the crowd. All along the beach, people moved away from the water, elbowing one another as they vied for a view of the street. The five Mujahideen, with the spigot mortars, stayed toward the rear of the crowd. At the right moment, they would take several steps back so that no one was near them. Then, once they detonated the plastic in the street and the parade was brought to a halt, they estimated they'd have 10, maybe 15 seconds to break out the mortars, line up their sights and fire. They knew it was possible some of them would be spotted, even gunned down before they could launch their volleys. But if even two of them managed to get off a decent shot, it could likely be enough. Besides, there was still a larger payload likely to be added to their assault the one Pengat Shili himself would deliver by way of the catapult. Under any other circumstances, Najib Wall most likely would have been as excited as he was proud to be there, riding in the same open-air car as the Prime Minister and the President of the United States, the eyes of a hundred thousand of his fellow Indians upon him, their cheers honoring the man who lay in the hearse before him, Uncle Zerat. But Najib felt removed from it all, almost as if he were outside himself, watching from a distance. It all seemed unreal to him. All this celebration, this sense that India was congratulating itself for having triumphed over Kashmiri insurgency. If these people only knew the real situation, that as they gawked and waved and shouted their rallying cries and sang their praises, the surviving Mujahideen were out there, still conspiring, perhaps even on the verge of wreaking far greater chaos than they would have if they'd succeeded in Katyam. How could the president and prime minister sit back there, acknowledging the crowd while trying to maintain the solemnity of the occasion, knowing that they were deliberately misleading everyone, playing along with the popular delusion that the cause of Kashmiri separatism had been squashed, leaving one less obstacle on the road to peace in South Asia? that they justified the facade in the name of maintaining order wasn't enough for Wall. Better to be up front, he thought, to err on the other side of caution. To him, the risk posed by the surviving Mujahideen was far greater than the notion that the truth would lead to a widespread panic. This was India, after all, the land of Bindas, the ability to shrug off misfortune and move on with one's life. Muslims and Hindus might go for each other's throats in a heated moment, but run screaming into the streets at the thought of terrorists striking close to home? He didn't think so. The street suddenly erupted in a series of small explosions. Just as quickly, the world around him began to move as if in slow motion, and he was able to take in a dozen things at once. Two members of the marching band pitching sideways to the ground, instruments flying from their hands, chunks of asphalt leaping from the street into the crowd, 
horrified faces, mouths hanging open in terror. His car and the hearse in front of him slowing to a stop. Armed soldiers and secret service agents drawing their weapons and looking in all directions, trying to figure out what was happening. The next thing he knew, Wall was on his feet, scrambling over his seat into the back of the convertible. The president and prime minister both looked numb, incredulous. Get down! At his urging, they bent over and he laid himself across them. Within seconds, three others, two Secret Service and one IB field agent, were on top of him, creating a human shield over the two leaders. Oh, what's happening? Wall heard the president cry out beneath him. It wasn't a question so much as a mantra, the only words the man could spit out in his state of shock. What's happening? By the time the Mujahideen had triggered the first explosions on Marine Drive, the children had climbed down from the catapult and run into the crowd, more interested in getting close to the parade route than being able to see it. In their place, Pengat Shili had climbed up onto the end of the swing arm. With him, he had taken a flat packet the size of a seat cushion, divided by five different elongated pockets. At various times during his performances, the other Mujahideen had carefully removed strips of C5 plastique strapped to their shins and fit them into the pockets, readying a combined charge that would pack more explosive force than all of the other charges and mortar shells combined. Derry Neshaw's plan had been to have the packet folded into a ball and hurled by catapult in the direction of the convertible carrying the president and prime minister. His feeling had been that God would help guide the bomb to its mark. At the time, Shili had agreed that it was a good plan, but secretly he'd decided that God might appreciate a helping hand. Now as Bedlam reigned over the parade in the wake of the smaller blasts, Shili was ready to deal the decisive blow. He'd already discussed with his men in detail how it was to go down. Two of them would hold the catapult secure, while another two ratcheted back the swing arm with him perched on the cradle. Then on his signal, the catapult would be sprung. Back in Kashmir, Pengat Shili had been known as the human artillery, thanks to a routine in which he was shot through the air from a modified cannon, landing in a large circus net. This, he figured, was no different. Once propelled through the air, clutching the makeshift bomb to his chest, he felt he could time the release and even direct its fall, so that as he passed over the parade, he could increase the chances that the president and prime minister, and hopefully the nephew of his brother's slayer, would bear the brunt of the explosion. If need be, Shili was prepared to keep a hold on the plastique and like a Japanese kamikaze, plummet with it toward the leader's vehicle. It would be a glorious day, and afterward he would rejoin his brothers in the other world, and they would have a good laugh over the whole thing. He prepared to give the signal. Shili looked over his shoulder and saw that the shore police had drawn their weapons and fired at the Mujahideen who had yet to unleash their mortar rounds. Two of them dropped to the sand, mortars tumbling to the ground beside them. Another whirled and aimed his mortar at the police, getting off a shot even as bullets were ripping through him. His shell flew wide of the mark, landing in the shallow water of the bay. In panic, Sheely turned to the men surrounding the catapult. No! No! As planned, the catapult was held secure while he was lowered into firing position. Police in a boat in the harbor were firing on them. He grimaced as he felt a slug rip into his leg. Around him, the other four Mujahideen fared even worse, all taking direct hits, not only from the boat, but also the shore police, who now had joined in the fusillade. Desperate to carry out his mission, Shili twisted about in the cradle and tried to reach the catapult's trigger on his own. In doing so, however, he leaned his chest against the framework, nudging the detonator switch to the bomb pack. They were taking down the command post near the Towers of Silence so that they could move the men closer to Chowpatty Beach to sort through the carnage. The toll so far was 46 dead, including the 10 Mujahideen killed on the beach. Injuries ran in the thousands, mostly shrapnel wounds. Marine Drive was closed off and additional troops had been called in to cordon off the parade route while bomb squads scoured for undetonated explosives. The crowd had been dispersed, with Kamala Nehru Park set up as a way station for those who'd been separated from loved ones during the course of the mayhem. As for Derry Neshaw, the word was that he had been nearly captured at Abdul Jahan's film studio after slaying both Jahan and the woman who'd aided in his escape from Khatyam. It was presumed he was on his way to rendezvous with whatever of his force remained with the second Sabre missile launcher. On that front, 
inspections at several film sites in Rajasthan had turned up nothing. The search was still on. Najzi Bual was within hearing distance of the command post, but he had tuned out the updates. His focus was on the nearest tower, where his uncle's deposition had been carried out only a few moments before. Now the pavilion was empty, as were most of the folding chairs set out in the adjacent park. With all that had happened, attending Zirat Wall's service had become a low priority for most and deemed a security risk for the president and prime minister, who had been put aboard one of the surveillance helicopters and spirited away to safer ground. Their planned eulogies would no doubt be delivered later, far from the Towers of Silence. Not that Wall minded. His uncle, after all, had been a very private man and would probably have disapproved of all the attention. This way was fine. A favorite nephew bidding farewell to his favorite uncle. Nice and simple. For the ceremony, Wall had brought along two items, both from the Academy and Katyam. He stared at them thoughtfully. The portrait of Zerat Wall in his military regalia after the liberation of Bangladesh, and the painting of him sitting beside his young nephew, who all those years ago looked out at the world with an eager confidence. The sound of flapping wings drew Wall's attention from the portraits to the clear blue sky above the tower. The vultures were on their way. To Wall, they looked small. Tar Desert, north of Jodhpur. From the moment orders had gone out to begin searching Abdul Jahan's film sites in Rajasthan, the maddening shell game had been at the mercy of the weather. For all their sophistication, the Orion spy satellite and India's various orbiting UAVs were of limited use when it came to peering through monsoons. Similarly, a collaborative field force made up of the Indian military, IB, CIA, Secret Service, and Rajasthan National Guard had given deference to the storm in determining which sites they would search first. They'd begun in the eastern part of the state, ahead of the storm, coming up empty at four different sites. To the west, another contingent had hunkered down as the torrents passed overhead. The Mujahideen, meanwhile, had found the monsoon to be their saving grace, as the staging locale for Moon over Mars was located mid-state, and other than aerial surveillance by recon planes, the authorities had yet to take their ground search to Jodhpur. Twenty miles north of the former capital, a five-acre tract of the Tar Desert had been converted to a lunar landscape, mostly by way of prefab whirlpool tubs embedded in the sand, then partially filled with sand and layered with taupe plaster until they could pass for moon craters. A Quonset hut was dressed up to pass for the main base of the moon colony, and the colonists' main form of ground transportation were low-slung, unarmed desert patrol vehicles, painted the same metallic silver as the hut. The DPVs were bought at a military auction, along with the handful of rust-colored U.S. LVTP-7 amphibious tractors representing the formidable Martian invasion force. As was common in movie-making, scenes were scheduled to be filmed out of sequence, and the first day's footage would actually appear at the end of the picture, given, of course, the mistaken assumption that the Mujahideen had any interest in adhering to the dummy production schedule once they'd used the site to mask their release of the Sabre warheads. There were nearly 60 extras on the set, suited up as warring factions. It was easy enough to tell who was who. The Martians wore crimson-dyed, geely sniper suits, jackets and helmets covered with tattered material, so that they looked like a cross between mountain yaks and devils with dreadlocks. Opposing them were the noble colonists, sweltering inside their surplus World War II SOE jumpsuits. There'd been a problem getting the silver spray paint to stick to the fabric of both the suits and helmets, and through the camera viewfinders, it looked as if their outfits were made of aluminum foil. Of the sixty men, less than half were Mujahideen. The rest were bona fide extras, plucked from the streets of Jodhpur during an impromptu casting call, during which prospective actors were briefly interviewed to weed out anyone of passing intelligence. The Mujahideen wanted dullards, men who wouldn't ask too many questions as they were moved around the sand like chess pieces to give the impression a battle scene was being choreographed for cinematic posterity. The extras may have been simpletons, but they understood the concept of flash flood, and there were grumblings as they glanced nervously westward at the black clouds crossing the desert toward them. How long would the filming take, they wondered. Would they be taken to high ground once the storm hit? Did they get paid extra for working under bad weather conditions? Bawan, the top-ranking Mujahideen at the site, quickly took control of the situation. 
he picked out the extra who was doing the most complaining, paid him the agreed-upon fee for his services, then told him to take off his outfit and go home. Since it was twenty miles back to Jodhpur, the man had a sudden change of heart and decided perhaps he would stick around for the shooting after all. The others fell in line, and the mutiny was quickly quelled. Six minutes later, an Antonov AN-12 cargo plane dropped below the cloud line and came to a landing on a flat stretch of desert adjacent to the film site. Stenciled on the rear tail fin was a large J in the shape of a flexing bicep, the logo for Jahan Filmworks. The Antonov, a one-time Aeroflot workhorse, had an upswept tail to accommodate its rear-loading ramp, and by the time the Mujahideen posing as prop masters reached the plane, the cargo crew was already unloading the fanciful shell for the colonists' war tank. They'd gone ahead and affixed the shell to a Humvee, allowing them to drive it down the ramp. Behind the tank was a late-model Dodge Ram pickup, its rear bed stacked with smaller clip-on attachments designed to give a futuristic look to a range of 50 caliber and 7.62 millimeter machine guns. While Bawan was signing off on the delivery, the cargo foreman asked if it would be possible for his crew to stick around and watch some of the filming. Bawan's first reaction was to tell the man that wasn't possible, because the plane would be in the way of some of the shots. But when he glanced up the ramp and saw that there was room inside for all his men, he decided the Antonov might be a more useful and less conspicuous escape vehicle than the Aerospace Line's guppy that was doubling as the Martian warship. Bawan made a deal with the cargo carriers. They could watch the filming for a few minutes, provided they would then board their craft and have it ready to take off at a moment's notice, in case the monsoon hit. The cargo foreman glanced back at the storm front and figured that gave them a good half hour. Bawan indicated an area they could watch from without getting in anyone's way, then headed off to assist in the delivery of the new props. Incidentally, under no circumstances are you allowed anywhere near the white tent. It is the star's quarters, and you do not care to be disturbed while they are preparing their roles. The cargo foreman nodded and promised his men would keep their distance. There was room in the back of the pickup for Bawan. He climbed aboard and signaled for the driver to circle around the costumed Hummer and lead the way to the tent. On the way, he checked his watch. Half an hour was cutting it close. They would have to work fast. The tent, flapping in the wind, was large, covering 5,000 square feet. Backed up to one of the side panels was an eight-wheel truck with the Jahan logo emblazoned on its side. Bawan directed the Dodge around to the other side, where two more Mujahideen held open flaps to create an opening for both the pickup and Hummer. Inside the tent, there were neither film stars nor any of the amenities they would have likely demanded for having to endure the discomfort of desert filming. Instead, there were three wooden crates, one packed with M60 machine guns, another with shorter-barreled 50 caliber weapons. The third crate, by far the longest, contained four Sabre surface-to-air missiles. The Kashmiris who'd opened the tent fold quickly returned to their task, taking machine guns from the crates and affixing them to their mounts on one of the desert patrol vehicles. Once the attachments were clamped over them, the guns would, like the DPV, look like space props. Hopefully there would be time to bring the other vehicles in for retrofitting before it was time to launch the missiles. Bawan climbed out of the pickup and dropped the tailgate, then crossed over to where the missile launcher was being eased down a loading ramp from the rear of the eight-wheeler. Quickly! We have only 20 minutes to disguise the launcher and load it! The firing is to begin at 1,500 hours sharp! Bawan lent a hand helping to unfasten the tank casing from the Humvee. He and the others were carrying the shell over to the rocket launcher when they heard over the flapping of the tent's canvas the sound of an approaching aircraft. Damn it! Everyone stop what you're doing and arm yourselves! Bawan snatched an M60 from one of the crates and hurried out of the tent, ready to fend off whoever it was who dared intrude upon their mission. His urgency faded, however, when he recognized Abdul Jahan's private helicopter and, more importantly, the man who was riding in the passenger seat. Bawan set the M60 aside and rushed to the chopper as it sat down on the hard pan near the white tent. Gary! Neshaw climbed out, ducking to avoid the rotors as he jogged away from the chopper, which lifted off and headed toward Jodhpur, where the pilot planned to wait out the storm before returning to Bombay. By some quirk of fate, Neshaw let the man live. You made it! How did we fare in Bombay? Neshaw stared solemnly at Bawan and shook his head. While in the air, he'd monitored newscasts over the radio and learned of Shili's failure to take out the president and prime minister. 
Without mentioning the still-present saber threat, both leaders had given a brief statement saying that they were going to focus their fullest efforts on eradicating the Mujahideen threat in India and getting Pakistan to renounce its ties to the insurgents. Our backs are to the wall. We must succeed here, or we are finished. I understand. But if we do succeed here, everything will change. We will yet have our chance at glory. A number of caravan routes fanned out northward from Jodhpur, most of them used by tourists taking day trips into the desert so they could, at least in their own minds, have a taste of what it must have been like to have been Lawrence of Arabia. Only two of the routes continued as far as the Moody set, one used by tourists hardy enough for a week-long trek to Jaisalmer, the other part of an ancient trail long used by merchants shuttling their wares from city to city north of the Aravali mountain range. Mac Bolan, John Kissinger, and Jack Grimaldi had decided on the latter route. To any Mujahideen lookouts posted along the trail, it would make sense that merchants, rather than tourists, would continue to venture along the trail despite an approaching monsoon that stirred up clouds of dust, reducing visibility every bit as much as a snow blizzard in the Himalayas. By the same token, one would expect the camels in a merchant caravan to be loaded with wares. The men could pack their weapons and other munitions without drawing undue notice. There were 40 camels in the procession, trotting across the sand in single file, less than a yard between one and the next. Only 13 of the humped beasts bore riders. The other 27 were heavily laden with cargo. All in all, it was the same sort of formation that had religiously passed by the film site every day at this time. Same number of riders, same amount of cargo, same slow, deliberate pace. The Stony Man warriors weren't among those astride the camels. Along with a dozen members of the Rajasthan Desert Militia, Bolin, Kissinger, and Grimaldi rode alongside the far side of the beast's humps, each man lying on his side within the webbing of a woven rope cargo sling. There were more comfortable ways to travel, to be sure. With each step the camels took, the rope chafed against the men's skin and clothing like a blunt, bristly-edged knife. And, too, they were facing the sun, and there was enough of it streaking through the sweeping dust clouds to make the men feel as if they were being roasted on a spit. There was a reason for the ploy, of course. At one point, the trail not only wound to within a hundred yards of the film site, but it also passed behind a sand dune 15 feet high and nearly 45 yards across. The dune would provide the men the cover behind which they could make their move. As soon as he heard one of the camel drivers trill on a panpipe, Mac Bolin unsheathed the trench knife and cut through enough of the webbing to free one arm. He reached up over the camel's hump, grabbing hold of a thicker length of rope knotted around the saddle pommel. He quickly untied the knot and yanked on the rope, pulling over a saddlebag weighed down with two 20-pound sacks of flour. He did the same with one more pouch, then hacked some more at the sling webbing until, like a moth wriggling from its cocoon, he was able to crawl free. All the while, he continued to hold on to the mesh, however, and it wasn't until he'd dragged over another three saddle packs that he let go, leaving the camel's load properly counterweighted. He stepped back and slapped the camel's hindquarters to urge it along, then joined Kissinger, Grimaldi, and the RDM soldiers, all of whom had similarly cut themselves loose and proceeded to the dune. An RDM sniper quickly broke out a Priva mechanical crossbow and began to assemble it. The weapon was similar to the Barnett Commando, which Boland had used with success on a number of missions, but this was the RDM's turret, and he was content to let their man do the honors of taking out the nearest Mujahideen sentry. It left him free to see what they were in for, should they be able to reach the film site. Grimaldi and Kissinger joined him as he peered over the top of the dune. All three men wore wraparound goggles to keep the stinging sand from their eyes. Grimaldi caught a glimpse of the costumed extras who were easy to see through the dust clouds. What a goofy-ass batch of spacemen. They look like rejects from the last Power Rangers movie. Bolin peered through his binoculars. There are at least 40 of them. Goofy-looking or not, if they're all Mujahideen, we're in for a fight. And who knows how many others might be hanging out in the plains. That guppy could hold a good 20, 30 guys. Those space rifles they're carrying look like the real deal. M50s in sheep's clothing, I think. I was wondering about that. Those DPVs coming out of that tent look like they've strapped on some real heat, too. Bolin was concerned about the sandstorm. 
Sure, it gave them some extra cover, but it would also hinder the approach of backup forces and possibly work against them if things turned into a firefight. The Mujahideen, after all, were more familiar with the film site and could use the knowledge to their favor. Moments later, the main flaps to the white tent parted and out rolled a futuristic-looking tank, perhaps two-thirds the size of the Crimson LVTP-7 Amtraks. Six men walked out alongside the weapon. Attempting to focus on them through the binoculars was like trying to pull in a television station with a weak signal. The airborne sand obscured everything in sight. Whether it was something about the way the men carried themselves, or the fact that none of them wore costumes, Boland felt in his gut that these were more than mere grips hauling out another prop. One man seemed to be in charge, and he moved about the tank, gesticulating at the others to make sure they positioned it correctly. From this distance, and through the sandstorm, it was impossible to get a good look at the man's face. But Bolin recognized the hand gestures and gait from video footage he'd studied back at the farm. Nisha. Front guy on the right. How can you be sure? It's him. In that case, my money says his little space tank is our missing saber launcher. Yep, we're in business. Should we just rush him? I don't think so. They've got home court advantage. We'd only be playing into their hands. Well, we can't just inch forward every time we manage to take out a sentry. If they're aiming to get off a few missiles before the storm hits, we need to beat them to the punch. Agreed. But there's got to be a better way than just charging into their guns. Kissinger patted his knapsack. I could lob a hairball. If I miss a launcher, I might at least hit the tent, and I'll give you ten to one it's not fireproof. I like the idea, but I'd rather we got closer, so the wind's not working so much against you. How about the cargo plane? Grimaldi pointed to the aircraft, less than eighty yards to their right on the other side of the dune. What about it? Grimaldi quickly laid out the plan he had in mind. When he was finished, Kissinger and Bolin exchanged a look. It's worth a shot. All right. Just wait until the first sentry goes down. No problem. They didn't have long to wait. The RDM sniper had finished assembling his Priva MC. Aside from the actual crossbow, the weapon bore little resemblance to its medieval counterpart. With a full-fledged stock, foregrip, trigger, and shoulder stock, it looked more like a submachine gun equipped with handlebars. Once he'd tautened the bowstring and fitted a bolt into the receiver, the sniper lined up his sights and drew a bead on the Mujahideen sentry who had his back to the sandstorm and was hunched over, hands cupped to his face as he tried to light a cigarette. The crossbow shaft suddenly sprouted from his neck, dropping him to the sand. All right, let's go. Along with the RDM, the three stony man warriors cleared the rise and charged quietly down the other side of the dune. Grimaldi quickly veered to his right, heading for the cargo plane. Bolin and Kissinger, on the other hand, jogged left, their destination one of the red LVTP-7 Amtraks, parked close by the guppy. As he watched the disguised saber system being taken through its pre-launch checks, Derry Neshaw stared out at the film site. If they were actually filming, he mused, the sandstorm would have been a good effect. It gave the set an otherworldly feel and made the costumes and props all look a little less garish. Ironically, the script, an amateurish student effort Briley had secured for the Mujahideen by sleeping with a film school instructor back in London, had mentioned something about the final conflict taking place in a swirl of mysterious gas emitted by the moon craters. It wasn't the only parallel between the script and the potential real-life events. In the movie, the overmatched moon colonists were on the verge of extermination when they made their final stand against the Martian invaders triumphing thanks to the so-called Transquasar Recombinant Energy Cannon the hero had managed to create out of odds and ends scavenged from a lunar scrapyard. Neshaw and the Mujahideen had gotten their hands on a pre-built launcher, coming up with a way to disguise and fire it without enemy detection. When the countdown was completed and the missiles were launched, their cannon would inevitably turn the tide of battle in their favor. Even if the enemy sent out interceptors, it was unlikely that they would be able to take out more than one or two of the missiles. The others would hit their mark, and the finger-pointing would begin. India and Pakistan would go at each other like rabid dogs. Neshaw and the others, meanwhile, would board the cargo plane and fly to Kashmir, where they would wait patiently while New Delhi and Islamabad annihilated each other. After that, well, they would see. Neshaw turned to Bawan. How much longer? Bawan conferred with the technician, 
who was busy establishing trajectory and target coordinates. Two minutes to countdown. Inside the front cabin of the cargo plane, the pilot smirked as he unscrewed his thermos and refilled his teacup. Through the windshield, he could see his fellow workers huddled close, backs to the storm as they stared out at the film site. How could they, after years of working behind the scenes, still see movie-making as magical? Didn't they realize that shooting would likely be delayed if not postponed because of the weather? And even if the weather had been perfect, they could spend the whole day here without witnessing anything like the final product that wound up on the screen. The war scenes they watched would consist of, at most, a few minutes of filmed action, followed by hours of idle time as sets were moved and the lighting and sound crew moved in to tinker with all their gizmos until the director was satisfied that everything was just right, at which point they'd shoot another fraction of a scene and then begin the process again, all over. Let them suffer, he thought. He'd sit up here in the air-conditioned cockpit and enjoy his tea. He heard the cabin door open. He hadn't bothered to lock it. There was no reason to. Jack Grimaldi stepped into the cockpit and aimed his grisly pistol at the astonished pilot. Step aside, Clyde. I've always wanted to take one of these babies for a spin. Bolin and Kissinger were halfway to the nearest amphibious tractor when one of the retrofitted DPVs appeared out of the nearest sand cloud and roared to a stop. Both men dived as rounds tore through the sand where they'd been standing. Lying on the ground, Bolin brought his Desert Eagle into target acquisition. One shot found its mark, striking the driver just below the helmet. Kissinger, meanwhile, continued rolling as 7.62 millimeter rounds chased him across the desert floor. When there was a lull in the firing, he bounded to his feet and emptied his Colt at the tail gunner. The Mujahideen took a trio of 9 millimeter slugs across the upper chest and slumped against the roof rack. Two desert militia soldiers joined in the fray, but their shots were wasted, plowing into men who were already dead. Bolin signaled for them to go ahead and take the DPV, indicating that he and Kissinger wanted dibs on the Amtrak. The LVTP-7 was little more than an armor-plated carrier mounted on treads. Unlike a tank, its turret wasn't fitted with a cannon, but rather a meager 12.7 millimeter machine gun, and that gun was absent from this Amtrak. Helpful to Bolin and Kissinger, however, was the outer prop shell, which provided them with the three-foot-high wall behind which to hide. While Bolin stood watch, Kissinger hurriedly set out his DHL and began to assemble it. The men thought the vehicle was unmanned, and both were surprised when the turret's hatch suddenly swung open. Bolin whirled about and was ready to fire when he saw a man climb out with his hands held high in surrender. Nice call. Now, if only your buddies would follow suit. Nesha shielded the stinging dust from his face with one hand while he unholstered his pistol with the other. The shooting was taking place slightly downhill, beyond the guppy and the farthest of the Amtraks, and there was little he could see but the clouds of sand. The extras, of course, were either cowering in the sand or running in all directions like frightened children. But Nesha's men, he was proud to see, had responded quickly to the intrusion. He saw them, blurry silhouettes of red and silver, plodding through the sandstorm toward the action, firing their M60s. Then, atop the farthest of the tractor tents, Neshaw saw the upper torso of a Mujahideen holding his arms held high in surrender. Enraged, the Kashmiri raised his weapon, drew aim at the Amtrak, and fired. The man atop the vehicle twisted to one side and dangled briefly over the side of the raised wall, then tumbled down to the ground. Coward! No retreat! No surrender! Neshaw saw movement to his left and turned. The cargo plane had begun to move. Instead of heading down the makeshift runway, the plane turned slightly and began to move toward the set. The cargo's employees, who'd been standing nearby admiring the realistic action, glanced over their shoulders and scattered as the plane rolled past them. Begin the countdown! But we have to finish the free launch! I said, begin the countdown! Nesha slammed a fresh magazine into the handle of his Taisho pistol. Tack on a few seconds if you have to, but move it up! Go! He turned to Bawa, now his second in command. We have to stop that plane! Bawan nodded. One of the Desert Patrol vehicles was emerging from the tent, newly outfitted with its decorated machine guns. Bawan stepped in front of the vehicle and motioned for the driver and tail gunner to get out. I'll drive. That left Bawan to take the rear gunner position. He was only halfway into the caged quarters when Nesha put the DPV into gear and pulled away. Now they began to see some of the enemy approaching. Bawan stopped a few RDM foot soldiers in their tracks with a burst of rounds. Then, 
materializing out of the smoke, they saw camels. Their riders, RDM cavalry soldiers, no longer masquerading as caravan merchants, had doubled back at the first exchange of gunfire. Armed with MP5s, they fired down at the costumed Mujahideen. One of the camels was hit by return fire and toppled headfirst into the sand, throwing its rider from the saddle. Nesha veered the DPV and passed alongside the fallen militia officer. He slowed long enough to put his gun to the man's head and pull the trigger. In slowing, however, he'd also allowed other RDM troopers to take aim at the patrol vehicle. Bawan took the worst of it, dying in the gunner's post with shots through the head and upper torso. Nesha felt the slug lodge in his shoulder, but tried to ignore the pain. Hands on the steering wheel, he drove on, heading toward the approaching plane. As he smashed the cargo plane through a length of cyclone fence and bore down on the missile launcher, Grimaldi kept reminding himself of Kissinger's assurances that the missiles most likely wouldn't detonate if crushed under the moving bulk of the Antonov. Now he wished Cowboy had been a little more specific. What kind of odds did most likely amount to? As if this weren't a troubling enough distraction, Grimaldi now saw a desert patrol vehicle emerging from the storm clouds and bearing down on him. The DPV could never hope to win a head-on collision, but if it managed to clip the Antonov's front wheel at the right angle, Grimaldi knew it could well thwart his chances of reaching the launcher before it fired its missiles. This should be interesting. By the time Kissinger had assembled his Dragon's Hairball launcher, a lull had settled over the film site. The wind had died down, dropping sand from the air and giving a clear view of the short-term carnage that had been wreaked thus far. There were bodies everywhere. Thankfully, no one had emerged from the guppy, and the men from Stony Man Farm hoped it stayed that way. Kissinger was about to draw aim on the missile launcher when he saw Nesha racing toward the cargo plane in the DPV. A stunned extra in a colonist outfit found himself in the vehicle's path and tried to duck away. He chose the wrong direction, and the patrol vehicle sent him flying over the hood and up past the gunnery cage, where Bawan slumped dead behind the 7.62mm machine gun. Can you take him out? Easier said than done. Kissinger had never tried firing the DHL at a moving target, and though the obvious strategy was to shoot ahead of the DPV in hopes the vehicle would drive into the path of the incendiary load, if he overshot the target, he stood a greater chance of hitting the Antonov and turning Grimaldi into toast. Just take your best shot. Kissinger drew in a deep breath and slowly pulled the trigger. The DHL slammed into his shoulder as it fired. Both he and Bolin watched the charge converge on the patrol vehicle. Erring on the side of caution, Kissinger had aimed short, striking the ground several yards behind Nesha. However, on impact, the resultant fireball rolled forward, carried by momentum, and fanned out as it engulfed the rear end of the DPV. All it took was one flicker to the fuel tank, and the patrol vehicle exploded, stopping in its tracks. Nesha was killed instantly. As smoke rose from the fiery remains of the DPV, Bolin and Kissinger watched Grimaldi bear down on the missile launcher. The countdown was into its final seconds, and through his binoculars, Bolin could see one of the Mujahideen raise his right hand and, one by one, retract his fingers. Five, four, three, two. The counter looked up, eyes widening in terror as he saw the nose of the Antonov sweep over him. The prop firing tubes snapped like celery stalks, sending the missiles sliding from their racks into the sand. Kissinger would have collected in Vegas because, as he'd predicted, none of the warheads detonated, even when the disabled launcher was dragged across them by the cargo plane. Within seconds after the aircraft came to a halt, the monsoon swept across the film site and the heavens opened up. Rain pounded the sand. Bolin and Kissinger bounded down from the Amtrak and began helping the desert militia round up the surviving extras and Mujahideen. Contrary to their leader's orders, the remaining Kashmiris readily surrendered. They knew it was over. Epilogue. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Unlike Zarat Wall, the men of Stony Man Farm received neither medals nor parades to honor their valor and courage on the field of battle. As they touched down on the farm's camouflaged runway, in the private Cessna that had brought them from Dulles International Airport. The most Mac Bolin, Jack Grimaldi, and John Kissinger were hoping for was a decent meal and hopefully a good night's sleep before their next call to arms. 
A few farmhands doing chores in the nearby orchard glanced up and offered the men faint nods as they deplaned. Other than that, the only other people who'd come out to welcome them back were Hal Brognola, Aaron Kurtzman, and Barbara Price. After warm, if perfunctory, greetings were exchanged, the six headed on foot toward the main house. Brognola and Kurtzman pigeonholed Grimaldi and Kissinger, pressing them for details about the mission, leaving Bolin and Price to walk alone a few steps behind. As always, in the name of propriety, they walked a distance apart from each other. Bolin and Price both had an unspoken pact not to make a public issue of their relationship. At times like this, it wasn't easy, however. Price had anxiously monitored the turmoil the men had faced, and she could see that Bolin had brought back fresh scars from the war zone. There were certain things a woman wanted to do with a man after their separation was marked by a brush with death. For his part, Bolin, despite his fatigue, felt a familiar stirring at the smell of Price's hair in the late summer breeze. Sure, he was exhausted, but there would be time for sleep. Later, they neared the main building where she maintained her living quarters. It's Labor Day. Slipped my mind completely. I've always been fond of picnics on Labor Day. Bolin glanced up at the sky. Dark clouds were gathering. Nothing as severe as what he'd seen in India, but threatening nonetheless. Mm, looks like rain. Then I guess we'll just have to do our picnicking indoors. <laughs> I like the way you think. 